Chapter 561, Group Battle Tower, End. The Group Battle Tower event is getting heated up, folks, as England, Mexico, Canada, and Central Country are neck and neck for first place. Who will be the one to come out on top? Amber cried out with excitement while displaying the current results of the tournament. First, England, 34th floor, 0%. Second, Mexico, 33rd floor, 98%. Third, Canada, 33rd floor, 92%. Fourth, Central Country, 33rd floor, 91%. Fifth, Italy, 32nd floor, 67%. Sixth, Ghana, 31st floor, 34%. Seventh, France, 31st floor, 23%. Eighth, China, 30th floor, 76%. Ninth, Japan, 30th floor, 75%. Tenth, India, 29th floor, 55%. The crowd, too, were enlivened, wanting to see more of their own countries blazing through the floors on their way to the top. The English team of Sublime Notion, Happy Scholar, Lucia, Noble Soul, and Silent Walker were the first to reach the 34th floor. Luckily, each floor reset their skill cooldowns, HP, MP, and stamina. On the 34th floor, they found themselves were in the midst of a bog. The stench of the rotting water and the defiled wood made everyone's face crinkle. Still, they kept an eye out in alert for whatever monster awaited them. Eventually, the boss revealed itself having the form of a tall cloaked female that had a darkened hood with two torch-like green eyes flowing from within. Her figure was quite sexy, though her hands were withered and drained like that of a zombie. Name? Witch Queen, Major Rank Monster. Level 265 HP, 234,000, 234,000. That's right. Ever since the 31st floor, the various groups had been fighting against Rank 6 foes. Just like Draco and Eva had suffered when fighting the Sand King, everyone had to fight with a 99% reduction in stats, a 90% reduction in damage and defense, while giving the Witch Queen a boost of the same amount in the same fields. It should be impossible for a normal person to deal with this. Even in their OP forms, it had required Draco and Eva to cycle through all three transformations and unleash every skill in their repertoire back then. Admittedly, this had meant that the entire fight had lasted around four minutes before they had killed the poor creature back then. Yet, it had been because the hits from their forms had been too heavy to ignore. Not to mention, its HP had been far less than the current monster the group was facing. Not even Draco and Eva would have been able to make it this far if that had been the case. As it were, the group had the advantage of having high-level classes so they could somewhat mount a resistance. The goal here was to find a way to restrict this high-level boss and bombard it with their strongest skills within a short period of time, then try and survive the battle till the end. This task fell on Silent Walker, who immediately cast the skill he had used in previous floors to solve this same issue. Endless Night Tendril Storm Endless Night Active Skill Effect Cover an area zone in a veil of darkness, buffing all darkness skills and techniques by 400%. Duration, 15 minutes. Cooldown, 16 hours. Effect, summon an endless amount of shadow tendrils that rampage around an area of 5 miles around the user, dealing unpredictable amounts of damage to all enemies within and trapping them. Duration, 3 minutes. Cooldown, 20 hours. A shroud of darkness wrapped around the entire floor, sealing the sky and letting only minimal light come through. Ombre. Apart from the visual effect, this also made all of Silent Walker's darkness-related skills 400% more potent, buffing the skill he used after. A wealth of shadow-like tentacles merged from all places within the range, thrashing about aimlessly at first before pausing, then rushing towards the Witch Queen. The Rank 6 foe screeched with anger, her body glowing with a green light as she summoned malevolent spirits that wanted to rush at the group and tear them apart. Unfortunately for the eldritch being, they were still bound by the tendrils as the darkness was semi-corporeal, allowing it to harm both the solid and the intangible. The tender ills also wound around the witch queen, making her shriek in anger as she couldn't move her hands to cast. From there, the others began their work. They only had 12 minutes to do what they could in terms of damage, and this was not the time to hold back or hide any secret trump cards, otherwise their journey would stop here. While this was fine on paper, the issue was that they had no way to see the rankings, which added another form of pressure. Many could wrongly assume they were in a good spot, 
only to come out and realize they were far below expectations. Many had tasted such a bitter pill in the individual battle tower, so they certainly would not wish to experience that again. Ordinance, Blade of Purification, Ordinance, Active Skill Effect, Bless an ally with the Divine Ordinance, allowing them to increase their damage, defense by 150%, attack and movement speed by 30%, and a 2 second invulnerability. Duration, 5 minutes, cooldown, 10 minutes. Blade of Purification, Active Skill Effect, Summon a Holy Blade made of light energy to slice apart your foes and bring divine justice upon them. This deals 90% light damage to a single target. Cooldown, 5 minutes. Her next attack, which was her only offensive skill, formed a huge divine blade that was burning with light energy above her head. The moment it was ready, she cast it out at the Witch Queen, striking the foe severely and making the monster screech. Lucia had her Light's Flow passive skill that increased the effectiveness of all light-based skills and techniques by 120%, increasing the damage of her attack greatly. 9,450,645 Alas, suffering from the high level and rank suppression, the millions of damage that should have been dealt was squeezed down to just a bit below half a million. If it was not for this, they would not have had such a tough time climbing the tower at this stage. Sublime was next. She began unleashing hundreds of magic spells that she had learned since her class had no limitations. Firebolt, Fireball, Fire Spike, Immolation, Incinerate, Inferno, Armageddon, Featherfall, Windblades Barrage, Cyclone, Tornado, Sparks, Thunderbolt, Lighting Strike, Thunderblast, Overcharge, Water Shot, Water Cannon, Torrent, Tsunami, Ice Bolt, Ice Blast, Ice Spear, Blizzard, Blades of Earth, Rock Blast, Earth Golem, Earth Burst Explosion, Earthquake, Poison Spray, Acid Burst, Toxic Cloud, Noxious Spear, Debilitating Plague, Bolt of Light, Prismatic Light, Sunray, Searing Light, Arc Light, Countless spells of all different elements were fired out like they were cheap. The mana cost of this was paid by Sublime, who had made sure to stock up on numerous epic-tier angel kiss potions just for this purpose. The collective damage dealt by the low Letitian was extremely grand, not due to the power of the spells, obviously, but the sheer quantity of them, 29,876,098. As impressive as this number might look like, it only accounted for about 10% of the Witch Queen's total HP. This kind of output was awesome to look at, but would not be anywhere near enough if they wanted to succeed this time. Silent Walker also chipped in, using a skill that worked perfectly on bosses like this that summoned adds to distract players. Darkness Devour Darkness Devour, active skill effect. Swallow the souls of all enemies within a 300-meter radius of the user, turning them into shadow slaves. Note 1. Only those at the lieutenant rank for monsters or those at rank 3 for NPCs and players can be consumed. Note 2. Only 20 shadow slaves can be made at rank 3. Note 3. Excess souls consumed by this skill would be used to replenish mana. Cooldown. 6 minutes. Immediately, all the malevolent spirits that had been summoned by the Witch Queen and neglected up until now were dragged over by the darkness spell and consumed. From the remains came twenty shadows forms that reassembled burning darkness. With a shriek of malice, they pounced on their former master and began tearing her apart. Of course, the damage dealt was not significant, T, but anything would be useful at this juncture in time. Then all eyes fell on Happy Scholar, as he was expected to recreate the special miracle he had created on the past few floors. With a serious expression, knowing that the success of his entire country rode on this, the fellow used his best skills. Word of power, destruction. Written word, execute the enemy. Knowledge rune, empower. Wisdom rune, recover. Word of power, active skill effect. Speak out a selected word and turn it into a rune that will affect its literary meaning upon a foe. The effectiveness of this varies per word chosen, the strength of the enemy, and the number of mana points invested into the skill. Cooldown, 2 minutes. Written word, active skill. Effect, write down a word or phrase that will become a single rune, affecting itself in reality to perform what it states. The effectiveness of this depends on the circumstances, the amount of mana divulged to the spell, and the length of the phrase. Cooldown, 4 minutes. Knowledge rune, active skill effect, eject a rune from your memories that works in tandem with other offensive or defensive runes to increase their effects. 
The amount of increment depends on the amount of mana invested. Cooldown, one minute. Wisdom Rune, active skill effect. Manually craft a special rune with any effect. The rune works based on the parameters described and its effectiveness will be based solely on the amount of mana placed within. Cooldown, 30 minutes. Happy Scholar had managed to class up into the Epic Rune Master class, which was one that fought using runes and words to suppress enemies. His class was special because he could use any words and turn them into runes, granting them great power, but the drawback was the sheer mana drain. Without putting in a substantial amount of mana, his attacks would just be flashy nonsense with no substance. As such, he had invested every stat point he had ever gained into spirit in order to increase his mana pool and regeneration. After all, nothing in his skills said anything about percentages and damage types, only that the amount of mana and the Cirque M stances decided effectiveness. This was a clear sign that his class was to min-max in the vein of getting huge amounts of mana. In fact, Sublime had even pulled strings to get him some epic items from the Guild Vault on a loan that would increase his mana pool by huge amounts, which was why he was crucial to their success. Abuse of power was disgusting? Of course it was. But only to the powerless, hehe. <laughs> Happy Scholar's two offensive runes were Destruction and Execute the Enemy, both of them the two most powerful things that led to death within Boundless. The first rune directly burned its target via Destruction Energy, albeit in far weaker concentration than what had been in the evil beads used to destroy immortal spirits, while the Execute the Enemy rune was sharp but seemed a bit lacking. There was only so much mana Happy Scholar could invest into them, when he was casting four runes at once. However, the knowledge runes soon wrapped around the two offensive runes, greatly increasing their power. The wisdom rune also wrapped around them, but did not seem to do anything at first glance. The two runes then shot forward and struck the witch queen, the first one searing her with destruction energy, and the second one stabbing right into her heart like an assassin's blade, both making the monster cry out in agony. 67,998,445. ,00 the damage was huge, and the England team and their fans were euphoric to see the numbers displayed. Since Happy Scholar could deal this much, they knew everything was in the bag. This was because the England team had a special trump card, which was the direct reason why they had been able to take first place from Mexico, who literally had a member that could transform into a space dragon on every floor. Noble Soul smiled and stood forth. He then raised his sword in a paladin's pose, then cried out so loudly it seemed to make space around him crack. I fight for my friend, S. Immediately, he activated his skill which was their team's trump card, Heroic Valor. Heroic Valor, active skill effect, shout out a line that boosts the morale of all allies and invigorates them to fight harder and longer in order to save their friends and family waiting for them at home. This skill resets all skill cooldowns for allies in a party, but the caster is unable to use any skill for the next 6 hours. Cooldown, 7 days. It was a pretty OP skill for guild battles and raids, which was why Desecrators had still been able to develop so strongly, even though Umbra existed in this timeline. Gentle Flower also had her own trump card no weaker than this, but this was the England team's show. Immediately, Sublime, Happy Scholar, Lucia, and Silent Walker smiled as they saw their previously expired skills now usable once more. Noble Soul himself sighed with fatigue and moved to the side, sitting on the ground as he was disabled until the next floor. Once more, the same barrage of skills were fired out and almost in the same order. Ordnance, Blade of Light, all those spells from Sublime, Darkness Devour, Word of Power, Destruction, Written Word, Execute the Enemy, Knowledge Rune, Empower, Wisdom Rune, Recover. This time, Ordinance was given to Sublime as Happy Scholar still benefited from it, allowing the damage of the Vice Guildmaster to increase by a factor of 1.5. Their first salvo had done a gross total of 98,325 and 188 damage, whereas the second reached 163,237. Name Witch Queen Major Rank Monster Level 265 HP, 22,411,575s, 234,000,000. ,000. The Witch Queen was on the verge of death, and they still had around 10 more minutes of binding on her. She began to struggle intensely and try to use her skills, 
but this shadow tendril binding was fat too efficient. Unless you could physically break free, it was impossible to do anything but wait for the duration to end. Of course, the more the Witch Queen struggled, the weaker the bindings became, and the lower the duration of the skill went. However, Silent Walker was not bothered, as he still had the skill open, ready to use it again, if necessary. All the England team had to do was use their weaker skills until the cooldown of their stronger skills elapsed, especially Happy Scholar, who only needed a few minutes for his. His problem came from the mana costs, but the supply of Angel Kiss potions kept him afloat. Soon, the Witch Queen could only scream impotently as she was turned into dust by the group. Without wasting even a second on rest, they quickly climbed up to the 35th floor and saw that this time, they got transported into a modern metropolis that was bustling. It was like any first world city, only that they were located in a park for public enjoyment. While the pedestrians and civilians walked about, ignoring the players as if they didn't exist, a buzzing sound appeared in the ears of the players. Looking up, they saw a round aircraft-like machine that had two blazing green eyes above its saucer, its round body spinning continually as it neared them. Name, Unidentified Flying Object, Major Rank Monster, Level 270, 197,000, 197,000. Lips twitching, the group got into their battle-ready formation and began utilizing the same method as on the previous floors to deal with the enemy before them. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a round of applause for our valiant contestants who fought their hardest during the group battle tower event. The various groups valiantly proved that they had come prepared and brought their A-game in order to secure the win for their home countries. Amber exclaimed once the three hours for the event had come to an end. She watched the square before the tower fill up once again with many people. She was even more excited and crowed. This time, not a single country got eliminated before the time limit. This is simply fantastic, a show of valor and determination to not fall until the very end. The crowd was roaring with excitement, having watched their countries fight hard as if their lives had depended on it. No matter which position they ended up in, no one would dare say that someone had held back, which was why the crowd was so moved. The contestants themselves sighed weakly, and many plopped to the floor, even those at the top. Essence Stalker directly spat out a mouthful of blood and fell to one knee. Even Draco would have suffered after transforming into a dragon so many times within three hours, much less him. Many did the same, from rambunctious to slim fatty, an even noble soul showed severe damage from their repeated use of certain skills, which had drained more than just MP or stamina, but also required an extra ingredient, which was why they were so powerful. Chapter 562, The Writing Battle and Memory Game No one mocked the competitors or disdained them in their moment of weakness. Many understood that they must have gone beyond a certain threshold of safety in order to win, which reminded the viewers new to the game that they were in a virtual world that was connected to their real bodies. As one could imagine, with how realistic and intense Boundless was, many had long since forgotten that they were hooked up to virtual devices and had become extremely immersed in the experience. Heck, even reincarnators like Draco and Eva often forgot this simple fact. That was just how powerful Boundless was. Soon, the rankings were shown for the top 30 countries. First, England, 38th floor, 76%, 376 points. Second, Mexico, 38th floor, 54%, 354 points. Third, Central Country, 38th floor, 43%, 3,843 points. Fourth, Canada, 38th floor, 12%, 3,812 points. Fifth, Italy, 36th floor, 98%, 36 and 98 points. Sixth, France, 36th floor, 93 per 6 and 93 points. 7th Japan, 36th floor, 86 per 36 and 86 points. 8th India, 36th floor, 32%, 36 and 12 points. 9th Ghana, 36th floor, 26%, 36, 26 points. 10th Brazil, 35th floor, 19%, 13,519 points. 11th China, 31st floor, 23%, 323 points. 12th Spain, 29th floor, 32%, 29 and 32 points. 13th Germany, 29th floor, 12%, 29 and 12 points. 15th, Argentina, 28th floor, 45% and 45 points. 
16th South Korea, 27th floor, 40%, 2740 points. 17th Philippines, 27th floor, 15, 27, 15 points. 18th Scotland, 26th floor, 95%, 2695 points. 19th Ireland, 26th floor, 70%, 2679 points. 20th Australia, 26th floor, 41%, 2641 points. 21st Puerto Rico, 25th floor, 82%, 5 and 82 points. 22nd Nigeria, 25th floor, 76%, 2576 points. 23rd Ukraine, 25th floor, 23, 255 and 23 points. 25th Sweden, 24th floor, 34%, 2144 and 34 points. 26th Switzerland, 24th floor, 32%, 2144 and 32 points. 27th Norway, 23rd floor, 67%, 267 points. 28th Indonesia, 23rd floor, 57th and 57 points. 29th Greece, 23rd floor, 54% and 54 points. 30th Egypt, 20th floor, 49%, 249 points. The results bore testimony to just how fierce the competition had been. The only notable gap had occurred between the 10th to 11th place. Then from there, everything seemed to have even out. This wasn't too surprising since starting from the 31st floor, candidates had been forced to fight against rank 6 foes. The 200 participating countries were lucky to have one or even two of Umbra's members in their ranks, since they were the only ones at this point in time at rank 3 and with classes above the norm. Even the weakest basic member of Umbra had at least a semi-epic class. However, to fight three ranks above, Having at least one Umbra core member was the basic requirement, as they were the only ones strong enough to barely eke out a battle against such foes. Anyone else would just be playing with fire. A lot of countries who had subpar results individually shown in these group battles. Some names one would never expect to see in the top 30 like Nigeria. Ghana being in the top 10 was not surprising though, as it was a country that gave birth to geniuses periodically, as well as some of the handsomest blokes any universe has ever seen. Editor's note, any hints of favoritism is surely purely coincidental and has nothing to do with the nationality of a certain author. Cough, cough. Anyway, the crowd praised their favorite contestants, chanting their national anthems in their various languages. This made those who fought hard feel invigorated and respected, bringing a soft smile to their exhausted faces. Essence smiled bitterly as Mexico had been unable to take first place this time, yet the gap was so small that it was negligible. At least, that was a consolation. As for Canada, they were shocked to have secured fourth place, not doubting their ability to enter the top ten. They had honestly believed to end up at the sixth or seventh place. The central country were the most shocked, as they expected to come in second and not third. Slim Fatty and the rest had given it their all, but they had still lagged behind. Mexico they had predicted, but England. The English team themselves were quite startled. They had expected their strategy to allow them to enter the top three, but they had half expected Mexico and the central country to have been ahead of them, yet none of them minded to have been wrong for once. And now, let us check the top 15 country placements before we get into the writing battle. First Interplayer International Competition 1. Central Country, 18,282 points 2. England, 17,394 points 3. France, 16,691 points 4. Canada, 18,871 points 5. Mexico, 14,516 points 1. Japan, 14,196 points 7. China, 14,004 points 2. 8. India, 18,515 points 9. Brazil, 12,705 points. 11. Ghana, 11,465 points. 12. Russia, 11,200 points. Next one. 13. Spain, 10,488 points. Plus one. 14. Germany, 10,274 points. 9 to 1. 15. Scotland, 9,064 points. The first four places had remained unchanged, but the Chinese were currently gritting their teeth in hatred. It was fine for Mexico to pass them as they were originally the favorites to win the competition, but having Japan pass them was unacceptable. The way they glared at their contestants was devoid of the worship from before, rather filled with malice and hate. The Chinese team paled, especially Ao Potian, who was shocked by the reaction of his countrymen. As for the Japanese, they didn't make any noise, 
Instead, they opted to just wear a smug look on their faces that said it all for them. Hey, hey, we beat you in every engagement we've had since time immemorial, and you want to defeat the status quo now? Isn't it a bit too wishful thinking? Ah! While such tensions were high, Amber's eyes curved into crescents. She enjoyed the possibility of international conflicts springing up in the aftermath of this competition, as it would weaken the World Council and allow Boundless to better assume control of cough assimilate with humanity. Still, she had to stop it here before anyone got suspicious of her. And next, we have the writing battle. Will the contestants of the group battle return to the stands first, so that the contestants of the writing battle may appear before us? The 1,000 combat team members disappeared into their standings or respective waiting area, depending on their own choice, while the 200 contestants for the writing battle materialized before everyone. They were all dressed differently, but they all shared the air of scholars about to take an exam. Apart from a sash that represented their home country, there was nothing to distinguish them. Within the crowd, there stood one monster who all others were gazing at with trepidation. Noble writer. The wordsmith simply pushed up his glasses and smiled slightly, aware that his participation in this event was no different from a university professor entering a competition for high schoolers. But he realized having the international stage all to himself was succulent. Literally everyone else who showed up today would only live in his shadow as a foil for his greatness. It was a terrible and sad fate for sure, but who asked then to exist in the same era as him, or in the same field as him? There were, of course, some others from Umbra he knew had epic trade skill classes, almost the entire 200 of the other contestants, in fact. Ever since the guild paid their fees for the class-ups, it was hard to find a member of Umbra, whether combat or trade skill, who had below an epic class. Now, let us manifest the stage in which our contestants will use. Amber exclaimed as she clapped her hands. At once, the battle tower sank into the earth and was replaced by a large open-air classroom in a meadow, with the chirping of birds and the smell of clean nature. In this environment, forget stress, it was likely that one would be easily able to enter the zone. Without further ado, let the writing battle begin, after the contestants get in their places, of course. Hey, <laughs> Amber stated with a tee-hee expression. This made many lips twitch. Yeah, you're pretty, as sexy and all, but why the hell are you acting like you're cut, E? Amber clapped her hands and the various contestants were arranged at their places. They manifested the tools they needed for their specific writing-related trade skill and began working. Cartographers began drawing delicate and intricate maps, accountants began solving prearranged balance sheets, poets began expressing their literary might, Copywriters began cloning a written text in neat handwriting, authors began making cheap s cuff well-thought-out novels, and legal practitioners began drafting a writ of summons as well as the accompanying statement of claim. Noble Writer was a wordsmith, which allowed him to perform any literary, financial, or legal-related trade skill with ease, so he chose to show off his legal prowess. He began drafting an exotic writ of summons, as well as a detailed and thorough statement of claim that would put even real lawyers to shame. When the other contestants saw him dragging in torrents of worldly energy to infuse into his writing, their faces were filled with chagrin and despair. Did all of us wrong you in any way? Just how cruel could you be to go so far for just one event like this? Noble writer seemed to notice their accusatory and hate-filled glances burning his back relishing it all. He never knew he had quite a sadistic streak in him. It seemed like he would have to go and take tutelage under Vice Guild Mistress Sublime to fully unlock his talents. Once again, it should be noted that no one in Umbra was 100% normal. Just look at Draco and Eva. How could a guild created and run by these two fellows be full of normal blokes and lasses? Eventually, the three-hour period given to the various candidates came to an end and many breathed audible sighs of relief at having made it in time. Unlike the crafting battle, which was straightforward, the writing battle required more finesse and skill. Amber clapped her hands and allowed the various tools to disappear into thin air while the creations themselves were sent to storage, only going to see the light of day when it was time for the quality battle. 
Great job, contestants. Everyone, please give them a round of applause. For just like during the previous trade skill event, no one failed their work or was unable to complete it in time. The crowd cheered for their people, making these fellows sigh with relief. Now that the competition was on the second day and the ranks were being sorted, there was pressure on them to put their countries in good spots, lest they end up being sinners who couldn't even do one thing right. And now the rankings, Amber cried with excitement. First, Noble Rider, taken. Legendary technique used, 3 fourth or 30 points, England. Second, Junior Dong, 0 fifth, 7 12 taken. Epic technique used, 2 5 and 42 points. Third, Shitake Shiki, epic technique used, 2155 28 points, Japan. Fourth, I Hate Work, 1040 taken, epic technique used, 298 points, Central Country. Fifth, Map God, 10123 taken, epic technique used, 2055 points. Sixth, Item Answer, 13 taken, epic technique used, 1988 points, Germany. Seventh, Poxer, 11221 taken, epic technique used, 1932 points, Russia. 8th, Kurumba, 113.45 taken, epic technique used, 1923 points, Mexico. 9th, Jin King, 113.58, epic technique used, 1919 points, Canada. 10th, Largent, Fort taken, epic technique used, 1907 points, France. The scores were quite even in most regards, which was pretty good overall. Unlike the crafting battle, where there was a noticeable gap, here most constants had finished close to each other, as their work was more time-intensive. Amber smiled playfully and called up the scoreboard for the top countries immediately. First Interplayer International Competition Country Rankings, Top 15 Overall, 1 England, 20,824 points, plus 1. 2. Central Country, 20,780 points, minus 1. France, 18,098 points. 4. Canada, 16,790 points. 5. 16,024 points. 1. 6. China, 16,546 points. 7. Mexico, 16,439 points. 2. 8. India, 15,219 points. 9. Brazil, 14,560 points. 10. Italy, 1. 3,820 points. 11. Russia, 13,132 points plus 1. 12. Ghana, 12,731 points minus 1. 13. Spain, 12,543 points. 14. Germany, 12,262 points. 15. Scotland, 10,119 points. It could be seen from this that the competition was quite intense at this stage, but today just seemed to be England's day. They had retaken first place overall after clinching first place in the group battle tower, as well as the writing battle. The Englishman could be heard singing the national anthem from the stands so loudly that everyone else wore grimaces of anger on their faces, especially the central country. The Englishman, too, sneered at them. Ha! Tossing that tea over was the stupidest decision of your life. Now, we will show you what it means to be number one. Amber let the hatred stew for a little while before clapping her hands once more. Now, let us move on to the last event for the day, the memory game. Will the contestants of the writing battle please leave the stage so that those of the memory game may appear before us? The various contestants who just competed were beamed away, while those who were to partake in this current event appeared with gusto, their faces solemn as they knew that the points earned from these technical games were what could change the entire competition from the ground up. Amber then smiled and clapped once more. The area that was like a lovely meadow shifted into a classroom that had a backboard in the middle. All the candidates had a clean as well as a fresh wooden desk and a chair that was designed with comfort in mind behind them, along with some writing materials and a screen that hovered idly above the desk at eye level. Will the candidates please take a seat and get ready for the commencement of the event? Amber instructed giddily. She was in such a good mood today after seeing tensions rise up so strongly and so early. Immediately, they all obeyed her instructions and sat down obediently, not wanting to risk disqualification or worse, by being recalcitrant. Amber then continued, Please focus on your screens before you. On the main blackboard, a random pattern or design will be displayed. You will then have 30 seconds to memorize the pattern or design and 30 minutes to replicate it. 
Since the event lasts two hours, you have a gross total of four patterns. For each pattern you manage to perfectly recreate, you will be awarded 5,000 points, so good luck. This made the faces of the contestants pale, while these in the VIP seats were like wild beasts, wishing now more than ever that they could dismember Amber from head to toe and feed her flesh to the dogs. If Amber had possessed the Dark Angel inheritance, she would be so intoxicated with the hate directed to her that she might even collapse in happiness. As it were, the woman enjoyed the hate the good old-fashioned way, by not giving a fuck. As for the event, it progressed as one would expect. The patterns shown on the board were so intricate it was akin to asking one to memorize the traces on a motherboard within 30 seconds and replicate them in 30 minutes. The 5,000 points per design were well-earned because it was f u impossible to get 100%. Most countries had chosen candidates with the sharpest memory for this event, as this was a basic requirement. It wasn't like the previous identification game where most had picked louts and young masters so their names could shine here. Here, there were only sharp-minded geniuses, but even their faces were filled with despair at this Herculean task. By the time the event came to an end, the crowd was silent as they were gazing at the contestants with sympathy. No one was angry, because even they, who could look at the design permanently, couldn't fa'oking make heads or tails of them. When the results came, many were simply speechless. First, actual cultivator. Four attempts, 34%, 44%, 54%, 32%, 8,200 points. China. Second, Bodhisattva, four attempts, 32%, 39%, 48, 31%, 7,500 points, India. Third, Wonderbread, four attempts, 31%, 38%, 46%, 30%, 750 points, central country. Fourth, K, Alashnikov wins, four attempts, 29%, 37%, 40%, 28%, 6,950 points, Russia. Fifth, for four attempts, 27%, 35%, 43%, 27%, 600 points, France. Sixth, Kleiner Bruder, four attempts, 25%, 34%, 42%, 25%, 350 points, Germany. Seventh, Jolly Lad, four attempts, 25%, 32%, 23%, 6,000 points. Eighth, Send Food, four attempts, 23%, 30%, 39%, 22%, 5,700 points. Ghana. Ninth, Taco 2, four attempts, 22%, 28, 37%, 20%, 5,350 points. Tenth, Migit no Gokui, four attempts, 21, 26%, 36%, 5,100 points. Once again, China took the mantle of first place for the technical game, giving them the much-needed edge they lost in the combat and trade skill sections. The way the Chinese fans gazed at the fellow who won with gentleness in their eyes made him blush. However, goosebumps appeared him skin when a few fellows blew kisses at him and made hand signals his way that could not be misinterpreted. Soon, the country rankings for the end of the second day were displayed once more. First Interplayer International Competition Country Rankings Top 15 Overall 1. Central Country 28,130 points plus 1. 2. England 26,824 points the 1. 3. France 25,198 points 4. China 24,046 points 5. India 22,719 points 6. Japan 21,824 points the 1. Mexico 21,089 points 8. Canada, 20,290 points, 4. 9. Russia, 20,082 points, 10. Brazil, 19,410 points, 11. Germany, 18,612 points, plus 3. 12. Italy, 18,470 points, 32. 13. 18,031 points, 1. Fort Spain, 16,793 points, 15. Scotland, 14,069 points. Chapter 563 The Individual Tournament 1. As the second day ended, the various teams and players returned to their resting areas. All the events had lasted seven hours for the first day and the same for the second day in boundless time. That was only 1.75 hours in real life each day. Adding in the 12 hours rest in between the days that amounted to three hours in real time, by the time the third day of the event was ready to kick off, only a gross total of 9.5 hours had passed in the real world. This was ideal, as the events were taking place over the weekend, so most workers could watch if they so pleased, keeping in mind the helmet's 16 hours per day capacity. 
The third day began with Amber once again welcoming the now-seated crowd with her usual flair. Today, she was wearing a Chinese chongsam that was a mixture of black and red, the hem reaching her ankles, and the length split on one side to reveal her tea eyes. Anyone who had watched Chinese movies or played any Asian-made fighting game would tell you that this outfit had to be one of the top five exiest attires a woman could wear. There were no downsides to it, and on a woman like Amber, it was a killer. Welcome, everyone. Today is the third day of the Interplayer International Competition, and it's a very good day. Apart from the theory battle that will be slated as the second event and the final event, the guessing game, we have a hot competition to start the day with. Amber began as she waved to the stands. This time, without her prompt, the center of the field metamorphosed into a large stage, no different from the one that handsome green alien from the future used in that his famous tournament in that old anime with the same old blonde dudes. That's right, today we will begin the individual tournament. Here, each player will be shuffled into groups then compete against each other to determine their points. Each group will have 250 fighters with a total of four groups. The top eight in each of these groups will move on to the round of 32, where the elimination stages will begin. Hearing the rules, many faces changed. They knew that only 32 fighters would make it into the elimination stage, but having such huge groups would severely limit the chances of more than a few compared to having plentiful groups. As usual, most could only grit their teeth and glared at Amber with red eyes that wanted to toss her into a meat shredder. The woman herself smiled brightly from all this hate and then clapped her hands. These are the listings for the various groups. The group listings were displayed. First Interplayer International Competition Individual Tournament Group Stages Group A 1. Heaven's Sun, China 2. Cold Summer, Canada 3. Loving Aunt, Italy 5. Kiran, India 6. Deployed Soldier, Central Country 7. Noble Soul, England 8. Great Caster, Hera, Japan Group B. 1. Slim Fatty, Central Country 2. We Sun, Scotland 3. Silent Walker, England 4. Dreary Traveler, Brazil 6. Rambunctious Butt Lover, Canada 7. Cobra, France 8. Panty King, Japan Group C 1. Young Duel, France 2. Thunder Power, Mexico, 3. Sublime Notion, England, 4. Uno, Mexico, 5. Gentle Light, England, 7. Gentle Flower, Canada, 8. Kicked Bucket, Korea, Group D, 1. Joker, Canada, 2. Happy Scholar, England, 3. Killer Queen, Can, 4. Slight Breeze, India, 5. Warm Spring, Central Country, 6. Boyd, Ghana, 8. Essence Stalker, Mexico. The groups were much larger than this, but each group was filtered by the most promising contestants in each of them numbering eight. Your placement in this list was not random, but done based on your aggregate power and performance in the tournament so far. It was only the top 30 of each group who were shuffled about to give some semblance of intrigue, forcing spectators to guess who would come out on top. As usual, the betting companies went to work opening some bets for the game and many participated. Now that the groups have been sorted out, we will move on to the individual battle assessment. Amber began a S, she clapped her hand, the single arena splitting into four smaller copies. After that, she brought the 1,000 contestants on the field, their faces locked into frowns as they wondered how the group stage would be handled. With so many of them, and only four arenas at once, how could they all fight each other once to determine rankings? Since this event also had a three-hour timeline, there was no way it could work like this. Amber seemed to notice their confusion and tittered. For some reason, those VIPs for each country felt a bad omen in their hearts at seeing her expression. Of course, the group stages won't feature a direct battle, as that would be too time-consuming and honestly, quite boring. We want excitement to be present when the top elites fight each other for the first time, no? Amber waved her hand as three giant machines manifested on each of the four mini-arenas. The contraptions were about the size of a small car, looking like a cross between a power-measuring machine and a professional force-measuring machine. Seeing this, the various contestants and spectators had an idea of what Amber wanted to do, which left them speechless. Seeing that everyone got the idea, Amber clapped her hands with glee. That's right. Every contestant in each group should use their strongest skill 
technique or attack on the machine which will record their output. Don't worry, it's not calculated by raw force, but output, precision, and quality. Amber folded her hands behind her back calmly. It doesn't matter whether you're a cleric, a warrior, or even a psychic. Just use your best skill or class-related ability on the machine, and it will award you points based on the powers of your skill compared to your class's average, your fluidity in using the skill, and its effectiveness on the target. Amber's eyes narrowed as she smiled thinly. Choose the skill you will use very, very carefully. Hearing her words, the contestants knew that this was not a joke. Their chances of entering the final 32 rested on this. And interestingly, it had nothing to do with whether you had some legendary class or an overpowered skill, but how you used it. There were many, even among Umbra, who had powerful classes but relied on them too much and didn't have much in the way of technique. If Rena were here, she would fall into this category. This kind of test gave everyone a fair chance, especially those who had common classes but had owned the shit out of them, developing them beyond what such classes should be capable of. However, they had always been suppressed by the mighty Umbra, whose players not only had powerful classes, but also ranked up faster than the speed of light. Such players gazed provocatively at the members of Umbra as few as they were. However, they were left with dismay when the members of Umbra from each country, who formed about 95% of all those arranged here, didn't even bat an eyelid. This made those other players feel apprehension, wondering what Umbra was all about. Well, it was normal for the members of Umbra not to be worried. Most people only saw the raw power of Umbra and secretly regarded them as a guild of privileged weaklings who could not reach where they were without their guildmaster wiping their asses for them. Meanwhile, while Draco had helped Umbra, wasn't it the case that the fellow was always in one unique quest or the other? Just how many times had Draco actually sat down and led his guild members to do anything apart from world events? If anything, it would have been their lady boss who had actually disciplined them into who they were today. No, even that was looking at it from the wrong angle. From the very beginning, why was it that guilds like Kamisuo had 100,000 players with others even having more than that, while Umbra had limited their numbers? The answer was simple. Their tests had always been designed to filter out the diamonds from the trash. Even basic members who entered the guild had the power to lead a rare guild, much less those ranked above. Every member of Umbra was a mon, stir of talent, which was why there were so few of them. Because Draco was so secure in the fact that there was no trash in his guild, he had been able to invest as much as he had. As he continually blessed them, albeit indirectly, they would take those wings he gave them and use them to soar higher, which was what they always did. This was the confidence of the members of Umbra. The individual assessment began immediately. Starting from the 250th place in each group, they went forward to use their most powerful skill on the machine, which would then almost immediately return a score based on their performance. None of the scores were trash, even for those at last place. However, they were quickly suppressed by the next contestants going forward, showing that the AI had done this intentionally to show the disparity to each member in an attempt to weaken their wills. Strong players would not be beaten down by this and would grow, while the weak ones would suffer from this and lose their will to progress. The AI hadn't done this for any particular reason that was profound or the like. It was just running an experiment and collecting data from it as usual. When the turns of those in the top 30 came, those in the crowd inched closer to the edge of their seats and looked on with solemn gazes. From here on out, regardless of the group, it was all rank three powerhouses from the expert member list of Umbra and above, or the core members of Kamisuo, Desecrators, Lorebinders, and Myriad cards. Eventually, the various members struck with their best skills. It wasn't until five specific players struck that the machine started to have trouble and seemed like it was about to break. First was Kieran, the second was Deployed Soldier, third was Boyd, fourth was Slim Fatty, and the last person, who also incidentally shattered the machine so completely that a score couldn't be given, was Essence Stalker. Seeing that he alone had destroyed the entire thing, the fellow smiled sheepishly and turned to Amber. 
He then pointed to the machine and stated, All expenses on Draco. The members of Umbra all fell over after hearing this. Only loving Ant simply nodded her head, pleased that he was becoming more and more like a true member from their lineage. Amber's lips twitched. Well, no matter. Let us display the scores for the group stage and see those who are progressing in each group. First, Interplayer International Competition Individual Tournament Group Stages. Group A. 1. Kieran, 2,500 points. 2. Deployed Soldier, 2,290 points. 3. Loving Ant, 2,285 points. 4. Noble Soul, 2,174 points. 5. Heaven Sun, 2,083 points. 6. Cold Summer, 1,878 points. 7. Great Caster, Hera, 1,833 points. 8. Brother is Best, Bella, 1,811 points. Group B, 1 Slim Fatty, 2,700 points, 2 Cobra, 2,350 points, 3 Silent Walker, 2,240 points, 4 Dreary Traveler, 2,190 points, 5 Rambunctious Butt Lover, 2,100 points, 6 Shawnee, 1,980 points, 7 We Seant, 1,783 points, 8 Panty King, 1,782 points, Group C, 1 Uno, 2,399 points, 2 Tunder Power, 2,234 points, 3 Sublime Notion, 2212 points, 4 Gentle Flower, 2176 points, 5 Gentle Light, Lucia, 2123 points, 6 Young Duel, 1988 points, 7 Lowly King, 6654 points, 8 Kick Bucket, 1623 points, Group D, Essence Stalker, 499 points, 2 Boyd, 2550 points, 3 Killer Queen, Kira, 347 points, 4 Warm Spring, 2238 points, 5. Happy Scholar, 2122 points. 6. Joker, 2121 points. 7. Maple Forest, 1877 points. 8. Slight Breeze, 1854 points. The rankings were sorted out, and it was clear as these who would be going on. It was largely the same as the AI had predicted, and those who had placed safe and wise bets got some little meat on their soup, while others who had taken risks were wailing in pain and anguish. As for those who failed to go on, they could only grit their teeth and return to the waiting area unwillingly. Even though their accumulated points would still be added to their respective countries, they had already failed to make a decisive change in anything. Now that the top 32 have been decided, let's look at the format for the elimination battles. Amber announced with a smile, turning the four separate stages back into a single stage. First match, Brother is Best vs. Sublime Notion. Second match, Heaven's Son vs. Essence Stalker. Third match, Slim Fatty vs. Joker. Fourth match, Cold Summer vs. Silent Walker. Fifth match, Warm Spring vs. Dreary Traveler. Sixth match, Alpha Male vs. Great Caster. Seventh match, Lowly King vs. Tunder Power. Eighth match, Panty King vs. Kieran. Ninth match, Rambunctious Butt Lover vs. Happy Scholar. Tenth match, Noble Soul vs. Slight Breeze. Eleventh match, Deployed Soldier vs. Weak Hunt. Twelfth match, Gentle Flower vs. Maple Forest. Thirteenth match, Shawnee vs. Loving Aunt. Fourth match, Boyd vs. Kicked Bucket. Fifteenth match, Killer Queen vs. Gentle Light. Sixteenth match, Cobra vs. Young Duel. Once the matchups were released, many realized that the eliminations round would be full of surprises. Those who were in the know of Umbra and the various abilities of their members especially gasped, realizing this devious AI had really cooked things up. Before they could even comprehend what they were seeing, Amber clapped her hands and spoke. Each battle will last three minutes at most. Contestants may use any skills, spells, and abilities in their arsenal, which will be restored going into each match. You are also free to use your relevant in-game equipment to fight, as it is a part of your power. Due to level and rank imbalances, everyone will be set to rank 3, level 100 by default. Your points that are lost will be kept in storage, and for those who gain stat points, they will only be on loan for this tournament. Amber was about to get the matches going when she suddenly remembered something. Oh, I nearly forgot. No consumables are allowed. Those who had been smiling, planning on bombarding enemies with consumables and one-time use items like Loving Aunt, who had countless epic and legendary poisons, displayed sad grimaces. Without further ado, let the first battle of the individual tournament elimination stages begin, Amber announced grandly before moving aside. Sublime Notion and Bella were automatically beamed into the arena, standing equidistantly from each other. The two opponents sized each other up with cruelty in their eyes, 
both being evil-hearted maidens. Little thing, on account of you taking care of Astarte before I got here, I can make things easy on you. Admit defeat and scram. Bella commanded with an imperious gaze, her eyes flashing with disdain. Sublime Notion ignored her words and muttered lightly. Hey, hey, this one is a Yandere, right? Beating her up will be like slapping the face of that evildoer. Hey, hey, ha ha, I must go all out. For vengeance. Sublime was not even looking at Bella like she was herself, but had overlaid the imagine of Riveting Knight, who was her heart demon, and became crazed. Bella's expression changed to alarm, and the battle was announced to have begun right at that moment. Immediately, Sublime shrieked like a banshee and raised both of her staves, casting out endless amounts of destructive spells. She wanted to see Bella. No, riveting knight beaten, bruised, battered, and begging for mercy at her feet. Bella was horrified, but soon regained her calm as she fled into the shadows. She had the legendary grade ninja class which Eva had gifted her. The lady boss had acquired it on Shinoka when she had taken all the girls over during their playdate and had gifted it to Bella, who she deemed compatible with it. The ninja class was an assassin class that was focused on a combination of stealth and trickery. It was not like Eva's old shadow assassin class that mixed magic and stealth, or Cobra's slayer class that mixed stealth and execution. Where Bella once stood was a piece of log that was soon struck by the first wave of spells, being rendered into nothing within seconds. Substitution Technique Sublime's eyes had long gone red from madness, the shorty cackling like some vile witch as she continually fired out hazardous spells one after the other. Nowhere on the entire stage could be described as safe, Sublime even going as far as damaging herself and her mana shield greatly just to carpet bomb the place. Substitution Technique Substitution Technique Substitution technique. Substitution technique. Bells gritted her teeth and used her life-saving skill four times in a row, achieving the maximum limit for the next twelve hours. Her face paled when she realized that while her skill allowed her to avoid the majority of the damage, there was still some lingering danger as Sublime had saved her large-scale spells for last. Bella then made a flurry of hand signs before clapping her palms together. Shadow clone technique. Immediately, two copies of Bella appeared before her, standing right before her as they grabbed her and disappeared. Where the spell of Sublime should have evaporated them, it turned out another log as left there. Substitution Technique X8. Each Shadow Clone had all her skills and could use them itself, minus the skill that had spawned it. Otherwise, that would lead to a game-breaking loop of infinitum, but it still posed great trouble to those who wished to take Bella down. Take Sublime, she had emptied her arsenal of conventional spells, even the large-scale ones, and all of them had been wasted on substitution logs. Chapter 564, The Individual Tournament 2 Sublime Notion frowned at this and pouted. Brother loving freak, get out here and die under my magnificent barrage. How dare you, you underdeveloped runt! Bella shrieked in anger at having her secret exposed like this. She directly came out of stealth behind Sublime Notion and stabbed her back using a chakra-infused kunai knife. At this time, though, Bella felt a premonition of death looming upon her as Sublime turned her face slightly to gaze at her. The lowly's placid face suddenly broke into a crazy smile as he chuckled. I got you! Sublime slammed the butt of her staff down and used her newest sure-kill spell that she had acquired by abusing Umbra's power and treasury. Space Lock Space Lock, active skill effect, bind a target to a fixed point in space in which they are unable to move. If this occurs on a planet with a rotation, this may yield unpredictable effects. Duration, 5 seconds. Cooldown, 12 hours. The moment Bella felt her body freeze, just as she was about to pierce the skull of Sublime, she knew she was finished. This spatial binding skill would have been useless for battle on the main plane, but was godly here. After all, if a person was locked in a specific point of space, chances are, instead of being stunned, they would just be yeeted off in the opposite direction faster than the eye could follow. Technically, this wasn't a skill for fighting, but for running away. Just that instead of you yourself skedaddling, you would make the opponent leave. However, this venue was a closed-off space that only had gravity and no axis. As such, the skill worked like a typical stun in this case, and since it was of the spatial element, it was unblockable 
and unavoidable. For five seconds, Bella was Sublime's bitch, and by God did the vile lowly make her understand that. Sublime lifted her staff in her left hand to call down a thunderstrike, while the one in her right hand struck Bella like a club, beating the poor woman brutally. The thunderstrike also landed and added a lightning paralysis stun to the ninja, who had already fallen victim to Sublime's torture. Soon, Bella was turned to pixel light before she reappeared in the stands, her face pale from the beating of the vice guildmistress. The Lolitician herself had long gone mad, whacking the empty space there as if Bella, or rather, riveting knight who she had been envisioning, was still there. Ha! <laughs> die, die, die! Ha! <laughs> she screamed with glee. The crowd was left speechless and with goosebumps appearing on their skin. How could such a cute and lovely girl become so violent? Just what had she been subjected to make her lose her sanity and hatred? First match winner, Sublime Notion. Amber coughed and took Sublime off the stage before summoning the next contestants up. This time, the crowd held their breath as two titans walked onto the stage. On the left was a handsome man with pale bronze skin. He had shoulder-length black hair and sharp gray eyes. He was quite buff, but not quite at the level of local lord. He wore a set of armor that was similar to that of a cultivator, brocade robes that were blackish-yellow. When he climbed on stage, all the fans of China roared out his name, and many females across various countries were a bit smitten by how he carried himself. It was not to the point of madness, just a thought that they would like to know more about him later on. Ao Pochian seemed to enjoy this attention as he smiled widely, embracing the call of the crowd. However, he and the entire stadium went silent when a spinning red halberd landed on the stage, almost splitting it in half. From the other end of the stage, a calm and unhurried gait slowly revealed a tall and handsome man with sleek reddish dyed black hair and an angular face that was sculpted symmetrically. He had a deep tan that enhanced his looks since he wore a set of medium armor that was reddish gold. His glowing amber eyes revealed a sharp gaze that could pierce into the hearts of those they were focused on, despite also looking laid back and generally benevolent. The moment Essence climbed the stage, the crowd that had been silent a moment ago burst forth in fervor. It was not limited to Mexico, but every country in the world. At this point, everyone had heard of the third strongest player in the world and the crowd favorite to win the entire competition. Taking it a step further, they had all watched his fight against the monsters in the tower alone and with his team, and it was obvious why the betting houses had slated Mexico to win. His power was just simply overwhelming for both the monsters and players he faced. Many women in the crowd directly screamed out, their eyes showing hearts. Unlike Podian, who was just handsome, Essence was a dual inheritance bearer of the Serpent God and Dark Angel at 35% bloodline purity. Even Rosella, a first-generation descendant from Draco, had only 45% bloodline purity. Loving Ant had 25%, and Podian had himself 23% of the Pangu lineage. Essence was a monster that was above everyone else, merely below the evil duo. The moment he stepped on stage, the air between him and Podian solidified as both showed grimaces. They had not noticed it before, but in such close proximity, they could detect the special nature of the other. Putting aside the bloodline hate, there was a natural disgust they felt towards the other person. Pochin snorted coldly and spoke. You, trash like you is at third place? Sigh. The so-called artificial intelligence managing this game must be faulty. Pochin shook his head. If such a fellow could really be third place, then he, the son of heaven, would be first. Essence rubbed his chin with a confused smile. I don't get it. What gives you the balls to bark when you aren't even in the top 50? Like, no offense to them, but even we cunt, panty king, and lowly king are ranked higher than you. Many spectators grimaced at that feeling second-hand embarrassment for Pochin. The members of Umbra around the stage, especially core members, burst into mocking laughter so shrill that it would make even a rock cry. Pochin's eyes reddened in shame and hatred, wishing he could kill the fellow before him. Referee, start the match. I want to put this trash in the bin where it belongs, he roared with anger. Amber, who had been enjoying the trash talk before the show, first glanced to Essence. Even she was careful with how she dealt with this fellow, 
as he could be said to be the representative of Draco when the evil duo were not around. Essence nodded and folded his arms behind his back. Amber took this signal to declare the start of the match, and Podian wasted no time shooting forth before striking where Essence stood. Immediately, the crowd was shocked as a crater formed in the arena. What crazy strength! Just how could he do something like that at a mere rank three with just his arms? In truth, Pochin was also a double inheritance bearer of the primal god and undying king inheritance. The primal god gave him strength proportionate to his bloodline purity, and the undying king allowed him to regenerate from any ailment as if he had an immortal body. At 23%, he was nowhere near as overpowered and broken as local lord, who even Draco hadn't entirely dared to fight head on. One punch from that fellow might even cause Superman to turn into blood mist. However, that was local lord. As for Podian, he was only stronger than a superhuman, and faster too. He could regenerate from many fatal wounds, but if you cut him in half, he would die before he could regenerate. This was his confidence, knowing that his defense was solid and his offense was unmatched. As such, he never really bothered to use the skills of the fighter class he had received, especially since it was a common class. He, unlike local lord who had been a gamer to deal with some of the stress as the supposed future clan head, didn't care for such things and had solely focused on his bloodline to do everything in Boundless. He was a typical example of a bloodline descendant who could not adapt outside of their bloodline and relied on it for pretty much everything. As such, the fate of this kind of person was to be brutalized at the hands of an opponent who knew the limits of their bloodline as well as its weaknesses and had no qualms utilizing the benefits the system blessed him with. Ha ha! Trash! One hit and you're dead! Pochin laughed gleefully, seeing as Essence had not bothered to dodge his attack. He had simply stood there with his arms folded and his lips curled slightly upwards, like a person watching an idiot disgrace himself in public. Once the dust cleared, Podian's face scrunched up in horror. He realized his hand fully punched through the body of his enemy, but he couldn't feel anything. Even as he stood, his hand was poking through Essence's torso as if the other was a hologram. Essence gazed at the hand through his stomach, then at Podian. Realizing it was his cue, he suddenly reacted. Arrgh! Essence cried out as he spat a mouthful of blood and staggered back, playing the role of someone fatally wounded. He clutched his perfectly intact torso that was dislodged from the hand of Potian and writhed on the ground while howling. The spectators covered their faces, feeling bad for Potian, who could only stand there and look on with red eyes at Essence's performance. The members of Umbra burst into uproarious laughter and jeers sounded out by the stage. Loving Aunt nodded her head with pride over these antics. With each day, he was truly living up to his heritage, making every member of the Lucifer lineage proud. Potion lost his temper and jumped upward, aiming a strike towards Essence on the ground. He focused his mind on the body of his target, prepared to change his target at the slightest sign of seeing him make any part of his body intangible. Essence grinned and simply disappeared from the spot. When Pochin struck the ground and caused another small crater, he turned to look at Essence, who was seated on the shaft of his halberd that was still stuck in the center of the arena. Come on, dude. You have to be stronger than that for sure. Go all out, and I might actually consider using a weapon, otherwise this will be boring for me. Essence taunted with a soft smile. Pochin took a deep breath and calmed himself down. This was an international stage, he couldn't afford to lose his temper and act uncouth. Otherwise, he would be playing into this fellow's hands and make himself a laughingstock. As such, Podian simply bellowed as he puffed his chest out. Immediately, his body's size grew twofold, turning insanely buff, with veins pressing against his skin like wiggly worms crawling about. He clapped his hands together tightly, forming a light shockwave that blew through where Essence sat without doing anything. This made Essence display a loom of interest, wondering what this idiot was up to. Pochin seemed to confirm something when the shock wave his Essence and did nothing, then grinned as he charged forward. His speed was so great at this time that many eyes widened in shock and horror. Essence himself frowned at the sudden change in the fellow's aura. He didn't react much to the charge, 
but noticed that Pochan made a strike through his body. Right after, the fellow stomped the ground, which cracked the space under Essence's feet. Pochan's eyes narrowed when he noticed that his idea didn't work, which had been to unbalance Essence by affecting the environment around him. However, Essence seemed to be fixed in the point of space in which he was standing, so he was hovering above the crater, seemingly levitating. Essence smiled as he comprehended what Pochian had attempted. This fellow might be from that trash lineage, but it seemed he had received extensive training since his childhood. His combat abilities were not subpar, and his usage of his bloodline was almost as good as local lord. Pochian then stood before Essence, not retreating. Instead, he stretched his hands out to either side of his body. He stretched his body so far that everyone could see his muscles stretching and hear his bones creaking. Then he smirked menacingly at Essence before bringing his hands together with all his force, creating an explosive clap that caused a shockwave so powerful it blew those at the side away. The core members had to use various means to protect themselves while Amber waved her hand and erected a shield for the spectators who were looking on in shock and horror. This kind of shockwave had felt as if a massive eruption had occurred. When the wave subsided, one could see that Pochian was breathing roughly within the now-destroyed arena. His two hands were smoking greatly, the palms red like lava as he breathed roughly. It was clear that he couldn't even feel his hands with how badly they were shaking and the way they were stuck together. However, the crowd was horrified to see that his hands rapidly cooled down and separated as if nothing had occurred. Pochian even clapped them lightly again, making smaller thunderclaps as he inspected his palms. The members of Umbra were not too surprised by this, as they had fought beside local lord before. Seeing that fellow's survivability and learning the beef between him and Draco's family made them aware that he was no simple character. Still, to see him recover so fast made each of them solemn. They couldn't help but feel grateful that it was Essence who was paired with him during the first round. Their legendary classes would make them certainly beat him up good, but that kind of recovery would be a headache. Just picturing the fellow with a legendary class fitting his lineage made their blood run cold. Essence, though, was not bothered. Even if some god had blessed him with a divine class, he would never match him for one simple reason. He was simply a superior form of life. Case in point, Essence exited a small portal and hovered in the air behind Pocian. He then tapped the fellow on the shoulder as if he was going to politely ask his friend a question. Hey, buddy, did you think before you acted? I have already put the tab on my cousin Draco, but you weren't included. Can you really afford to pay for this? Essence asked with a concerned tone. Pocian heart quaked. He couldn't believe that the fellow was still alive after that. From his point of view, the fellow had the ability to manipulate space, which was fine, but space wasn't infallible. Any great disturbance in terms of energy or force could destabilize space, which was why he had performed that titanic clap earlier. In his mind, Essence must have been smashed to death, regardless of wherever he had chosen to hide. Truthfully, this wasn't a wrong strategy. This was a perfect way to deal with someone who used and abused space, just like it would be easy to defeat Silent Walker by destroying all obstacles so there would be nothing to create shadows. However, as they always said, in the face of ultimate power, all manner of trickery was useless. Ah, I see you don't understand. It's simple really. You must have misunderstood my actions for manipulating the conventional space that makes up our world, but that's wrong. Essence began explaining benevolently. Have you watched that old anime with the blonde guy who I always chasing after the purple-haired edgelord with ninjas and crap? In that, there was a spatial ability called Kamu, Kam, ka something that allowed them to transport things to a personal space. Essence shrugged. Mine is the same. You see me now, but you and I are not even in the same world. I am high above and you are beneath my feet in the dust. That is why I can stand here and watch you flail about without bothering to fight back. Even if I gave you a hundred years and infinite energy, you would not be able to make me uncomfortable, much less be able to harm me. Essence sighed and patted Potion on the shoulder lightly, but for Potion, it was like being struck by a hammer with each pat. 
He felt intense spatial force seep into his body and ravage him internally, but to onlookers, Essence looked like a benevolent person. Potion wanted to scream, to shout his defiance, but his knees wobbled as he began, oh, panic. Then his worst nightmare occurred. The weight of Essence's power crushed the superior strength that his bloodline gave him, forcing him to his knees. Essence walked around him and stood at his front, like a benevolent lord taking in the beginning kowtow of a foolish servant who had overstepped his bounds. The scene was so powerful that the crowd held their breath in shock, waiting for the conclusion. Essence looked down on Potion, and Potion struggled to raise his head to look at Essence. When their eyes met, Potion gasped slightly. He finally understood why he had lost. Those eyes weren't looking at a fellow human, but looking down upon an ant. It didn't matter what lineage he came from or what Pochin thought he could do, Essence had a million and one ways to kill him before he would even realize he had died. This epiphany struck Pochin so hard that his usually indomitable will inherited from the Pangu lineage evaporated, leaving him in the shadow of Essence forever. Pochin hung his head low, his heart dead as ashes. I admit defeat. Essence patted his head gently, knocking him out so as to spare him the shame. Rest. Enemies we may be, but I will not mistreat someone who understands the gap in power between a dragon and a mouse. Second match winner. Essence Stalker. Chapter 565. The Eighth and Ninth Floor. The Eighth Floor. Divine Quest Description. You have managed to prove your innocence in the slaughter of the Ironwood Village and gained a certain trust with the rebel faction. Now, you must devise a plan with them on how to best utilize the information you shared to defame the Carva Noble House and win the favor of the commoners. Devise a workable plan. Limitation 1. Your previous equipment skills spells have been sealed. Limitation 2. You have been reset to level 1. Provision 1. A unique set of skills can be acquired through skill spellbooks or practice. Provision 2. A special talent is generated to assist the player. Provision 3. Enemies are of notable difficulty. Provision 4. All equipment and abilities from the previous floor are carried over. Rewards. Score points. One bronze tier reward selection. Upon seeing the details, Draco facepalmed. This tower was annoyingly adamant about keeping the story within the range of the floor. So even though he had overturned things in previous floors, the story would act as if he had passed by doing the bare minimum on the last floor and forced him to pick up from there. At least Draco knew that this wasn't a mechanic specifically targeting him. According to Helia, even the frontrunners had been affected by it. No matter how high their score had been on a certain floor, the subsequent floors had possessed the same difficulty, and everything had been rewritten to follow the storyline. Fortunately, two could play that game. If the tower insisted on resetting their progress, all Draco had to do was restore the previous status quo. He took on the same transformation as before, along with the four beauties doing the same, shocking the executives once more. Just like the previous floor, they immediately went on their knees begging for forgiveness and the rest of the usual show. Draco brushed the matter off and got down to the topic of the floor itself, which was devising a plan of attack to win the heart of the commoners and reduce the standing of the Carva Noble House. To succeed in a clean takeover like this, political maneuvering was necessary. No insurgent group that replaced a previous regime would last long if they didn't have the support of the people beforehand, especially since most insurgent regimes would fall into the same vices as those that came before. This was a problem that stumped the rebels for a long while until the matter concerning Ironwood had come up, giving them a perfect excuse to leap from. However, it would be hard to handle it all perfectly for more than one reason. Firstly, this world was set in a medieval age similar to the Western fantasy section. As usual, the spread of information was tedious and informal, relying mostly on word of mouth. This would slow down the speed at which they could disseminate information to the entire province to get them up in arms towards their leaders. Secondly, the information spread could be quickly contained by the Carva Noble House since they had an iron grip on the entire province. Everyone who was someone was either in their pocket or on their watch list. With the reputation of the Dark Prison, very few were willing to risk anything in fear of ending up there 
and since the progress of Draco's group had been wiped clean, this meant that a copy of Jackson the Hell Imp was still terrorizing that place. Thirdly, spreading such information had quite a few ingenious means, but the issue was that nobody worked for free. While the rebels had some form of power and competency, they simply did not have the funds to carry out such large-scale operations. Otherwise, this floor would be easy as pie. Anyone could just sit down, suggest that they pay off some street urchins to spread this about, or do the same with prostitutes, drunkards, town criers, etc. There were many conventional and unconventional ways to go about this, but the issue was selecting the right one and executing it in such a way that it would yield a satisfactory result. However, the solution for D, Racco and Co. was obviously quite simple. One may distrust the words of a prostitute, urchin, or even stop the shouts of the town crier, but no citizen of this world would dare go against the proclamations of a god. This plan was so simple and effective that the rebels were speechless for a while, then they shivered with excitement. With a direct divine proclamation, there wasn't even any need to fight, they could just depose the noble house and take over. Heck, even the royal family wouldn't dare intervene in this matter. It was perfect. After hashing out some smaller details of the matter, Draco and co. noticed that the world around them began shattering and deconstructing itself as usual. What should have been a severe test of one's creative thinking and mental faculties was resolved in a matter of seconds for them. Draco wasn't ashamed to admit that they were practically cheating on these floors, but it was also a part of their power. They weren't using external means to solve the problem, but their own unique abilities in an unconventional and out-of-the-box way. Congratulations on completing Tower of Babylon 8th Floor. Time elapsed, UF 4. Objectives complete. All assessment. EX plus reward 12,000 points. One treasure selection. Reward, peak bronze grade. At this point, collecting perfect scores was like stealing candy from a baby. The destructive path may not be as useful in the latter floors since they required more in the way of mental prowess rather than martial, but for now, the five monsters intended to farm as many points as possible. Draco sighed and checked the rankings as usual. First, Draco Morningstar 12,000 points. Second, Gavin Guy won 355 points. Third, Dorothy Keel 1,352 points. Fourth, James Luster 1,350 points. Fifth, Mandingo, 1,247 points. Sixth, God's Son, 1,213 points. Seventh, Dark Lord, 194 points. Eighth, King's Return, 1,164 points. Ninth, Helia Neuer, 1,133 points. Tenth, McKinser, 1,119 points. Ho, it seemed like despite everything, those fellows actually had a reasonably good head on their shoulders. Most of the top 20 managed to earn above 1,000 points on this floor, which meant that they were able to devise somewhat useful plans in the end. Draco delightfully noticed that he now occupied 44th place with 66,350 score points. After the next perfect score, he would be knocking on the door of the top 10, which should probably leave him defeated, stressed, angry, and impotent. Thinking like this, Draco felt a flush of excitement run through at the realization that he was directly causing intense pain and mental suffering to the innocent. He had to take a deep breath to calm down and focus on what was more important. With his clearing speed, enough time hadn't passed for him to go and check on the progress of his store, so he dived onto the ninth floor. Hmm, maybe he could complete the first set of ten floors in the end? That would be quite interesting. When Draco appeared on this floor, he found himself riding on a horse with his wives doing the same near him. He was kitted in the equipment he had been given on the first floor, and so were they. Around them were men and women of the rebel faction in the same situation, glaring opposite them with intense amounts of hatred, fear, and trepidation. Draco took a gander and understood the situation immediately. They were currently in the midst of a face-off. Opposite them, some few kilometers away, was an army of knights and proper soldiers who wore the emblem of the Carva Noble House, as well as Devon himself. The nobleman was dressed in a beautiful set of armor that covered everything up to his neck. However, looking more carefully, one would notice that it was actually a mixture of soft leather and metal at parts. It was clearly quite functional for battle, 
yet a big focus of the design had clearly been spent on making it aesthetically pompous and grand. His arrogant expression as he gazes at the rebel army opposite and the various generals in the lead was quite annoying for those who were fighting for righteous Rhea, sons. However, Devon had every right to disdain them since his army was about twice the size of theirs. At this time, the objective for the floor came up. The ninth floor, Divine Quest Description. You have managed to devise a workable plan with the rebel faction with the Carva province. Put into action, it yielded great results and won them the support of the people. Infuriated and feeling threatened, Devin Carva cracked down on such methods, which only served to make his position worse. After a month of back and forth between the two factions, it has all come to a head-on collision in this final battle. Survive until the end. Limitation 1. Your previous equipment has been sealed. Limitation 2. You have been reset to level 1 and your former class skills are proportionate to your current level. Provision 1. A unique set of skills can be acquired through skills spellbooks or practice. Provision 2. A special talent is generated to assist the player. Provision 3. Enemies are of great difficulty. Provision 4. All equipment and abilities from the previous floor are carried over. Rewards, score points, one bronze tier reward selection. Well, this was the penultimate floor of the series, so it was pretty normal that the story was reaching its climax. The fabled final battle was here, and Draco could imagine that all players who had partaken in it were likely shitting their pants at the proposition of fighting. However, the tower was not that cruel. Firstly, it did not ask them to fight or kill X amount of enemies, but to survive to the end. There were many ingenious and unceremonious ways to do such a thing, and fighting head-on would be a foolish idea. Still, though, the tower made even more concessions on behalf of the trial taker. For one, skills and spells that they knew from outside the tower were no longer restricted. Only their equipment remained sealed for obvious reasons, but with their class abilities accessible, many would grow wings. After all, none of the trail takers were weak, far from it. It was just that the tower was too hard. If one didn't have senseless power like Draco, it was a torment to climb each and every floor due to how intense the challenges were. Still, although the tower evened out the playing field, it did attach a condition. The skills one had were tied to one's level in this world, so the power of your class would decide the power of your overall skills. Intrigued, Draco peeked at the levels of he and his four beauties, as well as how their skills had been translated here. Name, Draco. Class, Swordmaster Health, 3300. 7,050, mana, 550, stamina, stamina, 3,300, 1,750, level, 43, 80, XP, 5%, power, 75, 150, speed, 90, 180, magic, 10, 20, skills, quick slash, heavy slash, dual edge, cross slash, reverse, reverse slash, parry, new, backslash, new, air slash, new, demon fang, new, alt skills, dragon form, demon form, devil form, necrotic hands, malevolent spirit, cruel beast summoning, Evil Curse, Life Steal, Divination, Sinister Shot, Dark Resurrection, Beckon, Subsume, Angel's Blessing, Corrupted, Mind Blast, Charm, Spirit Suppression, Soul Fortification, Mystic Conversion, Duplicate, Soul Bond, Charm, Insight, Foresight, Flexibility, Illusion, Confusion, Evolution, Ultimate Stealth, Pinnacle Intelligence, Species Shift, Dragabond, Aether Conversion, Devil's Guile, Demonic Might, Draconic Superiority, Combine, Talent, Sword Soul, Name, Riveting Knight Class, Light Sage Health, 1,800, 350 mana, 8,450, 16,850 stamina, 1,800, 3,550, level 43, 85 XP, 5%, power, 3570, speed, 3570, magic, 168, 336, skills, reign of light, light shield, blessing of light, purification, detect evil, summon angel, purge undead new, edify new, lights champion new, paladin contract new. Alt skills, Searing Ray, Aura of Light, Light Ball, Purify, Instant Healing, Light Form, Void Form, Goddess Form, Might of Light, Void's Blessing, Celestial's Dignity, Element Regulation, Spacetime Regulation, Talent, Halo of Light. Name, Roma Claw, Cess, Witch Health, 5 1000 Mana, 2000, 3950, Stamina, 550, 1000, Level 4385, Exp, 5%, Power, 918, Speed, 918, 78 skills, Mystic Arrow, Magical Bolt, 
soul curse, withering curse, spectral cauldron, ancestral spirits, call of the ancients, new, binding curse, new, black fire, new, minion summon, new, alt skills, dark hands, chaos spirit, chimera summoning, silence, life drain, final blast, mystic resurrection, elemental corruption, perfect control, pinnacle insight, precognition, flexibility, mirage, talent, scent, name Zane, class Psylord health, 350, 750, mana, 1850, 3650, Stamina 350, 750, level 43, 85, x 5%, power 612, 1530, magic 36, 72, skills, launch, crush, hypnotize, telepathy, illusion, enhance, telemancy, new, teleportation, new, barrier, new, soul reading, new, alt skills, psi blade, psi barrier, psi restoration, indenture, seduction, ultra telekinesis, ultra psychometry, ultra telesthesia, ultra apportation, ultra transvection, lightning control, mirage, talent, mind mastery. Name Hikari, class Holy Saintess, health 15400, 17850, mana 13900, 26150, stamina 2800, 5250, level 43, 85x 5% power 49, 98 speed 4998, magic 245, 490 skills, heal, blessing, restore, invigorate, protect, stabilize, cleanse, new, cure, new, miracle, new, grand healing, new. Alt skills, white light healing, white barrier, white light blessing, white light resurrection, item creation, life creation, ether conversion, special dragabond, talent, aura of benevolence. Draco checked them out and realized that apart from their great growth in power, the skills themselves were not too different. Draco had long theorized that level 100 was the cap of this world, so he and his wives were only 15 levels away from that. This meant that they could use their original skills to almost their natural point of perfection. If they had reached level 100, their skills should be almost identical to the outside, which would have been amazing. Still, being able to use about 85% of their power was more than enough for their purposes here. At this time, the two armies' commanders stepped forth to confront each other. Devon alone stood before the 12 generals of the rebel army who were gazing at him with malice dripping from their eyes. Well, 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 I never expected a bunch of rabble to make it this far. It is my underestimation of you that led to this issue, and I shan't make the same mistake twice. I will crush you all with my full power and enjoy as you squirm in despair and far throughout the entire process. Devon stated cruelly, his eyes flashing with disdain. Many of the troops around Draco shivered on their horse, and he could sense their resolve weakening. They had an almost visceral fear of this fellow and his methods, even though they wished to also destroy him thoroughly. Probably sensing the effects of his words, the faces of the rebel generals became ugly. One female general, who seemed quite fierce among them, stood forth and sneered. Tough words, almighty Devon Carva. At the end of the day, it is us rabble who managed to drag you out of your posh mansion. At the end of the day, it was us rabble who managed to rally the people against you. At the end of the day, it is us rabble who will take your head and place it on the market square for everyone to see. Her valiant words stirred up the energy in the rebels, and they roared in unison when she pointed her sword at Devon's head and made a rude cutting gesture. Devon's expression changed, and so did that of his men. They displayed utter fury and rage at their enemies. Devon unsheathed his sword and pointed to the group of rebels. How dare these vile Cretans utter such uncouth trash? Men, slaughter them all, castrate the men and let the horses use them as outlets, capture the woman and rape them to death. I want to see them all die in the most horrific way possible. The soldiers on his side roared with excitement. Just to like their vile lord, they loved to afflict horrors upon their foes. They had ridden with him on many a conquest and had performed atrocities that Devon's own children would shun him for. Normally, he made sure there would be no one alive to tell the tale, and he kept his own men quiet using a variety of means. How? But how could he predict that his own knights would go overboard and use the usual horrific means he dealt with foreign enemies on a bunch of innocent villagers? It was this act that had led to this battle in the end, which Devon found infuriating, but he could only sigh inwardly as he knew it was inevitable. The cup had run over and would spill to the side at a slight push, so he was prepared. Today, he would show the world his secret to success 
and why he was the divine son chosen to lead this province, and one day, the entire empire. Devon took out a pendant from his chest area that was shaped like a skull. A small blackish aura enveloped it, which was invisible to those who were average. To the weak, it just seemed creepy and ominous, but to the powerful, they would tremble as they felt an aura from it that was not to be violated in the least. Devon showed fervor as he kissed the pendant and spoken zealously. O Baphomet, Lord of Suffering and Paragon of Evil, grant your apostle the power to effect your will on the living. The moment he completed his prayer, the blackish aura on the pendant that had been dormant burst out, becoming visible to all. This aura flew in wisps from the pendant and struck each of Devon's men, making them scream with pain and anguish for a few seconds before they transformed into something else. The rest of the black aura converged on Devon himself, making him thrash in pain for a second or two before he transformed into his true form, which was the secret to all his victories. A Death Knight Chapter 566 The Tenth Floor Devon's dark aura permeated the battlefield, making everyone on the side of the rebels show expressions of horror and dismay. What was even worse was that the foes they had been about to fight had also transformed, becoming entities similar to Devon but much weaker depending on their rank. The soldiers only had a little bit of darkness surrounding them, their human bodies still visible even though their eyes had become bloodshot and their expressions filled with insane malice. The knights had a suitable amount of darkness around them, enough to form a cloak. Their eyes had also become red, but there was a certain cruel lucidity in them that showed that they were perfectly aware of what they were right now, what they were about to do, and that they were looking forward to it. Devon himself was completely bathed in darkness energy, making it seem as if he had been born from it. Little could be seen of him, just endless burning darkness and two red spots that should likely be his eyes. They went from intimidating and organized to downright demonic and horrifying. Many rebels who had been ready to charge were now pale-faced, their knees shaking, as they directly considered putting all their energy into fleeing as fast as their horses would allow. In a battle of minds, the rebels had already lost. However, it really wasn't their fault, as what they were dealing with would make anyone shit their pants in fear. Even the generals at the forefront were shivering, unsure, and disbelieving of what they were seeing. At the back, Draco was rubbing his chin with interest. Well, no wonder this floor is merely about surviving the battle. Here I was looking forward to an epic medieval clash, one that would allow us to weave through the battle stealing kills to increase the rating. But it's never simple with this tower, eh? Zane shook her head. It would be too easy if that would have been the case. Since everything but our equipment got freed, Many trials takers would have had hundreds of ways to fight if this would have been a simple brawl. However, switching things up like this suitably negates or suppresses the benefit gained by the access to skills and spells. Ava flicked a finger, sending a small beam of light hurling forward and piercing through one of the knights casually. One could even say that it is precisely because of the up and ante that skills and spells were released. Otherwise, with how low level the average trial taker should be, I really cannot see how they would even begin to cope with this. Roma was tempted to summon her witch slaves and let them feast, but held back. If the fellow had a dark god behind him all this time, why did he succumb to us on the sixth floor when we were supposed to be hanged? Hikari waved her hand and cast white light blessing on her family and all the rebels, invigorating them and shocking the latter group. They suddenly felt as if their power had multiplied four times, which was enough to even make them slightly superior to their enemy. Maybe because we were higher on the hierarchy? Hikari smiled with satisfaction, especially when the others gave her looks of praise. Great idea, Hikari. Truly clever. Eva praised gently. Hikari, drunk with happiness, curled her eyes so far that they could form an arc of their own. Hey, hey it's nothing, it's nothing. Zane rode forward a little and smiled. If you don't mind, I would like to take the stage this time. It's been a while since I've flexed my mental abilities in battle. The others didn't object. Zane then glowed with a soft blue light, her mind's domain spreading over the entire battlefield. 
no one but Draco and Eva could feel it, and Devon, to a small extent. Zane took out a single steel arrow from the quiver of an archer on their side and shot it forward. Like a dart, it weaved around the battlefield, piercing through the heads and hearts of the nearest enemies to the rebel line. This was shocking to the rebels, for it looked like, just as they had been about to be struck, the charge, inge enemy opposite them, would roar in agony and fall over, dead. They would either grasp their chest or their heads would explode like watermelons. Zane maneuvered this single arrow too fast for anyone to see or react to. She was single-handedly clearing the battlefield rapidly using just this one projectile. What was even more amusing was that the succubus was idly humming all the while, showing off that this was no grand feat to her. Once she cleared all the soldiers, the arrow was sent blasting towards Devon, who simply growled and caught it with ease. The arrow shook and struggled in his grip, making his face ugly as he had to exert a great amount of force to keep it in place. Not bad, Zane smiled. Devon crushed the arrow itself, realizing that the pressure was mounting. He then gazed at his fallen men with an unreadable expression and spoke coldly. Get up, you lazy pigs. You only are only allowed to die after Lord Baphomet gives you permission. A wave of darkness energy swept over the battlefield after Devon spoke, covering the bodies of his slain men. As if they were broken puppets who had faulty strings, they slowly rose to their feet once more. Their bodies regenerated from the damage Zane did, eventually returning their sentience and dexterity. They quickly remounted their horses if they were still alive, or picked up their weapons and got ready to charge once more. This left the rebel army speechless, while the Morningstar group was merely mildly surprised. Draco and Eva shared a look, then shook their heads. Waste of time, they will all be sent into hell, which would unbalance the scales between us. Draco commented with a sigh. I agree, it's best to let Roma have her fun, as they could prove useful to her. Eva agreed as she folded her arms. Roma seemed giddy at that prospect. Thank you, Draco, big sis. I'll make good use of those souls. Zane smiled. Little Roma, let me harvest their lives and you can harvest their souls. That should put them down for good. Roma nodded obediently. Sister Zane, lead the way. Zany focused on the battle and the blue light around her intensified further. She laughed softly and removed all the arrows in the quicker of the various archer who were shocked to see this happen. The arrows slowly and menacingly rose above the rebel army, aimed in the direction of the now undead, noble army. They hovered there for a split second, the revived soldiers shocked by this sight as they finally recognized what had reaped their lives previously. Due to how fast Zane moved the arrow, they had literally died without even knowing how. Now that they were confronted with the method of their death, they were less fearful and more defiant. This seemed to be the trigger for Zane, as she shot out all the arrows forward at speeds that made the previous skirmish look like a joke. Each arrow weaved around to find its own target, reaping their life with even more ease than before, as they were unable to react at all. When their bodies fell, a blackish light would be torn from those bodies which would float over into Roma's hands, her body also glowing with a green light as her lovely white hair rose and moved around like they were snakes. The moment the soul was ripped from the bodies, they would slowly turn to ash as the darkness energy within would return to Devon, further strengthening him. This shocked the Death Knight, who realized his men were suffering from true death this time. He was incomparably enraged by this fact and shouted, Ho! He wanted to move out and defend his men. But Zane and Roma were too fast, too efficient, and too powerful. Instead of spending time shouting meaningless things, Devon should have acted the moment he felt something wrong. By the time he was ready to do so, the battlefield had already been clear. It was just him standing on the opposite side of the rebels, with hundreds of arrows slowly regrouping and facing his direction. Devon gritted his teeth with anger. Good, let me personally how you the meaning of despair then. He stretched his hand out to the right, and the endless amount of darkness energy shrouding his body solidified into a huge lance. He then hoisted this lance and kicked the side of his horse, which then tapped the ground, building momentum. At the same time, Zane unleashed all the arrows in her arsenal towards Devon. 
The projectiles hurled toward Devon at scary, bullet-like speeds. The fellow burst forth, breaking the sound barrier. His charge knocked away any arrows in his path and quickly bypassed all others. He then tore into the ranks of the rebels, killing a huge swath of the army within them who had failed to comprehend what had been happening in the last minutes. Devon's red eyes roamed his helmet as he looked for his target, then noticed Zane, who was releasing mental fluctuations that were familiar to him. Not to mention that she was glowing blue, which so happened to be the color surrounding the arrows. He then saw Roma, who was glowing green and was about to pocket the souls of his men. At the speed Devon was moving, it was as if time had stopped, so he was able to see all this in an instant and angle his horse towards Zany. He would slaughter this wench first and present her soul to Lord Baphomet. Then he would deal with the other one slowly, freeing his men and have them rape her to death, then collect her own soul to find out how she was able to manage such abilities. However, just as Devon was about to pierce Zane's head with his dark lance, two fingers pinched the tip of his spear lightly, stopping it completely. No matter how much strength Devon mustered to pull or push, the spear did not move. Zane herself did not seem bothered or worried, only wearing a lovely smile on her face. The blue light around her slowly dissipated as she returned the arrows to their quivers. As for Roma, she pocketed the souls anyway without disturbance, and the green light around her faded away. She then gazed at Devon with defiance and derision. To get near to any of them, there was an insurmountable wall anyone and everyone had to cross, their husband Draco. The fellow which pinched the spear itself commented in a slightly amused tone. Hey there, homie, if you try to show off your skills with your little toy there, then how about I accompany you? Devon was utterly shocked. It was as if the darkness energy he had been blessed with by Lord Baphomet didn't even exist in front of this fellow. He could even feel that if the man opposite him wanted to, he could rob him of his control. For the first time since this battle began, Devon began to sweat as he felt a wave of fear. Draco then waved his hand and the spear returned into darkness energy that merged with Devon. Next, the darkness energy that Devon had controlled created bindings that tied him up, further leaving the noble lord shocked and horrified. He could only stare at Draco, wondering if this fellow was the incarnation of Baphomet? Otherwise, how could he maneuver Baphomet's darkness energy so easily? If only Devon knew. Baphomet would have to greet Draco on his knees and with 800 kowtows, happy to even lick the other's filthy mud-covered boots just for some favor from the demon supreme that was Draco. In fact, he could even summon the avatar of Baphomet here from his hell. He briefly wondered how Devon would react, but ultimately couldn't be bothered to find out. Instead, Draco used his telekinesis to drag the rebel generals over. We can't afford to kill the noble lord, as that is against this kingdom's law, most likely. Let's imprison him and have him tried by the royal court for his actions instead. The rebel generals could only share wry looks and kneel down. We hear and obey. What else were they supposed to do after seeing all this? Besides, Draco had wrapped everything up nicely for them, and all those who had been killed by Devon had been resurrected by Hikari, who enjoyed the act of returning life to the willing and deserving. Soon, the floor began deconstructing itself, as the group had obviously cleared it to perfection. Draco checked the results of the floor first and foremost. Congratulations on completing Tower of Babylon Ninth Floor. Time elapsed, 033. Objectives complete. All assessment. EX plus. Reward, 13,000. Score points. One treasure selection reward. Peak bronze grade. Next were the floor-specific rankings, which were as usual quite brutal in terms of the gap Draco gave those former leaders who had hogged the top 10. First, Draco Morningstar. 13,000 points. Second, Gavin Guy. 887 points. Third, Dorothy Keel. 83 points. 4th, James Luster, 880 points. 5th, Mandingo, 843 points. 6th, God's Son, 841 points. 7th, Dark Lord, 834 points. 8th, King's Return, 832 points. 9th, Helia Noor, 822 points. 10th, McKinser, 813 points. While the gap between the trial takers wasn't as wide as usual, it went to show that in terms of power and skill, the various trail takers were not so different from each other. 
since the ninth floor had returned them access to their skills and spells, many had been able to show their true prowess, even if they hadn't been able to easily fight against Devon and his group. Well, since there was only one floor left, Draco decided to hop to it. The portal whisked him away from his castle to the tenth floor, which was the last in this series. Draco materialized on the battlefield they had just fought on. The difference was that most of the rebels had been slaughtered and that Devon was currently about to initiate the torture upon them. Even the rebel generals were lying in pools of blood, while Devon's own men were chipper and dandy, giggling maliciously as they walked over to begin their feast. Before anyone had the chance to ask why Draco and the Four Beauties were somehow the only ones who looked fine while everyone else was on the floor, a bright white light shone on the area. A lovely voice sounded out at that moment, making all the rebels' faces change, as well as the noble soldiers. In the name of the Ordelia royal family, stay your hand, vile knaves. The white light revitalized the wounds of the rebels, making them rise up from the ground with surprised expressions while the darkness-infused soldiers screamed in agony, a sizzling sound coming off them like meat being thrown into hot oil. Even Devon roared with agony, a good chunk of the darkness covering him, torn away. It was then that the voice was made known to the crowd, as it was an entourage led by two women and a few hundred others riding behind her. Draco and Co. recognized these fellows. The two ladies, one holding a scepter and the other a set of short swords, were the same two women who had been responsible for the class quests back on the first floor of the tower. Behind them were the likes of the quartermaster, who had a huge greatsword slung over his shoulder, and the scholar who had given them directions, with a tome in hand, as he pushed his glasses up with a smile. There were many royal knights, and even some mercenaries behind her. However, the vast majority were adventurers from neighboring towns and villages close to Ironwood. Draco may not have been paying attention, but his memory was sharp enough to remember most of these faces from floor one. Devon's expression showed horror as he thrashed on the ground, unable to escape. The rebel generals, though, showed fervor and fell to their knees with reverence, bowing towards the two ladies at the front. Greetings to Saint Princess Eliza and Crown Princess Jenna. The rebel generals cried out. The one holding the light scepter seemed to be the Saint Princess, and she pulled back her hood to display a visage so lovely that while it was far below, Eva was only slightly below Hikari. Her hair was pink in color, and her eyes were a silvery blue color. She had soft features and a gentle disposition that made one feel safe near her. Her body was svelte and quite average, not really curvy. The princess holding the short swords seemed to be the crown princess, and she also flipped her hood back to display a visage that was quite pretty, albeit slightly marked by a scar running down he, our cheek. In comparison to her sister, though, this princess had a fiercer and more valiant disposition that made men intrigued, as well as a body that was a few levels above Roma, but a few levels below Zane. The contrast between valiant and sexy as well as gentle and lovely made for a sight that many would treasure. Of course, once one got a look at the four beauties, this didn't seem so great anymore, but all attention was on the princesses right now. Rise, warriors of justice. You have fought and given your lives for a valiant cause. The crown shall not forget your efforts. Eliza said kindly, Now, join us as we run that knave and his forces of evil through. Jenna added bravely, pointing her sword towards Devon, who was rising to his feet. The blackish aura around Devon was constantly fluctuating like it was about to go out, but suddenly it seemed to receive new fuel as it blazed higher and higher. Devon screamed from within, laughing with madness at the same time. I cannot be defeated! Everyone was blown back by a black shockwave from Devon as the epicenter, and the land around them began to wither. His men who had been purged and purified rose to their feet once more. Even worse, portals opened from the ground, many demons shrieking with glee and hunger as they gleefully set foot upon the land of the mortals. Chapter 567 The Final Battle The faces of many changed at this sight. Devon seemed to have tapped even deeper into his nefarious power as a response to his plight. 
Either that or Baphomet was truly infuriated by the wave of holy power and had decided to bestow more upon his apostle. After all, it was obvious enough that the saint princess had to represent another god to have such power, probably an apostle of a light or sign justice god. She was different from Hikari, who was a saintess without a deity backing her, because of her talent. Speaking of that, while Devon amassed his forces of evil, it seemed like the god behind the saint princess had no desire to be shown up. As such, a bright light emerged from the body of the woman and swept over the battlefield, condensing on the bodies of each rebel and warrior on their side. This shocked everyone as they lifted their hands to see a thin veil of white light covering their bodies. They felt healthier and slightly stronger, which boosted their confidence. Everyone, the great god of resurrection, Sinod Mara, has blessed us with his divine providence. For the next hour, your attacks against demons will inflict twice the damage and you will rapidly heal from all wounds. On top of that, death will no longer stop you, as you will be able to rise endlessly, regardless of what happens to you. The Saint Princess Eliza spoke out with a gentle cry. This made the blood of everyone on the side of good here boil, as they knew that the God of Resurrection was the strongest God of the Light Pantheon. To have his blessing would forever be the greatest honor of their lives, and they would be sure to fight direly on his behalf. Draco and Co. also received this blessing, though Draco casually negated it using some destruction energy while Eva waved her hands lightly, dissipating it. Zane and Roma decided to accept it, because why not, and Hikari was exempted because she was the saintess of another deity, herself. It wasn't that Draco and Eva were not willing to receive a free buff, but rather that they didn't need it. Instead, Hikari cast White Light Blessing once more, which was now at full power since they had reached level 100 in each class after their slaughter on the previous floor. And just as Draco had expected, at least for this series, it was the level cap. Name, Class Swordmaster Health, 7,150, 8 Mive 150, 1,300. Stamina, 750, 8 550, level 85, 100. Exp 100% 100 power, 150, 180. Speed, 180. 200 magic 20, 25 skills. Quick slash, heavy slash, dual edge, cross slash, reverse slash, riposte, parry, backslash, air slash, demon fang, burning slash, new, great ether, new. Alt skills, dragon form, demon form, devil form, necrotic hands, malevolent spirit, cruel beast summoning, evil curse, lifesteal, divination, sinister shot, dark resurrection, Beckon, Subsume, Angel's Blessing, Mind Blast, Charm, Spirit Suppression, Soul Fortification, Mystic Conversion, Duplicate, Soul Bond, Charm, Insight, Foresight, Flexibility, Illusion, Confusion, Evolution, Ultimate Stealth, Pinnacle Intelligence, Species Shift, Dragabond, Ether Conversion, Devil's Guile, Demonic Might, Draconic Superiority, Combine, Talent, Sword Soul, Name, Riveting Knight, Class, Light Sage, Health, 3350, 650, Mana 16 thun 50, 21 thun 50. Stamina 3 thun 50, 650. Level 85, 100. XP 100% power 70, 120. Speed 70, 120. Magic 336, 420. Skills Rain of Light, Light Shield, Blessing of Light, Purification, Detect Evil, Summon Angel, Purge Undead, Edify, Light's Champion, Paladin Contract, Holy Blast, New, Heaven's Field, New. Alt Skills Searing Ray, Aura of Light, Light Purify, Instant Healing. Light Form, Void Form, Goddess Form, Might of Light, Void's Blessing, Celestial's Dignity, Element Regulation, Space-Time Regulation, Talent, Halo of Light. Name, Roma Class Witch Health, 1000, 1300, Mana 3050, 5050, Stamina 1000, 1300, Level 85, 100, Exp 100%, Power 1824, Speed 1824, Magic 78, 100 S, Kills, Mystic Arrow, Magical Bolt, Soul Curse, Withering Curse, Spectral Cauldron, Ancestral Spirits, Call of the Ancients, Binding Curse, Black Fire, Minion Summon, Requiem of Souls, New, Crone Transformation, New, Alt Skills, Dark Hands, Chaos Spirit, Chimera Summoning, Silence, Life Drain, Final Blast, Mystic Resurrection, Elemental Corruption, Perfect Control, Pinnacle Insight, Precognition, Flexibility, Mirage, Talent, Mana Sensitivity, Name Zane, Class Psylord Health, 750, 900 mana, 3650, 4950, stamina, 750, 900, 
Level 85, 100, XP 100%, Power 12, 15, Speed 30, 40, Magic 72, 98, Skills, Launch, Crush, Hypnotize, Telepathy, Illusion, Enhance, Telemancy, Teleportation, Barrier, Soul Reading, Mind Control, Clones, New, Alt Skills, Psy Blade, Psy Barrier, Psy Restoration, Indenture, Seduction, Ultra Telekinesis, Ultra Psychometry, Ultra Telesthesia, Ultra Apportation, Ultra Transvection, Lightning Control, Mirage, Talent, Mind Mastery. Name Hikari, Class Holy Saintus, Health 15 to 400, 17 day and age and 50, Mana 26,150, Stamina 2,800, 5,250, Level 85, 100, Exp 100%, Power 49, 98, Speed 49, 98, Magic 2 and 45, 490, Skills, Heal, Blessing, Restore, Invigorate, Protect, Stabilize, Cleanse, Cure, Miracle, Grand Healing, Grand Cure, New, Resurrection, New, Alt Skills, White Light Healing, White Barrier, White Light Blessing, White Light Resurrection, Item Creation, Life Creation, Ether Conversion, Special Dragabond, Talent, Aura of Benevolence. With their classes leveled to perfection and their stats at their pinnacle, they could opt to use their strength that the floor gave, or their real strength, or even a mix of both really. Suddenly, the demons stopped rising from the floor as Devin's roaring laughter came to an end. Before the group stood over 200 soldiers that had been coated in darkness, turning them into death warriors, 1,000 demons, and one dreadlord, which was Devon himself. The death warriors were all coated with intense amounts of darkness energy, their eyes only showing as red light from those visages. Just like Devon, they manifested weapons they were familiar with using the aura flowing around them. The demons were of different kinds, roaring a screeching as they gazed upon the living, eager to rush in a cause pain, torment, and suffering to their foes, or anything they could get their hands on, really. Devon had become a nine-foot-tall monstrosity that was coated in a black carapace. He was shaped like a humanoid with a muscular and well-built body, as well as two wings behind his back, with burning green eyes, the only other feature on his void-like face. Author's Note he looks like Terrorblade's demon metamorphosis form from Dota 1. The power, heat, and evil they radiated was enough to scare anyone, but the forces of justice that had been buffed by the white dragoness Hikari, as well as the god of resurrection, Sino Demara, showed no fear. The two princesses were especially shocked upon being buffed with her white light blessing. As the two protagonists of this floor, their power was not as simple as being level 100. To have been further buffed by four times was enough to greatly mitigate the threat from Devon. When the princesses gazed over to see who was the cause, their faces became red. After all, they had met eye to eye with Draco first, which had been a fatal mistake. He had certainly been retracting his attraction aura, but focusing on him too much would lead to bad effects. Just like Zane was retracting her seduction aura, that alone didn't make her Z-grade booty disappear. Then they took in the sight of Ava, Roma, Zaini, and Hikari with shock. Such beautiful women. How could they be here among these rebels? They also gave off a certain power that made the princesses tremble, as if they could be executed in the blink of an eye. The only ones that gave them this feeling were the... Suddenly, the faces of the two princesses changed greatly. Before they could make any other action, Draco waved his hand and transferred a mem, assage to their minds using telepathy. We're just here to watch and provide support. Carry on. Understanding Draco's meaning, the two princesses bowed deeply towards his direction and focused on Devon. Since they had the support of the Ordelia's family patron god, as well as these strange gods, there was no way they could lose. At this time, Draco noticed that the floor's menu had finally popped up. The tenth floor, Divine Quest Description. After fighting against the evil Devon Carva and his troops of darkness, you and your faction were beaten to the ground and about to be vanquished when a holy light swept over. The royal family are here to assist you in your plight and have brought their own troops and blessings. Devon Carver reacts to this and unleashes his full power, giving up his all in exchange for the chance to slaughter his foes. The final battle begins. Fight. Limitation 1. Enemies are of impossible difficulty. Limitation 2. Your former class skills, spells, and equipment are proportionate to your current level. Provision 1. 
a unique set of skills can be acquired through skill spellbooks or practice. Provision 2, a special talent is generated to assist the player. Provision 3, all equipment and abilities from the previous floor are carried over. Provision 4, you have been boosted to level 100 in order to fight effectively. Rewards, score points, one bronze tier reward selection. Charge, Jenna screamed, pointing her sword towards the enemy, while her side burst forth with valor, roaring as they rushed to kill the vile demon spawn. Kill, torture, rape, slaughter. Devon roared the four cardinal virtues of the demons, making their mind go crazy with excitement. They also shrieked as they rushed towards the mortals of the light, aiming to tear their enemies to shreds. The two sides met in a brutal clash in the middle, hundreds of lives being snuffed out in a single moment. However, the demons simply regenerated from their wound with ease, while the warriors rose up in a white glow, similarly unharmed. What should have been a valiant battle for supremacy became a meat grinder of epic proportions, the sight so horrifying that the faces of the Morningstar group changed. Warriors would cleave demons in twain, then the bodies would spontaneously light up with hellfire, and them rise up, hale and hearty. However, the innards and organs that had been expelled during the cleave would be left on the ground as a memento of the near-death experience. The same happened when a demon ripped a man into two. His heart and other parts splattered around, his blood spurting like a fountain. However, with a white glow that forced the demons back, his body was re-merged and he stood with perfectly normal and ready to go once more. However, the blood splatter and his old heart would be left on the ground, marking that he had once died here in truth. As this kept repeating itself, with various arms, legs, and eyeballs being left behind with each healing, the battlefield soon became a bloody marsh with body parts that had been stomped and steeped on until they became a form of reddish-brown paste. The sight and the smell did not bother those who were fighting, too lost in their madness, bout that they only saw red as they continued fighting while laughing, whether demon or human. The ability to resurrect from death was great, but it came at a cost to the mind when repeated over and over again in a short period of time. On the other side, the two princesses were battling against Devon himself in an epic and climactic battle. Jenna was wielding her two short swords, directly dueling Devon, who had manifested two long kopeshes that he used to fight back. Jenna was like a cyclone, spinning and jumping all over the place as she stuck endlessly towards Devon, who easily countered her. Even with Hikari's boost, the Dreadlord was not phased in the least. Eliza assisted her sister from the back by casting further buffs on Jenna and debuffs on Devon, as well as healing Jenna due to the strength difference between the two. Oh, however, anyone could see that the two princess alone could not defeat this foe, which was likely where the trial taker was supposed to step in. Being elevated to level 100, given access to their class skills, spells, racial abilities, various titles, and their own equipment, they had no excuse to be cowering as they had been forced to on the previous floors. Understanding this, Draco laughed. Well, my babes, it's finally time for me to show off. Witness me. Draco jumped off the horse that had been active since the eighth floor, landing on the ground with a small smile on his face. Eva, Hikari, Zane, and Roma watched Draco silently, their eyes flashing with a strange glint. Draco dropped the swords he had been given on the first floor, the yin-yang blades, and a dark fire began to burn on his body. His swordsman leather garb was burned to crisp, but Draco's nakedness was covered with the black light. From it, a set of medium armor appeared, scaly like the body of a dragon and with a lion's head carving in the center. Behind him was a long black cape that had followed him since he had first met Richmond and received the titled God's Heraldry. As Draco walked forward, the burning light left his body as his Dragorugio set came to life, the subtle sound of a dragon's roar covering the battlefield. The burning black light converged into either one of his palms. In the right hand, a black scaly sword manifested, its body glowing with destruction energy. On its blade was the carving on an Asian dragon that had a long body and four scales, while its hilt was shaped like a dragon's head. The eyes of the dragon on the head glowed with a bright red light, as if it was alive and could see everything. In his left, a majestic sword glowed with resplendent light, 
possessing the length of a typical longsword, as well as double edge with a unique rivet running up and down its center. However, the blade itself shone, shone with a bluish-green color and resembled a piece of crystal rather than metal. Within this crystal-like blade swam many beautiful sea nymphs who played and posed sexily. Not only that, but there were tiny sea monsters within that same space that looked ready to rip and tear anything in their way. The hilt of the blade was a beautiful azure color, with the motif of tumultuous waves crashing against the shore on each side, while grip was styled like the scales of a mermaid, and the pommel held a small cyan orb that sparkled gently. Dragorugio the sword and Fragorok had come to him, wielding both of the two overpowered blades in either hand and flourishing them, Draco smiled. His appearance attracted the attention of some demons who roared and charged at him. With a smile, Draco decided to fight using only the skills that were given by this tower. The demon that attacked him first swung its claw towards his head, aiming to smash his brain into pulp. And so Draco used his first skill, Quick Slash. Before any eye could follow, a black streak cut through the body of the demon while it was still in motion, severing it in half. Unlike before where it would rise again, its form was slowly consumed by a blackish light that fought against and devoured another black miasma. The others didn't seem to notice this with how far they had fallen into madness. The next one came rushing at Draco, yet he simply raised Fragrak up into the air and charged his power before bringing it down. Heavy slash! The demon was cut from head to groin in one attack, its body not coated by any destruction energy, but its resurrection was destroyed by Fragorok's first passive. The next foe was a larger demon with a burly form, its muscular body towering over Draco. It raised a club to smash him into pieces, but Draco used this third-class skill, Dual Edge. Both his swords combined into one blade that was coated with darkness, destruction, wind, and water energy as it grew in size, cutting the demon before Draco into pieces and leaving nothing behind. Having absolute fun, Draco responded to a two-pronged attack from the front and back. C. Ross Slash? Reverse Slash. To the enemy in the front, he swung both swords in an X-shape, cutting them neatly into four pieces. To the enemy from the back, Draco swung both swords backward in a bone-breaking motion that should not be possible, but was executed perfectly. This time, a demon warrior rushed at Draco from behind, aiming to strike the nape of his neck with a dagger. The fellow was an assassin and had been waiting for this chance to strike. Draco smirked. Backslash? Draco flipped backward, going over the body of his assassin and bisecting him easily when he slashed downward as his feet touched the ground. He then kicked the corpse away and continued walking towards Devon, who was oppressing the two sisters. Did you think you could best me? wah you fools! I am the strongest in the universe! Devon bellowed with glee as he blasted Jenna away. A powerful demon noticed Draco approaching their lord and rushed at him, swinging a huge greatsword at him. This one was garbed in equipment and had a light of wisdom in his eyes that was different to those Draco fought until now. However, it made little difference. Air Slash Draco stood where he was and swung his sword lightly, but a wave of sword light emerged from the edge that was coated with destruction energy. It simply passed through the torso of the demon in question, stopping its charge as its top slid off its bottom. With that obstacle clearing, Draco was free to make a beeline for Devon, who was about to stomp on a beaten Jenna, who could only struggle to rise again, defiantly. As for Eliza, Devon was holding her in one hand, as the Saint Princess was struggling not to be crushed to death. Before the two princesses could be killed, a huge wave of heat rushed over towards Devon, making him toss them away as he jumped into the air to avoid it. It exploded beneath him and made the Dreadlord sweat, but he then laughed mockingly. Trash! You missed me! What? He screamed as Draco appeared above him, his sword coming down upon the Dreadlord faster than he could react. Chapter 568 Foundational Floors and Burning Attack With that roar, Draco brought his sword down upon the head of Devon, who could only raise a hand to block. However, this attempt was futile, as Fragorok cut through his arm like it was paper. It was a sword that had the ability to cut through any defense, so trying to block or parry it was utterly foolish. The only way to survive Fragorak's assault was to dodge it. 
Draco cut Devon from top to bottom, time itself seeming to freeze as everyone nearby showed different expressions. Draco was shouting, Devon's eyes were stretched wide in horror and fear, while the two princesses gazed on in utter shock. In that split second, a line formed from Devon's brows to his groin, a patch of blue amidst the eternal darkness that made up his physical form. As the line developed and his two sides began to split apart, Draco finished the rest of the attack. Not stopping there, he used Fragorok to make many more strikes, so fast that only sword lights could be seen. Each one cut through Devon like a hot knife through butter, each one leaving a blue light showing how he had been cut at that moment. By the time Draco was done with his flurry of slashes, there was no part of Devon that had been left untouched. Only a split second had passed for him to be turned into cube-like pieces that separated and were about to fall to the ground, still floating in midair for a moment. Before this could happen, Draco brought his other hand that was free and aimed a palm towards the remains of Devon. From his hand came a wave of searing hot light energy that blasted the remains into ash. No! That was the final scream Devon could muster as he was thoroughly edified by the light energy spell Draco had used via his mage god title. He couldn't use subjective magic without it, obviously. The two princesses just watched frozen as all this occurred and as Draco slowly hovered down the ground before them. The fellow then shook his hands, making his sword disappear. Folding them across his chest, Draco gazed down at the two. Well, you aren't going to keep lying there, are you? He asked with an amused tone. Both princesses froze as they realized their gaffe, then quickly scrambled to their feet with a spot of redness on their cheeks. Once they patted themselves down and managed to regain some calm, they observed Draco silently. The more they did, the more they wished they hadn't because he really was quite nice to look at. Not only that, when they thought about how he had swooped in their moment of distress and on their final breath to slay the enemy with such ease and valor, it was obvious that the two of them would feel some strange stirrings in their hearts. Well, they were princesses in a magical world after all. If a knight in shining armor didn't get them going, then it would mean that everything was a lie. Eliza cleared her throat and spoke gently. Thank you, noble hero, for saving the two of us. May we have the pleasure of knowing your name, dear sir? Draco answered with a smile. Draco Morningstar, Swordmaster. Jenna gazed at him with a strange light in her eyes. What was that ability you just used? I have seen level 100 swordsmen attack before, and none of them have used such a thing. Draco turned to the valiant princess with a strange glint in his eye. It's a unique ability given to me, I guess. I honestly thought it was something everyone would get, but I guess it's not possible given your current words. Before the two could speak again, Draco raised a hand to stop them. Don't worry, we can certainly chat a bit more once the battle is over. The silenced princesses were startled when they remembered that yes, even though Devon was dead, his demons and death warriors were still rampaging among their men. When they turned to see the gory battlefield, the two princesses almost fainted. Jenna held up well as she was a maiden made for battle, but Eliza almost folded in on herself at that moment. To her, this was a scene from the deepest depths of hell. He demons and humans were fighting each other while cackling with madness, ripping and tearing each other apart like animals, only to be revived the next second with some of their body parts left behind. In this situation, apart from one side having pale or tanned skin and the other having pockmarked red skin, it would be impossible to tell apart who the demons were and who the humans were. They were both doing the same thing, smiling the same way and enjoying it as much as the other side. It was natural for Eliza to faint as a saintess because this is not what she had envisioned. In previous battles, they had usually dealt with enemies who couldn't revive while they could, so her men would heroically rise from the dead to combat again with stoic and valiant expressions on their faces. This was naturally the first time that they had fought against an enemy force that could resurrect just as easily as they did, which had created this specific outcome that was predictable for those who understood psychology. On the side, Eva and the other three beauties had watched Draco make short work of Devon with a smile, 
then saw him make two princesses swoon without even trying with a facepalm. Zane, though, was rubbing her chin as her eyes narrowed. She gazed at Jenna and Eliza with a strange glint in her eyes, licking her lips darkly. Eva, who was smiling wryly, heard Zane's thoughts and also had a strange glint in her eye. The two shared a look and nodded, waiting for the right time to strike. In the meantime, Jenna held the fainted Eliza gently as she turned to Draco. Noble hero, would you please end the battle before it gets worse? This is too much to see. Jenna begged solemnly. Draco half smiled and turned his back to her. Leave it to me, beautiful princess. Draco then disappeared from where he stood, leaving a blushing Jenna behind. He reappeared in the midst of all the fighting, then stomped his foot. A wave of purplish magic spread out from him, disabling all the humans who were fighting, sending them falling to the ground. Using gravity magic, Draco had incapacitated all the maddened humans while he was the only one left standing. The attention of the demons fell on him, and they roared as they rushed over to him to rip his flesh apart. They had already grown tired of dealing with these other humans. They had ripped them apart so much that there was nothing new to see in their innards. If these demons were to take an anatomy exam, they might even surpass some of the best doctors in the world. The prospect of getting to see how Draco looked like internally excited them so much that they were frothing at the mouth. Maybe he had three livers and ten pancreas, or fifteen hearts and six kidneys? The possibilities were endless. Draco did not wait for them to attack him first. He simply removed Dragorugio from his inventory, swinging the sword nimbly with his right hand. He then exploded in a sea of destruction energy that singed the very atmosphere itself, but did not harm anything. Seeing this, the demons and demon warriors realized that they had made a terrible mistake, but it was too late. The destruction energy swept forth and engulfed all of them, binding them in place for a split second. Draco then swung his sword upwards, and it seemed to strike the entirety of the enemy force before him, sending them flying up into the sky. His sword went up with them, spinning continually as it did so. Draco then bent down and blasted into the sky, a black streak following up. He went up and grabbed the hilt of the still-spinning Dragorugio. The moment he connected with the sword, the destruction energy they both contained exploded and covered the entire sky, almost burning it. The demons and demon warriors were spinning just as the sword had, wrapped in a thin coat of destruction energy that bound them, also harming them slightly. However, this pain was nothing compared to what they felt when Draco began the attack. Great ether! Draco moved his sword in powerfully swings, slashing the group of bound demons. Even though his sword did not strike them physically, it struck them through the veil of destruction energy wrapping them, even sometimes forming sword clones within to strike each individual demon. Draco struck and struck, moving through different sequences of slices and cuts as he moved faster and faster. He even threw in two kicks during the motion, before slashing at an inclined angle, then finishing with an uppercut clash. He then charged his power as he lifted the sword high above his head and stretched his body out. The demons trapped in the attack were on the verge of death, having been diced up by destruction energy, this potent. What was left of them simply spun over and over within the black fire, before Draco roared and swung the sword down, bringing himself and all the demons down, crashing to the ground. Boom! The places exploded in a black light that reached the sky, carefully bypassing all the humans and allies of Draco. When the effects subsided, Draco walked away from the spot with Dragorugio placed across his shoulder. Behind him, there was a crater filled with nothing. Everything that had existed in that spot was vanquished minus Draco. Seeing him come out unscathed, the wind blowing his now white hair which had returned together with his Ultima Sunt abilities, many felt their hearts beat. Eva and the other ladies gave a thumbs up, Zane directly putting her hands in her lower garments. The two princesses had a look of infatuation on their faces. All of this was fine, a normal response to a handsome hero vanquishing evil and bringing peace to the land. However, what made Draco shiver from head to toe were the guys who had hearts in their eyes as they gazed at him. Burly men, big enough to beat a bear like it was their son looking at you like that. How would you feel? He released them from their gravity bindings, 
but before they could move, Draco had scurried over to hide behind his wives, not even daring to come out. The four beauties covered him behind them protectively, trying to stifle giggles at the same time. The two princesses shared a look and also smiled. They found Draco cute, and their anxiety towards his existence diminished and was replaced by a strange fondness. The field had already been cleared by the destruction energy, clearing all the waste and horror. The men who were locked in the rictus of battle soon came down from the insanity-induced high, feeling tired and groggy. Many outright fainted, drained of energy to continue even thinking. They would likely be unable to fight for a very long time in the future. That was not accounting for any PTSD that might arise out of this event. Hikari saw this and hesitated before clapping her hands together. A whitish fire emerged in between her palms, which Hikari merged with copious amounts of creation energy. She then cast the fire out, which passed through everyone, purging a certain viscous darkness that was present in all of them, minus the Morningstar group and the two princesses. Heartfire. Active one. Heartfire. Expel all the negativity in a target's heart and body, bringing about perfect mental and physical stability. Cooldown. 20 hours. This was the only active skill of the purifier that Hikari integrated, and its use had been obscure until now. Thanks to Hikari's thoughtfulness, the various curses, negativity, and possible heart demons that anyone here would suffer were destroyed, burned to ash. Now, they were clean, or heart, mind, and soul, ready to fight again at the drop of a hat for justice and honor. The rebels rose to their feet and exalted the princesses and the Morningstar group, while the royal guards did the same. The two princesses walked over to Draco and his wives shyly, Eliza hiding behind Jenna like a young maiden. Jenna didn't know whether to laugh or cry, but could only wear a stoic face. Truth be told, she also wanted to hide behind someone. Jenna bowed before the group. Noble gods, demigods, thank you for your assistance in purging evil. As the crown princess of the Ordelia family, I would like tea, a host you in a celebration of your valiance and benevolence upon the mortal world. Draco and co. could only share wry looks. Such potent praise, jeez! Young miss, are you adept in the Tao of bootlicking? How can you make us feel like we are floating on cloud nine with just a few words? No problem. Please lead the way. Draco replied with a smile, guessing that this must be part of the floor's story. At this moment, while the two princesses were still bowing and the fighters were cheering and celebrating, the floor began deconstruction itself. Everything pixelated and disappeared as it started from the horizon to where the Morning Star group was standing. The warriors had been long gone, but just before the two princesses could be sucked away, Zane's eyes flowed with an evil light. Draco, capture the two of them! Draco was surprised by this request, but didn't waste any time. He knew Zane, the genius, would have her own reasons for doing so, so he captured the two of them with his telekinesis and sent them to his inner universe. Just then, the world completed crumbled apart, and the rewards panel was displayed. Congratulations on completing. Tower of Babylon, 10th floor. Time elapsed, 0 and 738. Objectives complete. All assessment. EX plus reward. 14,000 score points. One treasure selection reward. Peak bronze grade. At this time, the four beauties were whisked away into the inner universe automatically as they returned to the castle in which Draco resided. He was still in his seat where he made his executive decisions and decided to open the floor-specific rankings. First, Draco Morningstar, 14,000 points. Second, Gavin Guy, 1,498 points. Third, Dorothy Keel, 1,495 points. Fourth, James Luster, 1,092 points. Fifth, Mandingo, 1,324 points. Sixth, God's Son, 1,315 points. Seventh, Dark Lord, 1,300 points. Eighth, King's Return, 1,286 points. Ninth, Helia Neuer, 1,044 points. 10th, McKinser won 237 points. Well, it seemed like floor 10 had been a respite for everyone despite the difficulty. After all, now that all their abilities and equipment had been released, and they had automatically been sent to level 100, which was their full power, they had finally been able to go all out. It was actually quite disgraceful that they could not score more than 2,000 points. In fact, with each floor, their scores got worse and worse by comparison. Just look at how the total increased. 
How could you score 1,400-ish when the total was 14,000? That was barely 10% of the total score. How badly did you do that you scored so low? Well, the problem laid with Draco. Before he came, their scores had been regarded as the standard, as they had been the highest. In a school of idiots, the standard for what was smart was different from a school for geniuses. But now things would change, which was what everybody thought. The foundational floors seemed to have favored Draco due to its storyline, but other floors going forward had fewer generic storylines and featured issues that would take days, if not years, to solve. This was what the rest were hoping would stump Draco, so that he would be unable to climb and reach the top. After all, if he actually cleared floor 99, none of the others would get that free chance to explore floor 100. Everything would become Draco's spoils, as he was the only one who would be able to pass. There was no second place prize, only first place for the winner. The thing with getting time to browse the top floor for a period of time for the top three was basically a consolation prize. However, whether or not Draco would be stumped, especially since he had his four beauties with him, was yet to be seen. Hey, hey. Anyway, Draco checked the overall rankings. First, Gavin Guy. 71st floor, 102,000 points. Second, Dorothy Keel, 71st floor, 101,500 points. Third, James Luster, 71st floor, 100,000 points. Fourth, Mandingo, 70th floor, 96,000 points. Fifth, God's Son, 70th floor, 94,700 points. Sixth, Draco, 11th floor, 93,350 points. Seventh, Dark Lord, 69th floor, 92,300 points. Eighth, King's Return, 69th floor, 91,010 points. Ninth, Hilia Nuer, 69th floor, 90,200 points. 10th, McKinser, 69th floor, 88,230 points. After the 9th floor, he had reached 79,350 points and had occupied 17th place from the previous 44th. Now that he had cleared the 10th floor, he had broken into the top 10 like a wrecking ball. Hugo Mori, who had been the former 10th place, was coughing blood in his mansion as he fainted. God's son and Mandingo were currently squirming in their seats, trying to hold back the bomb that was poking at the tip of their butts, as they were inches from shitting themselves due to fear and despair. As for James Luster, he had spent the past few days staring into the sky, his eyes blank and his soul lifeless. He was a man broken and beaten, wondering about the meaning of life and what the Tao truly was. As for Draco, he grinned ruthlessly as he pictured their expressions, then realized not much time had passed still. As such, he decided to do some other stuff while in his inner universe, especially craft some more. Chapter 569, The Individual Tournament 3 The crowd cheered for the match that had just finished as Essence walked down the stage. Those from Mexico were especially exuberant, having witnessed the sheer supremacy of their representative. China was deathly silent at this time, their already pale faces turning even whiter. They gazed at the collapsed Ao Pochin with a mixture of emotions, but mostly pity. Usually, such a shameful performance would warrant their anger, but everyone had seen how things had gone. The fellow had not held back giving it 120%, but it had been futile in the face of an unbeatable power. However, now that most of the world had gotten a good look at his power, they were left speechless and worried. Some even began to cry out that it was unfair. After all, why how could one person have so much power, and why should he be allowed to compete? Wasn't it just be unfair to all other contestants? It was truly intriguing, the mind of a random person. When they saw that Slim Fatty and Co. were so close behind Essence in the individual tower, they had thought that his power had been great, but only so-so. With Mexico ending up second in the group tournament, this notion had been further reinforced. However, now that they had actually seen the gap in a PvP setting, they began to panic as they felt that no one could beat him. The complaints from the fans of various countries drowned out the defensive roars coming from Mexico, and the various contestants gazed at their own people with shame and disappointment. We are here to compete with our own powers and make a name for ourselves, not whine and cause trouble. We already saw the universal rankings before we got here, so why act like this is a surprise now? Even the non-members of Umbra among the contestants felt extremely uncomfortable. 
They knew that the Glory Gore Studios were famously quite hard-headed, but when so many people were complaining, could they really say no? Well, the answer to that was quite obvious. If the studio could metaphorically flip the middle finger to the World Council, they could certainly do so to the rest of the world. Amber simply snapped her fingers, and all the protesting contestants were forcefully silenced. They opened their mouths to chant or whatever, but no sound came out. It was actually quite a comical and chilling sight to look at. With a strange smile, Amber spoke coldly. This is a warning. Next time, I will directly ban anyone who partakes in such a show from entering this game for at least a year in real time. The players were chilled down to their bones, thinking of how horrible it would be to be unable to enter Boundless for what was the equivalent of four years of in-game time. See how much progress everyone had made in just about two years. Only a few countries didn't partake in the chant, like Ghana, Nigeria, Scotland, Ireland, etc. Mostly countries that knew winning was a pipe dream for them. They didn't care much about such things, rather looking forward to experiencing the show. It was the likes of central country, England, Canada, France, Italy, India, China, and Japan, who suffered the mute. After this brief interruption, the event resumed. Third match, Slim Fatty versus Joker. Slim Fatty climbed up from the left side of the stage, her expression calm and unperturbed as she held sword blade casually over her shoulder. Joker, though, was far less amused as he walked up the steps to face this woman who was unofficially the fourth strongest player in the entire game. When the toll for the match to begin sound, Slim Fatty wasted no time in swinging her blade forward, producing a powerful sword wave that cut towards Joker so fast that it created its own sound. Joker, though, smiled and removed a deck of cards from his inventory. He then shuffled them carefully, even as the sword wave rushed towards him before picking the first card from the top. The card had a blue background, showing a beam of light hitting a mirror and being sent back. The moment Joker showed this card, he tossed it out towards the sword wa, V. Immediately, a mirror-like substance was projected from the cards, which the sword wave struck and instantly reversed, heading towards Slim Fatty even faster than it had been cast out. Not overwhelmed by this reversal, Slim Fatty simply cut the sword wave with ease, dispersing the energy. She gazed at Joker without making a sound, seriously analyzing her foe. Despite being far stronger than him, she didn't take him lightly, as they both knew each other's strength and weaknesses. Joker had classed up into the epic Cardmaster class, which granted him unique abilities that were hard to deal with. Cardmaster, Epic Class, Rank 3. Skills, Omnipotent Passive, Random Draw Passive, Targeted Draw, Active, Instant Reshuffle Active, Draw 2 Active. Starting Stats, Star 10, Dex 10, N10, Int 10, Spar 10, Cha 15, Elk 40 XP Gain Rate, 130%. Rank Up Difficulty, 45%. Class weapons, none. Class skills, any card, luck. Omnipotent deck, passive skill effect. As a card master, you naturally possess access to the card god's omnipotent deck, though yours is only a replica. Still, this allows you to use any and all of the cards within the deck to their fullest abilities. Random draw, passive skill effect. Randomly summon a card from your deck. The quality of the card is dependent on your specific circumstances and the value of your luck over your opponent. The higher your luck over theirs, the more powerful the effect of your card. Targeted draw, active skill effect, decide on a specific card within the omnipotent deck to summon. Your chances of getting the card of your choice is set at 15%, but can fluctuate based on the value of your luck versus your opponent's. Cooldown, one minute. Instant reshuffle, active skill effect, instantly reshuffle all your cards, sending those that have already been used back into the pile, Every time you reshuffle your deck, you have a 30% to get a better sequence than before. Cooldown, 30 seconds. Draw 2. Active skill effect. Randomly draw two cards at once from your deck. Both cards can be activated and used at the same time, or one of the two can be swapped before activation. Cooldown, 5 minutes. Remembering these details about his class, Slim Fatty's expression became cold. Joker had already gone through her abilities after Amber had revealed the matchups. However, despite knowing what the girl could do, he could only smile bitterly. Slim Fatty had used her sword wave, which was granted to her as a passive skill. 
This meant that she had literally spent nothing to make that attack, neither stamina nor mana. On the flip side, Joker 2 had not spent anything making that previous reversal. He could draw the first card at the top of his deck each second, which functioned as his class auto attack. He had higher luck than Slim Fatty by far, which was why he got a card he needed. This was the only reason why Joker even dared to fight this female Tyrannosaurus instead of throwing in the towel instantly. He had low hopes for an actual victory over her, but as the guildmaster of the Myriad Cards Guild, he at least wanted to prove to the world that he was more than just Umbra's tamed lapdog. Her class negated all penalties from wielding any sword, which was why she could use the OP sword blade that was heavier than a literal mountain. No exaggerations there. As such, she didn't need strength, because Swordblade could handle that. She also didn't need endurance, since she did not suffer penalties for the weight, so the sword felt like a feather in her hands, meaning it was effortless to swing it. As such, she had put all her points into dexterity, so she could wave this heavy sword faster and faster, as well as more skillfully. It was a sensible plan. However, min-maxing had its flaws. It would certainly increase your strengths exponentially, but it also boosted your weaknesses by the same amount. Joker continued the battle by drawing another card from the top of his deck. When he turned it to face Slim Fatty, it showed the image of a castle's hallway, with a knight in plate armor patrolling the road. Immediately, he tossed the card downward, and an actual knight emerged from it. The summon raised his lance and charged over to Slim Fatty, intending to run her through. Slim Fatty simply scoffed and summoned her array of swords. They appeared behind her like a halo of a goddess, then shot out as they rushed towards the incoming knight and Joker himself. The ones aimed at the knight began firing our sword waves, to which the fellow brushed away by spinning his lance like a fan. As for Joker, he jumped back and drew another card from his deck, this time showing a defensive knight who stood at the forefront of his group, taking on endless arrows upon himself. When the card was thrown out, a knight jumped out of it wielding two huge tower shields. He placed himself before Joker and blocked the onslaught of Slim Fatty's swords calmly. Slim Fatty herself saw this chance and decided to use one of her skills to end the battle quickly. As such, he raised her sword, which began to burst and glow with a menacing light. Joker's eyes flashed as he had predicted what was coming next. Right away, he executed two skills in tandem. Instant reshuffle targeted draw. His deck immediately reshuffled itself, the cards he had already used and discarded coming back into play. This did not negate his already in-play cards like the two knights, but he could summon another version of them if he drew them. With his target draw, he was aiming for the reflection card. His plan had been to push Slim Fatty to use one of her overpowered legendary class skills in order to end the battle fast, then redirect her attack back. To draw the card the first time had not been part of his plans and was due to his luck. In that same vein, when Joker drew this card, his high luck also gave him the desired outcome. Luckily, he did. He drew the reflection card and tossed it out, forming a mirror before him. At this time, Slim Fatty had already gone through the motions of her skill, swinging the sword down in a way that cut through everything before her. Despite seeing Joker's retaliation, she showed no worry on her face and the crowd soon saw why. The sword wave that her world slash created was designed to bypass any defense, and this card could not stop that. Joker would have had a better chance drawing a card that gave him more health, as his mirror was cut in half, and so too was his body. The fellow's eyes widened as he gazed at the valiant woman before him, his body splitting into two halves as it felt to their side. Joker respawned in the Constance area where the others stood, his face slightly pale, and his expression one of accepted defeat as well as helplessness. He felt he could be praised for lasting so long against Slim Fatty, and many agreed as they renewed their opinion of Joker. He and Happy Scholar had fucked up and angered the evil duo, but after mending things, they had proven themselves to be no worse than gentle flower or noble soul, which was the truth. Third match winner, Slim Fatty. Slim Fatty exited the stage and made way for the next match. At this time, Amber released the voices of those muted so they could finally cheer they pleased. Humbled and ashamed by the way they had been treated, 
they remained decidedly silent for this one. Fourth match, Cold Summer vs. Silent Walker. Cold Summer climbed up the stage on the left side, wearing an aqua blue mage robe that had a cowl and a half mask. He was tall and lanky, with a similar build to Fitter Cleric, only that he wore strange blue goggles and covered his nose and mouth under the cowl. Author's note, if you don't remember, he's the one who looks like Shino Aburame from Naruto. Silent Walker was the opposite. Dressed in a stylish black suit, his extremely suave visage and slicked-back blonde hair gave him the kind of flair that made him a looker no matter where he went. The ladies of the various countries catcalled him, making the fellows speechless. Gender equality, my foot. Didn't you all say that we should stop doing this? This was another match that began without trash talk, as both parties hardly spoke even when their life was on the line. Cold Summer had previously been a hydromancer, but had recently classed up into an epic aquasire. This class was just below the legendary aqualord and the divine paragon of water. It was the natural water element class progression for the epic stage, which meant that Cold Summer wasn't the only one in the guild with it. Silent Walker was the legendary Lord of Shadows, and his control of darkness overshadowed Cold Summer's control of water. As a battle between two elemental controllers, this was quite interesting to see. Aquasire Epic Class Rank 3, Skills, Semi-Perfect Manipulation Passive, Aqua Supremacy Passive, Flood, Active, Marine Summon, Active, Torrent, Active. Starting Stats, Star 10, Dex 10, N10, Int 30, Spur 25, Cha 10, LK 10, XP Gain Rate, 110%, Rank Up Difficulty, 65%, Class Weapons, None, Class Skills, Any Water. Semi-Perfect, Passive Skill Effect, the user is able to freely manipulate all forms of water and water bodies with their mind. All offensive and defensive moves created through this skill are buffed by 15%. Aqua Supremacy, Passive Skill Effect. As an adept in the water element, you possess a 50% immunity to all attacks using the same element. All your water-related attacks are increased in potency by 25%. Flood, Active Skill Effect. Summon an overflow of water that submerges an area of 20 miles in water, drowning or hindering all those trapped within. Duration, 1 minute. Cooldown, 55 minutes. Marine Summon, Active Skill Effect. Instantly summon a random beast from the depths of the underwater world to fight for you. The power of the beats is capped to your rank and level, but its race and quality is random. Duration, 10 minutes. Cooldown, 1 hour. Torrent, Active Skill. Effect, summon a consistent and pervasive flow of water that possesses immense kinetic force. This can stun larger foes and submerged smaller ones, depending on the nature of the torrent used. Duration, 10 seconds. Cooldown, 30 minutes. The battle began with Silent Walker creating tendrils out of the ambient shadows in the arena, sending them lancing towards Cold Summer to seal him. Cold Summer simply clapped his hands and created water lances from the ambient moisture in the air sending them rushing towards Silent Walker directly. Still calm and unfettered, Silent Walker created a shield of darkness before him, which swallowed the water lances before disappearing. As for Cold Summer, he simply created a 360 degrees water barrier that prevented the darkness tendrils from touching him. The crowd was mesmerized by this elemental battle, watching with rapt attention. The two on the stage themselves paused for a bit to analyze the other and remember the details of their class. In the light of this lull, the tension seemed to pick up, but it was soon broken by the duo as they decided to test out each other's limits using an active skill. After all, each match only had a three-minute timer, and neither wanted to draw or be judged based on battle performance. Flood. Tendril Storm. Tendril Storm. Active Skill Effect. Summon an endless amount of shadow tendrils that rampage around an area of five miles around the user, dealing unpredictable amounts of damage to all enemies within and trapping them. Duration, three minutes. Cooldown, 20 hours. Immediately, a huge rush of water merged from Cold Summer's side, pouring in huge amounts onto the arena. The players at the side jumped out of range and watched with solemn expressions. As for Silent Walker's side, with the outpour of water, Hundreds of tendrils formed themselves and began thrashing about, looking for anything to latch onto and rip apart. When the water and darkness met, it created an amazing sight. The tendrils formed barriers that blocked the water and lashed it aside, 
while the pressure and continuous flow suppressed the tendrils and prevented them from acting. What broke this stalemate was cold Sumer, who raised his dot hand and clenched his fist. Riding the huge wall of water, it formed into three water dragon-shaped entities, albeit the Asian variant. They roared silently and rushed toward Silent Walker's position, bypassing the wall of tendrils. This was the power of the Aquasire class. Creating a flood or torrent wasn't supposed to kill, but to give the class user more ammunition to deal with their foe. After all, it wasn't like they would always be in the presence of water wherever they went, and the passive skill only allowed manipulation of water, not the creation of it. The crowd gasped, wondering how Silent Walker would deal with this. The gentleman only smiled slightly before waving his hand horizontally across his body. Dark Barrier! Dark Barrier, active skill effect. Create a power barrier made of darkness energy that negates 50% of incoming damage. Duration, 1.5 minutes. Cooldown, 8 minutes. Silent Walker didn't stop there, though. With a wide smile, he made use of one of the passives that he had acquired when he hit rank 3. Shadow Guard. Shadow Guard. Passive skill effect. Summon a squad of shadow warriors to form an elite guard to protect yourself. Depending on how much power you designate each one of them, you will be able to spawn between 1 to 10 at a time. Chapter 570. The Individual Tournament 4. From the feet of Silent Walker, a pervasive darkness spread over the entirety of the stage. It stretched itself out to around three meters around him, in which some forms clambered out like undead coming from the earth. The difference was that these forms were completely made out of darkness energy that was refined, allowing them to have semi-corporeal features. Three of them came out in a triangle formation around Silent Walker, and the crowd was able to see their stats. Name, Shadow Guard, Silent Walker, Major Rank Monster, Level 101, HP 3,455,000, 3,000, Many gasped with surprise, but those in the know remained unfazed. After all, the rankings worked differently for summons, and Silent Walker had many buffs that enhanced his darkness attributes. Not to mention, his skill worked better the fewer he summoned. Three was just enough to simultaneously defend, attack, and support, which was the perfect ratio. Immediately, five water dragons rushed toward Silent Walker, two of them tack on by Cold Summer, who was uncertain, in which his three shadow guards defended against one each, striking them with weapons made of darkness energy. This clash destroyed the water dragons, but two were left to hurtle toward Silent Walker. The man himself swiped a hand, releasing a huge scythe of darkness energy that cut both water dragons in half. The remaining halves crashed onto his dark barrier, dissipating without being able to do anything. The crowd was frenzied by this amazing battle, cheering loudly. The previous fights had been far too straightforward, with a clearly stronger party and an obvious weaker party. Here though, although both parties were not equal per se, their control was very refined. Cold Summer's face beneath his mask was solemn. He knew very well that Silent Walker was not going all out, giving him the chance to display his skills so that his countrymen would not be able to point fingers at him if he lost. Grateful to the Englishman for the consideration, Cold Summer did not hold back. He had already consumed about one-fifth of his mana with those previous maneuvers in controlling water, so it was time to do something big. Since the flood's duration was not up and the huge water body was still present, Cold Summer tapped into the full remainder of his mana reserves. The entire body of water that had been crashing against the barrier formed from dark tendrils rose up into the air slowly, as if being lifted by Superman. Cold Summer rose up along with Iz as he stepped on the back of a water dragon, both of his arms outstretched and moving like a pianist working on a resounding melody. When he reached a height that was above the stands, he paused. Then the huge body of water under his control immediately split up into portions, like a lake being divided into water droplets. However, the issue here was that, instead of droplets, what was formed were lances made of pressurized water. Hundreds of thousands of such lances were formed and floating in the sky, spinning on themselves due to the pressure. Struggling to hold onto them due to his depleted mana, Cold Summer simply swung his hands downward, unleashing the torrent upon the arena, which was far too small to bear all this. 
Silent Walker saw this and smiled slightly. Since the other fellow was going all out, he too would oblige. It was only fair to do so. As such, he activated two of his passives that he had disabled from the beginning to make this fight more even. Noctis, Passive Skill Effect The knight is no longer something you have to wait for, for you are the knight. Wherever you tread shall be treated as a knight darkness zone, no matter the time of day and weather, increasing darkness-related skills by 50%. Nightwalker, Passive Skill Effect The user is completely intangible during the night, possessing 150% damage immunity. They are immune to all darkness damage. Note, damage immunity is turned into damage susceptibility in the case of light or fire-based skills or spells. Since his current foe was a water user, he did not have to worry about his damage immunity being turned on its head. Also, Silent Walker knew that while these two passives synergized with each other, it didn't make him invincible. Damage immunity in the context of this passive meant that he would suffer the damage of an attack as the equation of 1nx Mzbor 10, where n was the total damage value and m was the percentage of damage immunity. Basically, 1% damage immunity equals 0.1% damage resistance. Apart from being fully immune to darkness energy, other elements would hurt him just fine, just a lot less. When paired with his Noctis passive that boosted all darkness-related skills by 50%, this further increased the 150% value by 75%. However, it did not end there. Silent Walker went all out and used one of his special active skills he rarely touched due to how precious and powerful it was. Endless Night. Endless Night, active skill effect, cover an area zone in a veil of darkness, buffing all darkness skills and techniques by 400%, duration 15 minutes, cooldown 16 hours. The sky darkened immediately, almost all light being cut off. It looked like a thunderstorm was about to fall, but rather it was just a mass of swirling black clouds. Many looked up in shock, not understanding what was going on, but the core members of Umbra became grim it seemed the fellow was really going all out. Very well, let us see what you've got then. Silent Walker's shadow tendrils that were thrashing about grew almost five times their current size, becoming more powerful and vibrant thanks to the boosts. His shadow guards also became far stronger, unable to go past his level or rank, but their HP and stats grew exponentially. The tendrils reacted and began thwacking many of the water lances away, though some ripped through them before being stopped by other tendrils. The fight was brutal, with both sides losing out in this regard. The water lances were just too numerous, like droplets of rain in a storm. Soon, the shadow tendrils were piercing into nothing, even after being buffed, and only 40% of the attack had elapsed. At this time, the shadow guards rushed into the air, swinging their weapons as they deflected and destroyed many of the attacks. One might think their actions were futile, but interestingly, the entire arena, apart from a small area where Silent Walker stood, was raised into dust by the high-pressure lances. The HP of the Shadow Guards kept dropping as they fought back against this onslaught crazily, forsaking their own defense to make sure Silent Walker remained unharmed. By the time all three of them were destroyed, only 10% of the reign of lances was left. However, this amount was enough to turn Silent Walker into mincemeat with ease. The fellow, though, simply smiled and raised a hand. A huge amount of energy gathered at the center of his palm, which he stretched out, facing cold summer in the air. Silent Walker channeled the entirety of his mana into his hand, which turned out to be almost twice that of cold summer. It couldn't be helped. This was the disparity between a legendary class and an epic class not to mention as a core member's strength. Silent Walker was also decked in items that were of a higher quality than what Cold Summer got for himself. When the entirety of his mana was invested in his next attack, Silent Walker spoke softly towards Cold Summer. You fought well. Unfortunately, the crowd did not get to enjoy his amazing manly voice for much longer as their minds were blown by what occurred next. From Silent Walker's palm, a huge ray of dark light was blasted out. It was so huge and pervasive that it felt as if they had watched an orbital cannon fire from close range. The size of that ray was enough to cover a whole small village, so one could just imagine its scale when viewed from a close angle like this. Cold Summer, his water dragon, 
and his remaining water lances were all consumed by the darkness, assimilated into it, and destroyed by it. There was simply nothing left. Fourth match winner, Silent Walker, Cold Summer Rispa, wuned to the side with the other core members and remained silent. His body language showed that he was calm as always, and his mind was currently focused on comprehending his flaws in battle so he could improve. The English cheered on Silent Walker for his win, Lucia in the crowd blushing heavily as she swooned at the charming nature of her man. She was practically bursting at the seams with pride, wishing she had a microphone to declare to the world that Christian was hers. Canada also clapped encouragingly for Cold Summer, who had fought valiantly. His final attack was especially burned into their minds, though the counterattack was obviously burned in everyone's souls. Then, Amber called for the next match to begin. Fifth match, Warm Spring vs. Dreary Traveler. On the left side of the stage, the cute and lovable Warm Spring climbed onto the stage solemnly, her face locked in a serious grimace. On the other side, the creepy Dreary Traveler climbed up with a slight smirk on his lips, chuckling menacingly. KK, little thing, you actually dared to come on stage against me? Your bravery is truly commendable. Dreary Traveler stated with a smile. Warm Spring harumphed and folded her arms. Why wouldn't I come? I'm not scared of you. Dreary Traveler nodded in agreement, his smile fading away. With good reason, beating you will be tough, but I will give it a try. Warm Spring also got serious and placed her hands together. I will defeat you and prove myself to Big Sis. Immediately, Warm Spring used her only offensive ability. Mercy, mercy, active skill effect, cleanse an enemy of their evil, edifying their soul and turning them into a devout follower. Each follower increases all stats by 0.1%. Note 1, can only be used on sentient beings. Note 2, can only be used on NPCs. Note 3, only a maximum of 90 followers at rank 3. Cooldown, none. Immediately, 90 men and women of various colorations and backgrounds appeared in the arena. Each of them wore a white robe that was kept firm by a single belt at the waist. Each of them had devout looks in their eyes as they gazed at Warm Spring, and they radiated a good amount of power. These were NPCs of rank 2 to 4, various criminals and near-do-wells that Warm Spring had purified during quests, exploration, and from Vita City State. They formed her offensive powers since her class was not allowed to attack directly, so each and every one had been carefully chosen, and they were all special due to their skills, power, and abilities. Without them, fighting in this tournament would be pointless, and she would likely have to forfeit if she came on stage, as she would be wasting everyone's time in that case. The reason why she could not learn any offensive skill was due to one of her legendary class passives. Damage Immunity Passive skill effect, the user is immune to all forms of damage beneath the divine rank. There was no confusion here. The words literally meant what they did. Unless your attacks contained either divine energy, the one attacking possessed a divine source origin, or you had a divine combat rank, it would deal zero damage to Warm Spring in all cases. Interestingly, Dreary Traveler was cleverly picked as someone to face her off, for he was in a similar situation. While he could still be damaged through various means, he could not be killed and sent to respawn due to his own passive. Undeath, passive skill effect. The user is resistant to all forms of damage by 90%, except for light or fire-based skills or spells, which deal 170% damage. The user is also unable to be sent to respawn and will only be put into a short period of recuperation upon defeat. Putting aside his crazy damage resistance that made it hard to shave away his HP, this passive made it so that he could never lose a level when dying nor drop his equipment, only enter a sealed hibernation for a while. Interestingly, this created a sort of bizarre situation between the two. It was clear that neither could really attack or kill the other, so the winner would be decided solely T, through their minions' fight. It was unknown whether their matchup had been entirely the result of RNG or whether the AI might have had any influence in that. However, most agreed that this was going to be a very interesting matchup, although it would surely last the entire three-minute duration. Dreary Traveler licked his lips and used his Netherrealm skill. Netherrealm, active skill effect, permanently create a special subspace full of death energy to store owned undead when not in combat. 
armies can be deposited in and withdrawn at will. Note, only up to 150,000 undead can be held within at rank 3. Cooldown, none. A large black portal formed before Dreary Traveler, showing a desolate world with blighted land. From the horizon of this portal, one could see hundreds of silhouettes rushing over, the sound of the approach almost deafening the arena. Warm Spring's expression became solemn as she flapped her angelic wings and took to the sky, leaving her followers down below. For that matter, they only displayed scorn on their faces towards the oncoming undead, then began using their own powers to strike preemptively. Huge fireballs, sword waves, wind blades, lightning strikes, and searing light beams were fired into the portals, all but rendering the first row of undead into ash. This made Warm Spring smile, while Dreary Traveler frowned. He realized that majority of her followers used elements that were super effective against his undead, like light, fire, and lightning. He doubted that the last could predict that they would face off against each other in such a manner, as he knew she had chosen her followers for general purposes. Alas, Dreary Traveler could only click his tongue at his bad luck. It seemed he could only win this battle by swarming his foe with overwhelming numbers. After all, he had dutifully raised and collected of 150k undead, of which 100k were fodder undead, 30k were normal undead, 19k being semi-sentient undead, and the remaining 1k being elite undead. Against her mere 90 followers, the number disparity was enough to make more than a difference. Dreary Traveler licked his lips while laughing eerily, excited to win such an easy match. He didn't have to worry about any dead killed, as they would be revived by the AI after the battle. The Lich would never dare to sacrifice his painstakingly collected army so easily otherwise. Warm Spring seemed to have realized this as her complexion became pale, but her followers were unrelenting in their attack. They burned all their stamina and mana beating back these foes, which heartened Warm Spring. She then used her passive skill Recovery Aura to boost her followers. Recovery Aura, Passive Skill Effect The user emits an aura of wellness and convalesce, giving all allies within the range of 10 kilometers plus 5% HP, mana, stamina, focus, and concentration recovery while unlocking their ability to regenerate HP during battle. With their ability to regen HP during battle unlocked, the 90 became fearless as they traded blows with the fodder undead. Most undead of this category were so weak that they dealt little damage, only that their numbers were so numerous that had the space of the stage not been limited, it would be impossible to fight back easily. Warm Spring also used some skills that replenished the mana and stamina of her allies directly, recovering them over time. Without this, her followers would easily run out of fumes since potions were not allowed in the competition. Seeing the turnabout by Warm Spring's followers, Dreary Traveler was slightly irked. With her numerous healing and recovery spells, it would be exceedingly hard to kill any of those 90 the easy way. Well then, it's time to show one of my hands. KK. With that evil thought, Dreary Traveler also activated one of his passives that was an aura boost. Lich's Aura, Passive Skill Effect. The user gains the ability to fortify and empower undead minions. All minions within the range of the Lich will benefit from a 70% increase to their HP, stamina, and mana, as well as a 150% increase in damage, defense, and resistances. However, they now take three times damage from fire, light, or lightning-based attacks. He had hesitated to use this earlier because of the countering nature of Warm Spring's minions, but as long as they could take down any one of them, it would be enough. After all, they were already one-shotting the cannon fodder undead. To have that damage increase to X3 on them made no difference. Rather, giving them better stats and higher damage meant that their previously weak strikes were not able to tear off chunks of flesh, slowly but surely. Even though Warm Spring was continually using small-scale and simple healing spells to recover them, these were NPCs, not players. It would eventually take a toll on them to fight so many foes at once. However, an undead army suffered no such weakness due to psychological issues. They were indefatigable and tireless, ready to take on anyone and anything as long as they could move. However, Dreary Traveler's smile faded as he took stock of what was going on, his face becoming uglier and uglier by the second, 
while Warm Spring's face became shyer and shyer as well. Even the crowd was looking on with speechless and shocked expressions. The core members who stood by the side of the arena were watching with strange expressions, occasionally glancing at Warm Spring furtively, which made the lass even more embarrassed. Chapter 571 The Individual Tournament 5 The expressions of everyone could not be any weirder as they tried to comprehend and digest what they were seeing. The undead who were rushing out of the portal also slowed down as their bones rattled in dismay. On the pitch, the ninety followers of Warm Spring were beaten, battered, and exhausted. It showed on their faces and on their bodies, as most of their pristine white robes were covered in blood or tar. However, the humans themselves gave the crowd shock. Despite all their suffering, being cut, gnawed on, bashed, and punched, they were laughing. That's right, they were actually laughing. Their eyes had widened to the limit, their pupils focused yet narrowed. Their lips were pulled apart as wide as possible, showing their pristine white teeth that were coasted with blood, whether theirs or not was unknown. With such a visage, they screeched with laughter, laughter so high-pitched that it sounded like something one would hear from a banshee. All this while, they never stopped fighting back, so they wore this crazed expression while laughing, in the midst of fighting. Naturally, this scene sent chill down the backs of the onlookers. One word came to their mind as they looked on. Fanatics. Overzealous people who believed in a concept or symbol so strongly that their rational mind was overridden by their attachment. Clearly, this lot felt the same way about Warm Spring, so they were fighting for her honor while showing their true nature. No matter how badly they got beaten, they fought back valiantly. The crowd also realized that despite the high number of enemies rushing at the zealots, they could one-hit one hit KO, everything. This kind of strategy was meant to work if they were fatigued, both mentally and physically, if not one or the other. However, Warm Spring's spell and skills were able to alleviate physical exhaustion, while the craziness of her followers definitely negated mental fatigue. From their actions and looks, they could do this for days, if so needed. Unfortunately, each match only lasted for up to three minutes, and two minutes had already passed. Realizing this, Dreary Traveler became serious. He waved his hand and recalled his undead to directly summon his 300 strongest undead warriors. An assortment of Death Knights, Dread Knights, Skeleton Kings, and White Lords appeared on the field. Without wasting time seizing up their foes, they rushed into battle, aiming to cut the living down. Unlike before, the Zealots could no longer finish them with one hit, despite Dreary Traveler's Lich Aura passive, making them suffer X3 damage from fire, lightning, or light element attacks. The zealots were humans at the end of the day, ones wearing ceremonial worshipping robes instead of pieces of armor. Upon suffering the attacks of these undead powerhouses that were further boosted by Dreary Traveler's passive, they began losing health rapidly. In the short span of 10 seconds, 20 zealots had died under their assault although 125 of the strongest undead had also been killed by them. Still, suffering a loss for the first time made Warm Spring panic, and she used a small-scale resurrection spell she had acquired that only worked on those in a situation similar to combat pets, mounts, or the zealots. This made Dreary Traveler become even more serious as he summoned another 300 of his elite undead to add to those still alive. They then began to pressure the remaining zealots even with Warm Spring continually infusing them with life. She had long realized that victory was impossible, so the next best thing was to await a timeout. She could then leave everything to the AI assessment on who fought better, where she had a 50-50 chance to come out on top. Seeing her plan, the fellow decided to end everything. He began to glow in an icy blue light as he activated his latest passive skill that gave him extra leeway in combat. Body of Ice, Passive Skill Effect The user has gained the true body of a lich, able to muster both the death element and the ice element, to which the ultimate Lord of the Undead is known for. You can now learn ice-based skills and techniques, as well as possess a 70% resistance to ice element attacks. Immediately, Dreary Traveler used the large-scale ice spell, Blizzard. A cold wind blew on the stage that grew in intensity per second. Eventually, 
the wind became so cold that shards of ice formed on the bodies of all those within, with the exception of Dreary Traveler, who was highly immune to the ice element, Warm Spring, who was immune to everything that wasn't divine, and the undead, who were free from friendly fire. As for Warm Spring's zealots, they were not so lucky. Most of them were slowly shattering, the frostbite turning their extremities into ice mush. Even as their teeth chattered and their bodies fell apart, they never stopped laughing in that eerie way. Some were even frozen into ice sculptures with that exact expression on their faces. Extremely unsettling. Warm Spring could only watch this happen with a pale face, her lips trembling. In the end, she could only sigh and admit defeat, because there was no way for her to continue the fight at this point. Trying to stall for the assessment would be a waste since she lost all her fighting force to Dreary Traveler. Who in the crowd would crown her the winner? Not to mention the AI would never do something so stupid. She left the stage, downcast and shoulders slumped, while Dreary Traveler basked in the cheers and praise from his fellow South Americans. Fifth match winner, Dreary Traveler wins. Sublime came over to pat Warm Spring on the head, reassuring the lass who was all but ready to burst into tears. As for Dreary Traveler, when he finally came down, the other core members punished him for making Warm Spring this upset by stabbing him in the heart or trying to end him with subtle spells. Dreary Traveler only laughed at their antics, since they ended in futility as always. Thanks to his undeath passive skill, he was unkillable in a certain sense. The rest of the core members could only tsk in defeat. Sixth match. Alpha Male vs. Great Caster. Uno walked up the left side of the stage with a confident gait, the fans of Mexico giving him all the flow he needed. He looked to see a short lowly climbing up the other side of the stage with an impassive expression, her actions also being celebrated by the Japanese in the crowd. The two inspected each other then smiled. Uno was a vanguard, with crazy defensive abilities and some passable offense, while Hera was an arcanist, a powerful legendary magic class that used hand signals and actual chanting to use spells, but had access to a lot more as a consequence. Arcanist, Legendary Class Skills, Mistress Weave, Rank 3, Passive, Arcane Energy, Passive, City of Light, Active, Speed Chant, Active, Anti-Magic Seal, Active, Arcane Barrier, Active, Blessing of the Arcanists, Passive, Arcane Knowledge, Passive. Starting Stats, Star 10, Dex 10, N10, Int 90, Spar 20, Cha, Tag 10, XP Gain Rate 70%, Rank Up Difficulty 40%, Class Weapons, Staff, Wand, Tome, Class skills any AoE magic. Mistress Weave rank 3. Passive skill effect. The user is able to access the network of spells contained within the magical weave belonging to the goddess of magic, Mistra. At rank 3, you can access all spells up to level 5 of the 9 levels within the weave. Arcane energy. Passive skill effect. Due to the unique nature of your magic and your class, mana has been converted into arcane energy. The rate of regeneration and method of acquisition is the same as with mana, but arcane energy can only be used to power arcane spells. City of Light, active skill effect, teleport from wherever you are right into the reception square of the City of Light, the legendary floating city for arcanists. Your quality of treatment and access to knowledge and materials depends on your rank. Cooldown, 20 hours. Speed Chant, active skill effect. Using a special technique known to arcanists, you are able to increase the speed of your chanting and hand signals when in combat. This ray reduces the amount of preparation need for all spells by 30%. Duration, 10 minutes. Cooldown, 30 minutes. Anti-magic seal, active skill effect. Using arcane energy, block all flow of mana within an area of 200 meters around the caster, preventing traditional mage classes from regenerating mana or using any spells for that duration. Duration 10 seconds. Cooldown 5 minutes. Arcane Barrier. Active skill effect. Using the purest arcane energy, form a golden barrier around your body that blocks all magical damage from traditional mages. 60% of magic damage frown non-traditional magic classes and 50% physical damage from all sources. Duration 1.5 minutes. Cooldown 8 minutes. Blessing of the Arcanist's Passive Skill. Effect. As one of the few Arcanists in the world, you are privy to the legacy of the entire group. Arcanists of history reside within you, helping, blessing, and strengthening you at all times, so that you may carry the banner forth into infinitum. 
your arcane energy reserves are increased by 50%, and your arcane energy regeneration increased by 200%. Arcane Knowledge – Passive Skill Effect Possessing the knowledge of a full-fledged arcanist, you are well-versed in all the special skills and techniques that your group had developed over the millennia. Your spellcasting speed is increased by 30%, and the power of your spells by 50%. Her class was not to be trifled with. An arcanist was a higher form of magic caster, above the traditional mage classes, which allowed Hera to restrict them in many ways. Her class also emphasized large-scale magic spell, or AoEs. She definitely had some single-target spells, by those were all within Mistra's weave and required time to chant. Only AoE spells she had learned through spellbooks were the usual instant cast, and since they were powered by arcane energy instead of mana, they were almost 50% stronger. Still, when contrasted with Uno who was almost a god of defense, one had to wonder if the AI really randomized these matchups. Uno perfectly countered someone like Hera who had high offense and cast AoEs. If Hera had gone up against either Warm Spring or Dreary Traveler in the previous match, she would have obliterated them even if they had collaborated as they relied on followers or summons to win. When the match was called to begin, Hera immediately began by activating her arcane barrier. She was a typical glass cannon. Every single one of her stats had been invested into int, which made her damage crazy, but her survivability not so much. She naturally followed up with speed chant, which reduced her chanting time by 30%. When added to the arcane knowledge passive, it meant she had a 60% reduction in casting time overall. Immediately, Hera accessed the level 2 weave, and chose the spell Invisibility. She began chanting and making a few hand signals, a golden light wrapping around her as her arcane energy was infused into her words and movements. Uno wasn't going to sit there and let her do as she pleased. Tremor. Tremor. Active skill effect. Stomp on the earth with all your might, unbalancing all enemies within a three-mile radius and knocking up light enemies. Cooldown. 22 hours. He stomped on the ground and caused a minor fissure across the entire arena, which disturbed Hera's arcane barrier and sent her flying into the air. This inevitably disrupted her casting, making the impassive lowly furrow her brow slightly. She immediately selected a rank zero cantrip within the weave, smokescreen. This took only a split second to cast with her current rank and buffs, so the area around her was enveloped in a small vein of smoke that prevented Uno from seeing her. Immediately, she followed up by selecting a level 1 spell that every arcanist used in a hot situation, Magic Missile. It took only one second to cast at her current power, sending the attributeless bolt of arcane energy hurtling towards Uno. The vanguard harumphed and stomped with his right foot and placed his legendary shield Reinhold before him, pulling his hand back and swinging it across his body. Basically, Uno performed the motions of a deflection, and this knocked the magic missile hurtling towards Shim away into the crowd. The spell dissipated before it could reach anyone, though, not to mention the arena was covered by a barrier. This feat made the crowd erupt in shock and excitement, while the faces of the crew members became solemn. Hera was a professional Fiverr player who had been in the world of games like this playing a mage class longer than all the five generals combined with both of them having a legendary class to even the playing field, it began to show how the two were different in terms of skills, planning, and technique. However, even though they both countered each other for in-game and meta reasons, Uno had something that Hera didn't, and that was experience. He had fought in life and death battles since he brawled in that alleyway, always looking for a good challenge. As such, he could match up to Hera, who only had experience in digital fighting. Hera herself frowned slightly, but chose another spell in the weave. This time, she went for the level 2 Conjure Animal Familiar. This would require 3 seconds of casting at her current buffs, so she made use of the downtime. Uno might not be able to see her directly, but he could sense her, just like how he was able to deflect her magic missile. As such, he knew that she was casting again, and he knew better than to allow her to complete her task. Uno began by using the active skill of his shield, Shield Toss. Active 1, Shield Toss, throw the item like a boomerang, dealing 200% blunt damage and stunning the target for 10 seconds. 
the shield will return to the arm of the user. Cool down. Four minutes. Uno tossed his shield out with one arm, the large slab of refined metal spinning in the air like a boomerang as it hurtled towards Hera. Since skills had a lock on, Uno didn't need to see her to use it, since she was his target, and they were in combat. Hera, within the smoke, felt a sense of danger upon her, and decided to cancel her spellcasting and used her active skill, City of Light, to disappear from where she was. The shield then passed by where she stood in a blur, then circled around and returned to Uno's arm. Hera reappeared on the stage with a grimace, and decided to stop bothering with spells from the weave, since they required time, and Uno was too knowledgeable of her abilities due to being members of the same guild. As such, she began using AoE spells she had accumulated for instances where she needed immediate firepower. Explosive Wave Explosive Wave, Active Skill Effect Channel intense fire energy into a point, allowing it to explode powerfully over the distance of 10 kilometers, dealing 110% fire damage to all enemies within range. Cooldown, 20 minutes. This was a rare spell she had acquired from the guild shop. Acquiring epic and above skill spells outside of epic legendary classes and ranking up was very tough and expensive. As such, her AoE was not the usual area zone-wide one that most core members of Umbra used, nor did they have extravagant damage percentages of 400% and above. Still, while humble, it was able to get the job done, given her high magic damage. Hera waved her hands, a cloud of fire gathering and compressing itself in the area in between herself and Uno. If he wanted to minimize the damage, he would have to remain where he was and cover himself, which would give Hera enough time to chant a spell or two. Due to its instantaneous nature, Uno had a very short period of time to consider how to respond compared to before. His mind whirred as he decided to go all out and take out this powerful caster, lest she began to spit out spells that would increase her maneuverability and tempo. Uno gritted his teeth as he relied on two of his passives for his next gamble, one from his class and the other from his shield. Immovable Wall Passive Skill Effect All stuns, knockbacks, and knockups are ineffective on the user. The user's base defense is magnified by 60% and their universal resistances are set to 90%. Passive 2, Engulf. All attacks that land on this shield have 10% of their damage absorbed. This damage can then be distributed as health, stamina for the user, or durability points for the shield. He had already spent the 10% he acquired from deflecting the earlier magic missile in increasing his health. This gave him a bit of extra HP that was placed atop his already present bar, offering Uno even more courage. He then activated his only offensive active skill so far, Shield Charge. Shield Charge, active skill effect. Rush into the enemy with your shield braced, clearing a bloody path for your allies to follow as the vanguard. This knockbacks all enemies within the charge distance. Cooldown, 22 hours. Like a bull, Uno rushed through the arena, colliding with the now-forming spell that was extremely volatile. To the shock of everyone, including Hera, he ended up trapped in the middle of an explosion, even worse than the one the spell would have created, since it would have been more stable then. Hera had to back away as the flames reached her, searing her skin, even through her arcane barrier, which was also about to dissipate since more than a minute had passed since the start of their battle. What left everyone so shocked and horrified was that from the still-spreading fire that was slowly weakening, a searing hot Uno ran out, his eyes bloodshot and his armor red-hot, as if he had been placed in a furnace. When he reached where Hera stood, she had to cover her face because of the heat coming off Uno, which felt like standing near a bonfire. The vanguard then raised his red-hot bell hammer and struck down. Chapter 572 the individual tournament, 6. Uno's hammer came down like a meteor upon Hera, who was completely defenseless at this time. She was smashed into the depths of the arena by it, her body bloodied and turned into mush, then cauterized by the heat. Uno panted heavily and raised his hammer, his body shaking with strain from the damage he had suffered. His HP was down to less than 10%, which should have ended him. In fact, Uno should have not walked out of that explosion with a whole body, especially with his armor searing hot like this. His saving grace became one of his passives 
that triggered when his health had fallen under a certain amount. Last stand, passive skill effect. If you are the only tank within an area of 100 meters and have less than 30% HP remaining, all your stats are increased by 20% and your skills have no cooldowns. This boost had granted him a way out of that otherwise fatal situation. Uno gazed at the charred corpse of Hera with a solemn expression. The cheering crowd rendered silent as many were traumatized by the raw sight. Even though Hera was impassive and expressionless, she was still extremely pretty, and her short stature had made her exude an air of cuteness. To reconcile that lovely lass with that blackened meat paste was horrible. The core members were also silent, not passing judgment on what had occurred. Dreary Traveler was the only one who clenched his fists while looking at his woman. If he had a skill called Death Stare, he might be tempted to use it. However, ultimately, he sighed and relaxed, choosing not to blame Uno for just participating in this battle. Sixth match winner, Alpha Male. Uno and Hera were beamed to the side, fully restored. The Vanguard no longer looked like a molten warrior, and Hera was also back to being hale and hearty. Her face was still impassive, as if the horror she just suffered did not exist. Her lover patted her head without saying anything else. In truth, it had all happened in an instant, so she had felt nothing. Of course, if someone were to show her the video or image, she might not feel as good. Uno simply nodded to her, and she nodded back. No hard feelings. Seventh match, Lowly King vs. Thunder Power this match was once again an interesting matchup because the previously obscure Thunder Power had risen to worldwide fame as a member of Mexico's team. He had shown off his skills, wit, and craftiness during the individual battle tower and the group battle tower. They were wondering what kind of performance he would show in this battle. As for his opponent, the crowd did not know how to even consider him. Hey bro, what's up with that name? Lowly King? Don't you mean Prison King? What a pervert. Many women in the crowd snorted with disdain when they saw such a name, booing the fellow as he came on stage. As for the fellows in the crowd, most were frowning, but some were gazing him with worship for being brave. Lowly King wore a set of bandolier-like armor with two straps crossing over his chest to make an X. He also wore a battle skirt that was worn by the Scots in war, giving him a strange look overall. He was a young man, but with a thick and burly body. This was less due to his natural build, but due to his class. Beastmaster, Epic Class, Rank 3, Skills, Nature's Aura, Passive, Enhanced Body, Passive, Beast Transformation, Active, Beast Summoning, Active, Beast Fusion, Active. Starting Stats, Star 30, Dex 15, N 20, Int 10, Spar 10, LT Gain Rate, 90%. Rank Up Difficulty, 55%, Class Weapons, None. Class Skills, Any Druid, Nature, or Taming. Nature's Aura, Passive Skill Effect The Beastmaster is one with nature, having grown from a humble druid who sought to heal to a warrior who allied with the wild to bring justice to the world. You are no longer able to attract aggro from monsters classified as beasts, and many approach you for taming. Enhanced Body, Passive Skill Effect As a trained warrior, you have honed your body to its limits in order to survive the transformation from man to beast. Your strength, dexterity, and endurance are increased by 30% permanently. Beast Transformation, Active Skill Effect, transform from a human into a chosen beast form. Depending on the beast, your stats will magnify to represent the beast's strength at your level and rank. Duration, 10 minutes. Cooldown, 30 minutes. Beast Summoning, Active Skill Effect, instantly summon a tamed beast from the wild to support you in battle. The beast's stats will be capped at your level and rank for the duration of its summon. Duration, 30 minutes. Cooldown, 50 minutes. Beast Fusion, Active Skill Effect. Under the effect of Beast Transformation, if you have a summoned beast within range, the two of you may fuse to acquire the sum of your total stats and strength for a short period. Once this skill elapses, your beast will be forcibly sent back and your transformation will be undone. Duration, 1 minute, cooldown, 1 day. Thunder Power came up the stage calmly and stately from the right side. He wore a set of leather armor that was, was mixed with some cloth, especially his full-body trench coat. With his bow and arrows placed behind his back, Thunder looked extremely cool. Ilvarios was surprised when he heard many of the ladies in the crowd cheer for him. 
He did not really see himself as attractive, as most of the people from Supernatural were good-looking, so he had never before been given special attention. However, to the normal folk, he was simply too suave. As a wood elf, how could he not be attractive? He even tied his shoulder-length black hair into a ponytail, which further added to his wild aura. Once again, one had to wonder about the AI's intentions. This fight was between two men of the forest, a beastmaster and wood elf archer. Putting aside the dynamics of how archers and beastmasters fought, just this fact alone made many core members rub their chins with interest. When Amber called for the fight to begin, the two men did not waste any time. Since the match would last only three minutes, Loli King instantly used his class's bread-and-butter skills, beast transformation, and beast summoning. Immediately, he roared and went on all fours, slamming the ground with his right hand. His body elongated and grew more muscular, fur bursting from his pale skin and covering his entire body as stripes too emerged. Eventually, the king symbol appeared on his forehead, signifying the end of his transformation. Loli King had become a Tiger King. Name, Loli King, rank 3 Beastmaster, level 100 HP, 2,998,000, 2,998,000. His stats had grown to encapsulate what a rank 3 Tiger King would have at that level. His HP had increased by over a hundredfold, and his physical stats had increased by 400%. However, this wasn't all. With a roar of majesty that made many hearts palpitate, a form appeared beside Loli King from a portal that showed the background of a jungle. It was another Tiger King with the exact same look. Name, Tiger King. Major rank monster, level 100 HP, 2,998,000. 2,998,000. This was enough to unsettle most onlookers. Two identical tigers with the same strength. Just who could stand up to them? Tunder's eyes narrowed slightly. By choosing another Tiger King, it was obvious to anyone in the know that this fellow was planning to fuse later, and since they were both the same species, the fusion's results should be extremely good. However, the fusion had a maximum duration of one minute, so it would obviously be only used as a trump card, leading Tunder to make a simple plan. He would force the fellow into dire straits and make him use that ability, power through the duration, and defeat him when he was sapped of all power. Clean and efficient. To begin, he first used his lock-on skill in Lowly King while he could still tell who was who. Lock-on, active skill effect. Place a marker on an enemy that allows you to track them, regardless of distance, location, or defenses. This cannot be blocked or dispelled. Cooldown, 20 hours. Immediately, Lowly King felt immensely uncomfortable, as if the Lightbur, own eyes of Tunder, that were specked with smidgens of gold, could see him no matter where he went. This feeling of someone challenging his authority enraged him, as his beast form made him far more primal, so he roared and charged at the ranger. The summoned Tiger King also followed behind him, racing towards Tunder's left, while Lowly King came in from the right. From their tacit cooperation, it was clear that he and this tiger had spent many fights working together and had built up a subconscious understanding of what to do. Tunder smiled and knocked three arrows right away. As the first ranker in the supernatural trainee competition back then, Riveting Knight had promised the winner a free personally crafted weapon from Draco. As Draco had come back for a long while, and even made items for his wives, as well as some extras for Slim Fatty, he naturally made the bow and a set of thirty arrows for Tunder, per his specification. Previously, he had been using Gandiva, but that epic bow had been given to Shani after he acquired his current legendary bow, Reaper. Reaper. Bow rank. Legendary. Durability. One thousand thousand. And. Effects. Passive. One. Multi-shot. Arrows numbering between 2 to 5 can be fired at once, all of them mimicking the target of the main arrow, without the need for the dexterity check of the user. Passive 2. Critical. No matter which part of the body an arrow from this bow strikes, it will be treated as a critical hit. Active 1. Arrow Storm. Fire every arrow in your quiver at once, with their effects boosted by 1000%. All enemies within a range of 10 kilometers will be struck by their effects cumulatively and simultaneously. Note, this skill can only be used if your quicker is full. It was tailor-made for Tunder. He was someone who could manipulate the speed of his arrows and fire more than one a second. 
the first passive allowed him to shoot more than two arrows at once without having to manually adjust his aim, saving him energy. The second passive allowed him to maximize his use of multiple arrows. Tunder preferred striking different body parts in one volley rather than aiming for a specific place. Legs and torso were easier to hit, so there was no need to aim for the head or arms in that case since the damage was all the same. His quiver supported up to 30 arrows, and all of them were above the rare rank. Ten were epic arrows, with five legendary ones, and the rest rare to balance it out. Right now, he had knocked three rare arrows and fired them away. Poison Arrow, Arrow Rank, Rare DMG, 10 to 25, Effect, Toxic Effect plus 10%, Explosive Arrow, Arrow Rank, 10 to 25 Effect, Bomb Effect plus 10, 10 cent, Piercing Arrow, Arrow Rank, 10 to 25 Effect, Piercing Effect plus 10%. In truth, Draco did not make these rare arrows for him. Tunder had purchased them from the Rank 7 shop. Draco had made him 25 epic arrows and 5 legendary ones, but he kept some of his epic arrows in reserve. After all, this wasn't the final battle. He had to keep some trump cards hidden. He was also the least sociable among the core members, so not everyone knew his abilities and what he could do. The poison arrow was the slowest, while the explosive arrow took the lead. It struck the area near the feet of the Tiger King beast, sending it flying upward with a yelp of pain. The piercing arrow then tore through its right leg, making it scream in pain. Lowly King was shocked and enraged by this. He noticed that the poison arrow was headed for him and avoided it with ease. Tunder, though, smiled and hooked a finger. Lowly King was alarmed by this action and jumped to the side again, noticing that the arrow blasted past him and returned to Tunder's grip. This made him feel fear since if he had not had the gumption to dodge, he would have been pierced by that thing in the ass. Insidious. Tunder clicked his tongue lightly and knocked five arrows this time. He aimed for the staggering Tiger King beats and fire out another set of rare arrows. Flame Arrow, Arrow Rank Rare DMG 10 to 25, Effect Burn Effect plus 10 cent. Ice Arrow, Arrow Rank Rare DMG 10 to 25, Effect Freezing Effect plus 10%. Wind Arrow, Arrow Rank, 1025 Effect, Slicing Effect, plus 10%. Earth Arrow, Arrow Gear Rank 5, Effect, Smashing Effect, plus 10%. Along with these, he sent the Poison Arrow he had recovered back out. Seeing as his Tiger King Beast was in no state to dodge, Lowly King leapt in the way and raised a paw to smack away the arrows. However, he was too confident in the power of his beast form merged with his intellect. The wind arrow simply cut up his skin, revealing surface-level wounds. The fire arrow burned one of his paws black, lighting it on fire. The ice arrow froze the other paw, turning it into a block of frozen ice that could shatter at any time. Finally, the earth arrow smacked him in the center of his belly, since Lowly King had sat on his hind legs to use his two front paws. This knocked him away, like a person shoulder-bashing another. He spat out blood and crashed into another section of the stage, trying to put out the fire on one paw and unfreeze the other. This left the Tiger King beast to be struck in the throat with the poison arrow, making it gurgle with pain as the toxins began working quickly in stripping away its life. The crowd was left shocked and amazed. In just two attacks, Tunder had outmaneuvered his foes. He had severely injured his main enemy and almost crippled the sidekick. What's more formidable, Tunder had only used seven rare rank arrows to achieve this, so what if he pulled out his bigger firepower? He could have ended it much faster, yes, but he was wary of something, which was why he was patiently dealing with his prey. Lowly King used the flames on his left paw of Thaw his right, the two cancelling each other out. He could barely rise to his feet as he was winded, and his two front paws were severely damaged. He was shocked when he saw that his summon was heavily poisoned, and had one leg ruined. It seemed as if things were looking dire for him, so he decisively went all out. Beast Fusion. Immediately, he began to float in the air with a white glow covering him while his Tiger King also manifested the same visuals. The two then flew towards each other rapidly, colliding at their bellies before exploding in a thunderous glow. From the magnificent light came a huge monster that was about the size of a mammoth, its golden fur billowing in the wind as the king character on its forehead changed to emperor. Name, Lowly King, Tiger King, 
Rank 3 Beastmaster, Major Rank, Level 100, HP 5,996,000, Seeing as all the damage that had been done to him had been reset, Tunder's eyes narrowed. Lowly King then gazed upon Tunder with a hint of disdain as he spoke in a thunderous voice. I am neither Lowly King nor Tiger King. I am the Leaguer Emperor. The self-proclaimed Leaguer Emperor leapt forth like a speed train and raised a paw to smash where Tunder stood. And I will be the one to destroy you. Tunder agilely dodged and flipped upon the paw of the Lifer Emperor. From there, he knocked three of his epic arrows, his right eye closed due to the nature of them. One was bright and shone with a splendor, the other was dark and glowed like the night, while the final one was green and made one feel nauseous. They were the epic grade light, darkness, and toxic arrows, respectively. Author's note, I ain't gonna bother showing their stats, because that requires too much brain power and wastes word count anyway. The three had their active skills activated as they shot out. The light arrow flared brightly for a second, blinding all onlookers. The Ligger Emperor was especially plagued by this as he howled in pain. The arrow then struck his shoulder, and a beam of light energy struck him from above, searing a hole right through the joint. Thunderpower, who was calmly standing atop the raised paw, had to jump off since that paw became limp. The dark arrow seemed to suck in ambient light as it struck the other shoulder joint. A black miasma erupted from the collision, spinning like a small sun before disappearing. To the horror of all onlookers, the mound of flesh that had once been there was gone, looking like a beast had taken a huge bite out of the flesh there. The Ligger Emperor staggered painfully, shocked by the assault on his person and how powerful Tunder's arrows were. Realizing he could not allow the last one to hit him at all costs, he decisively roared with Empyrean strength. It produced a shockwave loud enough to blow back the arrow. Even Tunder had to plunge an arrow into the arena and grip it tightly to avoid being blown out. He also made sure to grab his epic poison arrow that flew past him, a solemn expression on his face. The Leaguer Emperor ended his roar and shook his body. Even though he had been hurt by those arrows, one could see his body begin to regenerate quick enough that in a matter of second, the damage would be undone. Tunder was obviously not going to allow that. Chapter 573, The Individual Tournament 7 I have mostly gone easy on you since I didn't want to unveil all my cards this early in the game, but it seems I must show a bit of what I can do. That is fine. Tunder muttered with a sigh of acceptance. Stampede, active skill effect, call out to the beasts of the plains and have them crush foes with their hooves, damaging a specific group of enemies within five miles. This deals variable damage depending on location. Duration, five minutes. Cooldown, 20 hours. Tunder stomped his feet on the ground and made a strange call using his voice. He spun his bow above him while doing so, his body beginning to glow with a greenish-white aura. Seeing this, the Ligger Emperor felt an unprecedented amount of danger and knew that he had to stop whatever this fellow was doing at once. He roared and charged over, raising a paw to pound Tunder power into paste. However, Tunder smiled widely at this moment, and the Ligger Emperor realized he had made a mistake. The arrow that Tunder had used to hold himself down from being blown out of the stage was still implanted in the ground and was positioned exactly below the Liger Emperor. Immediately, Tunder activated the arrow's active skill was used and a wave of electricity shot through the Liger Emperor's body, stunning him in that position of swinging his paw down and dealing heavy amounts of damage as his fur was blackened by the shock. At this time, the arena began to shake. From the void, many wild animals like deer, moose, elk, horses, buffaloes, and bulls began to appear, charging in a straight line ahead of them at their full speed. Tunder, who was the summoner, knew that after Update 2 he could be harmed by his own skills. This one was meant to be summoned in open spaces, not a confined arena like this arena, but he had to use it for the battle. Still, he jumped up and landed on the back of a charging horse. From there, he jumped onto the back of another elk deftly, and without losing his balance, thanks to his high dexterity and his own nimbleness as a wood elf. While he was shifting about, he noticed that the Liger Emperor had long been trampled into the dirt, 
his body unrecognizable over time as more and more animals stepped over his body without stopping. Soon, Tunder's skill was forcibly cancelled, and all the animals stampeding disappeared as Amber called his win for the match. The mighty Leaguer Emperor had been stomped to death by mere prey animals. Seventh match winner, Tunder Power. Tunder felt like he had seen this plot somewhere. However, it must be an old movie or cartoon if he couldn't remember it off-head. So he lost interest. Rather, he bowed to the crowd, especially the Mexicans who were cheering him. He blushed when the Mexican mamacitas unhesitatingly removed their tops and shook their breasts towards him. Naturally, he took a good look since it was part of his reward before leaving the stage. As for Lowly King, he respawned in the waiting area with a pale face. Being stomped to death was an experience he never wanted to suffer again. It might look like nothing, but those animals had weighed far more than a human, and their hooves were made of a hard material that felt like stone. It would be far better to be stomped on by humans than by prey animals. Eighth Match Panty King vs. Gentle Lamb At this time, two titans walked on stage at the same time, on the left as a man who was valiant, brave, charismatic, handsome, and pure-hearted, according to his own statistics. To the crowd, he looked like a fellow one could not trust at all. Many eyes narrowed, wondering if he was the one who did some prank lie in their past, but realized it was impossible with how they did not know him personally. However, the fellow's sketchiness was too great. He had two leaf-shaped green eyes, a slightly twisted nose, wide yet thin lips, and a pointy chin. Coupled with his messy black hair, he really gave off the feel of a scumbag, despite not being ugly at all. In truth, he had a certain kind of I am evil handsomeness to him. Only, T, it was not as bad boy-ish as Draco or Samuel, but rather, I am unreliable. He wore a set of leather armor with a white swordsman's trench coat. His leather armor comprised of a vest and a pair of pants that were white with red in lines. In this particular area, Panty King was really looking suave, like a noble swordsman of an empire. As such, despite his despicable bearing, many of the Japanese girls cried out for him, shouting, Gambat or Sugoi, among other words that made weebs all around the world swoon. As for Kirin, he was cool and composed. He had the typical protagonist-like handsomeness, with curly blonde hair and bright blue eyes. His serious expression added a levity to his demeanor that made him fatally attractive to young women. He wore a set of black Taoist monk robes, and his arm was covered by a pair of legendary gloves he had acquired to enhance his power. The people of India also gave him a loud cheer, which made Kiran smile a little. Right then, Amber called for the match to begin, and it did with a bang. Panty King used to be a spellblade, an uncommon class, which had allowed him to climb into the ranks of basic members. Even though he started out at the theoretical bottom rung of Umbra, it still put him leagues above 99% of the player base. Each basic member had had the skill to become a notable guild leader of a rare guild. However, this alone should not have sent Panty King this high in the rankings to the point where he was one of Umbra's top fighters, excluding the core members. In truth, it all started when he ended up as one of the last ten remaining in the Dragon Slaying event where Draco fought the Dark Knight in that epic battle. Panty King had used despicable means to keep his life to the end, so he got to reap rewards while other members of Umbra had been turned to dust. The rewards from that had propelled him so far that he was equivalent of an expert member in no time, which was like cold summer. He did not manage to survive during the emergency quest at the end of the First Guild War, and all members of Umbra had survived the Abyss event. He had used his accumulated capital to class up into the epic variant of the Spellblade class line, the Mana Swordsman. Author's note. Somewhere out there, Gula is smiling. Mana Swordsman, epic class, rank 3 skills, might and magic, balance, passive, magic gathering, active, element and power, active, spellcasting boost, active. Starting stats, star 30, dex 15, n 10, int 30, spar 15, cha 10, elk 10. XP gain rate, 40% rank up difficulty, 80%. Class weapons, none. Class skills, any sword or magic. Might and magic, passive skill effect. As a mana swordsman, you have mastered the ability to use the blade in tandem with magic, allowing for the acquisition or merger of the two during combat. 
You can also combine the effects of two skills if they are of a sword and magical nature. Balance, passive skill effect. As a mana swordsman, you must always keep your magical abilities in balance with your physical, lest your entire battle potential dip. For every one stat point placed into stir, gain one point in int. For every one stat point placed into dex, gain one point in spore. Note, due to this, your exp gain rate has been severely reduced and your rank up difficulty greatly increased. Magic Gathering, Active Skill Effect Rapidly gather magic energy into your person, empowering your attacks by 150% and reducing the cost of cast magic by 30% for the duration. Duration, 5 minutes. Cooldown, 15 minutes. Element Empower, Active Skill Effect Channel a specific element into your blade, allowing your strikes to contain 40% of its nature as added damage, including the effects. Duration, 3 minutes. Cooldown, 10 minutes. Spellcasting Boost Active skill effect, enhance the power of your spells by 50% for the duration of this skill. Duration, 10 minutes. Cooldown, 30 minutes. His class skills were really simple, but that was how they needed to be. After all, the true power of his class came from learning other SWO, RD skills and spells from skill spellbooks. In fact, Panty King had crazily bought the entire of Draco's 360 Paragon Sword skills and learned them. This was who he was now number 27 on the universal rankings of all players. Draco had also sold some unique spellbooks from his subjective magic, but Panty King had a harder time getting those as he was unable to compete against titans like Sublime and Co., who were far richer than he was. As such, he mostly settled for whatever other spells he could get. Like Sublime, his skill spell list was so long that it would take hours to go through. However, his was what set him apart from others because he spent entire months in the training hall practicing all his skills and various combinations to maximize his class's power. All of that culminated into this fight, which was intense right from the get-go. Kieran's body exploded in a green light as he burst forth towards Panty King. A brownish energy then exploded around him to accompany it, looking like one of those golden auras from the super monkey dudes in Dragon Ball Z. The light brown energy was his Buddha lineage's noble energy, which was a unique form of energy generated by Kiran through meditation. It was able to power physical attacks, boost speed, reflexes and perception, purify evil spirits, cure sickness, heal wounds, fortify children and the elderly, among others. The green energy was internal force, the legendary energy that all martial artists used. It could power physical attacks, increase raw strength, boot speed, reflexes and perception, heal wounds, fortify children and the elderly, and create a form of defense for the user. As always, one couldn't help but feel like noble energy and internal force were both sides of the same coin. Whatever the case, having these two energies perform virtually the same functions with the same intensity meant that his power was boosted by x4 at the minimum, since each of them boosted his base power by x2. Attack Rush Active Skill Effect Punch furiously at one or multiple targets in a row. Attacks are 6% less accurate, but deal 60% more damage and are 60% faster than the user's current attack speed. It drains 25% more stamina. Duration, 2 minutes. Cooldown, 7 minutes. Moonlight Purple Overdrive. Kieran roared the name of his technique as a flurry of punches were unleashed, numbering so many and being so fast that they left after images over the other. It even looked as if Kieran had multiple hands instead of just two when he wailed away at Panty King. The Mana Swordsman reacted by activating his element in power, using the Wind Element. This increased the speed of his sword greatly, allowing him to react and block every one of Kieran's titanic punches with a slash of his own. The arena turned into the center of a storm, with a minor shockwave blowing all about the place due to the clash of the two. It was bright and windy, forcing those in the crowd to squint in order to prevent dust or the like from entering their eyes. Many quickly wore the provided visors in order to keep following the match. The visors automatically enhanced their cognitive functions, allowing them to see the duo clearly as if they were as powerful as them. Kieran and Panty King's clash soon became more chaotic as they began moving about. Explosions occurred all over the stage as their bodies were no longer visible, appearing and disappearing at random parts of the stage, clashing in a titanic blow, and then disappearing again. 
The members of the crowd were dissatisfied by this until their visors adapted and allowed them to see what was going on. Some were curious about how those on the field would be able to see it from such a distance, but they were shocked, speechless, when they saw that the core members all sat there with folded their arms, stoically watching the match without any apparent issues. Their bodies were not moving, but their eyes were. Their pupil darted about, as if they could perfectly follow the movement of the two on stage. Occasionally, they would move their heads, and it was all ways in the direction of the next clash. The normies in the crowd felt envious, developing even more fervor to start playing this game after the competition. I mean, just look at this. This was the kind of stuff you would see in a shonen anime, but they were watching it and feeling its effects in real life. How great would it be if they were the ones with the power to do it? Kieran and Panty King stopped their bout and reappeared in the center of the stage. Kiran still emitted that aura that looked spiky and dangerous, a greenish-brown light that covered his entire body and caused a displacement of air and rocks. If his hair became spiky as well, it would nail a certain look, but it was still dormant on his head, unfortunately. Panty King had no visible aura, but his blade was coated in minor windstorms, going visible and invisible each second. Unarmed Combat Mastery Passive Skill Effect the user can use any form of hand-to-hand -hand combat skills or techniques without draining stamina, and the damage and defense when using such techniques is increased by 40%. Thanks to this passive, he hadn't lost any stamina after that move, and his already boosted powers had been greatly enhanced. In that scuffle, both he and Panty King retained some damage, but the latter was down to only 10% HP, while Kieran still had 95%. Seeing this, the crowd gasped. They were shocked that despite blocking all his hits, the leftover damage was great enough to have breached all of Panty King's defenses and lowered him to a smidgen of life left. Panty King himself was not even panting, but his face was utterly solemn. That playful and despicable aura was gone as he understood that his chances of winning were close to nil. He was 27th on the Universal rankings while Kieran was 5th. In the entire player base, Apart from Draco, who was first, Eva, who was second, Essence, who was third, and Rena, who was fourth, Kiran was the strongest. Of course, while it was believed that Slim Fatty was stronger than Kiran, that was only in the context of dealing damage. The universal rankings accounted for far more than just that, which was why Kiran was fifth and Slim Fatty was ninth, with sixth, eighth being the remaining five generals. For Panty King to jump so many ranks was impossible. Heck, he was doing far better than Joker, who had been paired with Slim Fatty, as he survived one of Kieran's skills. Naturally, he had known this before he had climbed the stage, but he couldn't falter before the world, and Kieran was his fellow guildmate. Like the other, he would allow Panty King to display his fullest power before the world in order to show why Umbra was supreme. After all, Panty King's skill lasted three minutes, which was the entire duration of the match while Kieran's attack rush lasted two minutes in total. Only about ten seconds have passed so far, so why would they have stopped? Panty King knew this was his cue, so he capped his hands and used a healing skill. Instant healing, active skill effect, heal 32% or 17,000 HP, whichever is greater, instantly. Cooldown, 1.85 minutes. Immediately, Panty King recovered 65% his total HP, as very few players had more than 30,000 HP within Umbra at rank 3. It was only beasts like Draco who had around 500,000 HP at rank 3 due to his various buffs and boons. With a deep breath, he raised his sword up and began using one of Draco's most powerful Paragon Sword skills. Sword Skill 359, Overcharge. Sword Skill 359, Overcharge, Active Skill Rank, Legendary Effect. Enter a ready stance and gather worldly energy into your blade, unleashing it as a sword wave with unparalleled might. Note 1. The damage of this skill is dependent on the amount of worldly energy contained within the blade. Note 2. This skill reduced the durability of all weapons at the epic rank and below. Cooldown. One day. Torrents of worldly energy were pulled towards Panty King's upraised sword, entering it and making it glow with a mesmerizing blue light. The energy collection caused a minor tornado on the stage, almost dragging those at the sidelines int. Oh it. 
Kiran was not bothered as he coated his feet with his two energies to make him stay rooted on the ground. He smiled at the attempt of Panty King, feeling him wise for going all out with this strike to try and clinch a hint of victory. As such, Kiran put his hands together in a Buddhist prayer position. His roaring noble energy and internal force condensed into his palm from all over his body, coating it in their resplendent light. Just as Panty King finished charging his attack, he swept his sword forward, sending a huge wave of greenish-blue sword light going forwards as he roared. Heaven Star Lunar Fang! Kieran's eye burst open with a beam of light as he performed a Tai Chi movement and punched out. Kiai Cannon! Chi Wave Active Skill Effect. Send out a wave of condensed chi made through cultivation to damage all enemies within 5 miles. This deals 700% special damage. Cooldown. 20 Hours. Chapter 574. Causing Trouble 1. Once Draco entered his inner universe, he was pleased to see that everyone was living peacefully within. Not too much time had passed since he last came in, less than a week in total. Draco saw Zane feeding Loki some baby food that had been prepared by the Grandmaster Cook Natasha. Speaking of the Bird Woman, she now sported a bulging belly that looked like it was about to explode. Birds had a short gestation period and gave birth to their young as eggs. But a half-bird species like Natasha still gave birth the traditional way. The human gestation was nine months and the birdman gestation was three months, meaning Natasha would give birth in less than a month since she had been impregnated almost five months ago. In fact, the majority of the concubines who came from the treasury were about to give birth, with most having done so already. The Avatparis races among them had long since laid their eggs and were waiting for the imminent hatching. Those with longer gestation periods due to unique and complex biology, like the half-golem Noel, who was a Grandmaster rank architect, the half-Fachisa, who was a Grandmaster rank gardener, and the half-wood elf Aisha, who was a Grandmaster alchemist, had yet to give birth, but were getting there. As such, the island in the void was quite populated and lively with many kids ambling about, including the now one-and-half-year-old kids from the 28 human concubines who had formerly been maids at the Rank 7 castle. Rila was in the hands of Hikari, while Rosella was currently sitting behind a picture book as Roma gently taught her some herbs for witch concoctions. As Rosella's IQ was almost on the level of a teen, she could easily learn this despite being so young. When they saw Draco enter, Everyone happily gathered around him and chattered on about various things. He was more than happy to accompany them all like this for a few hours, especially spending time playing in the public park with all the kids of the Morning Star clan. Since they all had his bloodline, they were far stronger than any humanoid toddlers, and some continually created accidents when they lost control of their power. Heck, his child with the half-serpent girl Moira had transformed into a dragonling for a few seconds, then transformed back as he fell to sleep weakly. The transformation had exhausted all his energy, and his mother, who had been caring for him, couldn't even move as the bloodline of her son had completely paralyzed her. She had only been able to watch the tiny dragon blink in confusion from the sudden transformation, then turn back the next instant. Luckily, the other non-serpent-related mothers had been there to help her out in this case, but her case wasn't unique. Most of them had suffered a similar experience. Draco's bloodline, status, and wealth was great, and making these kids had been the best experiences in their lives. But by God raising them was an extreme sport. Without enough patience and care, most of them would have just jumped off the edge of the island into the void. With this in mind, Draco gathered all his kids and sat them down. He leisurely clapped his hands and closed his eyes, sending his thoughts to the little tots curiously gazing at their father. They showed visible surprise as they felt some sort of information enter their heads, gently unpacking itself and merging with their mind in a way their developing brains could handle and understand. One might even call it a bloodline starter pack. That Draco had given them based on his own experiences, which would embed itself into the psyche of the toddlers and allow them to better control themselves without consciously doing so. This should grant their poor mothers some respite after suffering for so long. Not to mention it was best he did this early, 
so it would be entrenched in their subconsciouses deeper as they grew up. Draco spent the next three days with his family, and on the fourth day he started on some work. He took out Père de Denny and Jolnir, stopping the auto-production of epic items that he want, ed to sell, and began working manually. He even did a bit of scrivening and magical engineering at this time, but he couldn't work on his privateering because his avatar was currently using that to make more ships for the Umbra Sea Route. Draco worked for four days straight and was satisfied with the number of things he made. It only took him an average of three minutes to completely create a legendary item, one minute to craft it and two minutes to place the enchantments upon them. As for the potions, it only took a minute at most. It wasn't just because he was a grandmaster, but the other overwhelming factors at play. The void of perfection granted by being a control master, his high-ranked draconic state of being. Subjective magic's cause and effect theory, devil's guile passive skill, his grandmaster technique, three-pound origin for blacksmithing, and refined star technique for alchemy, which were both now at level seven. The epic rank fire of war, the inventor title, the two legendary growth items, Pear Dodany and Mjolnir. With this lineup, not only was his success rate guaranteed, but his crafting time was severely reduced. The production of legendary items had already been possible for Draco by abusing loopholes, even when he had been an expert rank blacksmith, and he could somewhat easily craft them when he was a master rank blacksmith by relying on his grandmaster enchanting to get the job done. Now that he was an actual grandmaster, there was none of that pain where he had to heal himself when his arm got damaged by the metals. Now, he just needed to shape them using etheric energy, which he could easily control if he focused all of the above-listed abilities and everything came easily. The same went for alchemy. If Draco had been outside, he would have to find sources of competent etheric energy to craft, but in this inner universe, it was as abundant as air, also being of the highest quality. Otherwise, how could those babies have been transforming and doing magnificent things left and right when even Draco himself couldn't do so yet. It was all due to the environment they were in, soaked to the teeth in all energies up to origin rank. Draco eventually made just under 2,000 different legendary items, both equipment and consumables. This should be more than enough to sell out the entire tower and clean them of most of their goodies. Draco then put it aside and eyed the side askance, watching two fellows with a speechless look. Chiang Chi and Clarence sat at the edge of the island, gazing into the void while side by side. There was a melancholic air about them as they looked forward into the starry nothingness, their auras dark and despairing. Ha! Ah, I guess we should have expected it, Brother Clarence. It was truly inevitable. Chiang Chi sighed with fatigue. Clarence lowered his head with sadness. I did have hope. I truly did. But I now know it was fleeting. Chiang Chi shook his head. From the moment I signed that contract, I knew this day would come. No banquet lasts forever, and everyone must go home eventually. Clarence's eyes became slightly bloodshot. But this banquet was too short. I have lived for thousands of years, yet the best of them only lasted two. How can I be happy with that? Chiang Chi's eyes watered slightly. Brother Clarence. Clarence also felt his eyes watering as he wiped them slowly. We have been thrown to the side, Brother Chiang. There is no mistaking it. Apart from fooling around, it's like we are no longer necessary. Cheong Chi sighed. I even find it unbelievable that we were once required for battle and could not be done without. Now that power has been achieved by that fellow, we are now relegated to occasional comic relief. Clarence gritted his teeth. Brother Cheong, let's just end it. I'm a divine dragon for the love of everything. Divine. I'm tired of being someone's clown for amusement. If I die, I want to die while being my true self. Chong Chi gazed to his savanna nest. I truly love my family, but I love the feeling of being relevant more. If I can't have that, then I'd broth. Ather just not feel anything. Chong Chi's eyes firmed up as if he had made a decision. Let's do it, Brother Clarent, together. Clarent also gazed to his dragon perch and sighed. Yes, together. The two held hands, one paw and one claw. They gazed at each other gently, then laughed softly. You know, I am glad I met a true friend like you in this life, Brother Cheong. All else have just been fake friends from day one. Clarence remarked with a happy smile. 
Cheong Chi grinned widely. It's part of my charm. My happiness stems from the fact that I met a truly handsome fellow like you while I lived. After all, I am but a mere copy of another entity. I shouldn't even exist. Two gazed at each other for a bit longer than gazed into the void. After closing their eyes, they began counting down simultaneously. Ten, nine, eight. Their bodies became taut as they got ready to jump as soon as the number hit zero. Just when their count reached one, a voice came from behind them that the two resented. What you doing? Draco asked in an innocent tone as he walked over. The two paused their counting and opened their eyes to gaze at the fellow coldly before ignoring him. They once again prepared to end it all by jumping over the edge, making Draco's lips twitch. Hold on there, buckaroos. There's no need for such drastic action. Why not come here and give me a hug, then we call bygones, as whatever they're supposed to be called? Draco offered, walking over with a smile. The eyes of Cheong Chi and Clarent, who were now facing Draco, glinted, but they simultaneously turned and manifest distrustful expressions. Cheong Chi snorted. Humph, I have been fooled by the sweet tongue too many times, Clarence sneered. There's nothing you can say that will change our minds. Draco simply laughed and patted Cheong Chi on the back. Brother Cheong, just look at you. Your lush fur and golden mane billow in the wind with majesty. Why I can even picture you standing on a rocky precipice above a large savanna, your mighty roar able to subdue all the beasts in the wild. Cheong Chi shuddered, his entire body feeling alive as he blushed and rubbed the back of his head. It's not that great. Draco then patted Clarent on the neck. My dragon primogenitor, look at those glowing red scales. Look at that formation, so beautiful and symmetrical. Any dragoness that dares walk within one kilometer of you will not be able to look away, for what better thing can their eyes gaze upon by the most majestic fire dragon alive? Clarent also shivered and felt his cheeks become hot due to the intense praise. He folded his arms and looked away. Humph. Seeing that he had disarmed the two, Draco smiled softly. Come on now, without you two, I would never be whole. Don't forget, the reason why my women are taking precedence in this unique quest is because it's our first operation together. And previously, they always had to wait for us outside while we did our magic. It's also not fair to them if I bring them to the unique quest with the inner universe, but sideline them. Draco revealed with a sigh. Hearing this, Cheong Chi and Clarence shared a look before grudging nodding. Fine, if you say it like that, we would seem petty for continuing. Just remember to bring us out when it's necessary. Ha! Of course, of course! Draco laughed, stretching his arms out for a hug. Cheong Chi and Clarence returned his gesture slowly, as if not sure whether they wanted to be that close with him so soon. When they got a grip on him, those, their expression changed into one of unspeakable evil. We got him! We actually got him! Cheong Chi harped with excitement. You actually entered our embrace? Wahaha, you fool! Clarence laughed with glee. Draco's expression became sullen. What are you trying to do? The duo of lizard and cat snickered. Oh, nothing. Just making you feel what we felt. As brothers, we must share pains and pleasures, shouldn't we? Draco's expression changed. You wouldn't. The new evil duo smiled filthily. Oh, yes, we would. Enjoy the plunge. They dragged the resisting Draco over to the edge of the void, then tossed him over while the fellow roared with anger and fear. Seeing him disappear into the darkness, Cheong Chi and Clarence felt incomparably refreshed, as if all the pains they had suffered throughout their lives had been cured and their souls were being hugged by angels. God, it feels so good! Cheong Chi roared with satisfaction, his tail swishing left and right in delight. Wah! I love being evil! Clarence also bellowed in tandem, stretching his wings out and contracting them rapidly in joy. Me too, to be honest. Being evil is really the only way to live, Draco added with amusement. Hearing this voice, the duo froze. They then slowly turned around to gaze at Draco, who was hovering over the edge of the island while in a lazy lying down position like he was some Egyptian empress. Seeing him like this, the faces of the two stooges fell. Chiang Chi pointed a shaky finger at Draco, shock all over his face. How can this be? How can you still be fine? Draco gazed at the two of them strangely. I am the god of this entire universe, not just the island. I can exist in the void with ease, so why can't I do this? 
Hearing this, the duo was speechless. They were new to this inner universe matter and assumed that Draco's power only resided on the island, which was the only habitable mass. If he could control the void out there, why not create new islands or expand them? In fact, the various women here, except Eva, thought the same, which was why they had strictly warned the kids to never wander close to the edge. Realizing this, Cheong Chi and Clarent shared a look and shrugged. Hey, they tried their best, right? At least they had learned something new today. As such, they began walking to the edge of the void, about to hop over when Draco stopped them with a strange smile. What are you guys doing? Clarent rolled his eyes. Oh, please, we both know how this routine goes. Instead of wasting time, we'll just make things easier on everyone by jumping ourselves. Draco scratched the back of his head. Nah, there's no need. I'm in a good mood today, so why don't we all go out and check the sales of the shop together? Despite looking amiable and normal, Cheong Chi and Clarence's lax and defeated demeanor became rigid. The duo jumped back and adopted defensive postures as they became incomparably vigilant. Draco didn't know whether to laugh or cry from this reaction. What are you two doing now? You complain that I don't take you out enough, and now that I want to, you deny? Draco waved his hand a portal appeared to the outside world. Come on, you two, let's go. Cheong Chi and Clarence shivered with fear, backing away even more. D. Draco, you should stop while you're ahead. We have already accepted that we wronged you. There's no need to go so far. Cheong Chi cried in fear. Bastard Draco, there is such a thing known as law and order. Don't you dare do something unlawful. Clarence also commented with worry. At this point, the fellow was thoroughly speechless. Just how bad of an impression did these two have to mistake his wickedness for the norm and his kindness for wickedness? Draco's face became cold as he grabbed the duo and tossed them towards the portal. You talk too much. Let's just go out and have some fun time. What's with all the theatrics? While hurtling towards it, the duo screamed like chickens being chased by a fox in a hen coop. Shira, save me! Cheong Chi screamed in a high-pitched voice, not caring in the least for his dignity as a father. No, no, I don't want to go. Help! Clarence shrieked like a little girl as he accompanied the fellow. Draco just facepalmed and returned to the castle, seeing the two fellows who had been ejected screaming and thrashing about as if they had been tossed into a hellish world. Draco just watched them with a nonplussed expression, and his arms folded as the duo came down from their fear and realized nothing had happened. When they saw the castle's familiar throne room and Draco watching them with a neutra, L face from the side, they understood. Cheong Chi and Clarence shared a look and jumped to their feet. Cheong Chi laughed and patted Clarence on the back. Silly Clarence, you should never have doubted Draco. Why were you screaming so loudly? Because of that, you couldn't hear me tell you that everything was all right and there was nothing to fear. Clarence simply laughed and patted Cheong Chi as well. Brother Cheong, is your memory faulty? I remember you screaming to your wife, disallowing me the chance to inform you that everything was safe, and Brother Draco was a man of valor and righteousness, who would never do evil upon us. Draco blushed. These two fellows were glowing with so much handsomeness that he felt his heart jump like a virgin maiden meeting the knight in shining armor. Chapter 575 Preparations to Upgrade the Inner Sun Draco clobbered the two unruly fellows for a bit to straighten them out and bring them back onto the path of righteousness, justice, and world peace. He then left the castle with the duo skipping along happily behind him, wondering what kind of trouble they would get the chance to cause today. They noticed that the marketplace seemed to be much more lively than usual today, prompting the trio to share a silent look. It seemed like the buzz the items Draco had put on sale had yet to die down, leading them to believe that either they had all sold out or there were still people out there furiously bidding for more. Seeing this, the three immediately knew what to do. With sly smiles, they wore disguises in a variety of forms and mingled into the crowd. Draco wore a pair of square-rimmed glasses, only his face visible, whereas Cheong Chi wore an open-eye mask that covered all but his eyes. As for Clarent, he had fished out his old set of Taoist sect leader robes with the fake white beard and Chinese topknot. He connected his huge sleeves together 
and walked around with his eyes squinted, pretending to be an old master descending into the world after millennia of cultivating. When they squeezed through to the front, they could see what was going on. They had been exactly right. The crowd was fighting for the various legendary items and equipment on display through auctions. About eleven days had passed since Draco had opened the shop and put his items on display, and half of the inventory was already gone. The fact that the other half had remained wasn't due to a lack of demand, but heavy contention. The battles going on were fierce, an aura of competition and rivalry palpable as people furiously tapped into the shop displays that came up before them. Many were rapidly using their remaining score points to offer up goods for their items, while others were putting up those they had already claimed but had no use for. Draco was willing to accept anything and everything. After all, resources were resources. Even if he managed to claim the maximum amount of points on every subsequent floor, that alone wouldn't be enough to redeem every unique reward that Tower had to offer, not even if he used up the free selections upon passing those floors. Of course, the reason why there was so much commotion in his shop was due to the rules Draco had set. Firstly, no two items could be claimed at the same time. In other words, if Person X used Epic Material A to add to his bid for a legendary item, Person Y would be rejected if he added the same Epic Material A. After all, with refinement, Draco had no such issue with sustainable development and production of resources. His only problem now was the acquisition of said resources, which was why he had bothered with this plan and the rules in the first place. If he acquired a resource below the divine rank, he could study its molecular structure and spit it out freely within his inner universe as long as he dedicated time to it. To summarize, Draco was that wretched fellow who visited supermarkets solely to eat his fill of free samples without ever buying the actual product. As for finished goods like equipment or potions, his limit was still the rare rank. Anything above the epic rank was not feasible as they possessed item spirits and unique enchantments that made their entire web of components too complex to even fathom, much less understand. However, back to the shop, the shameless trio shared looks and marveled at how effective their plan was unfolding. Maybe the resources Chiang Chi and Clarent wanted had already been redeemed, so all they had to do was collect them. Excitingly, enough resources had also been gathered for Eva to upgrade her inner son by one tier. Draco was looking forward to how much more OP she would become after doing so. As for his inner universe, he was still missing some resources, but he was not bothered. However, since he had already unveiled his priority item, Draco was certain he would get everything into me. Draco collected all the stored items and tweaked the shop settings a little. He also added a few new items, which were for Roma, Zane, and Hikari. Added to them were some requests from his concubines, which would help them either purify their bloodlines or help them with their trades. Unlike the human-made concubines, the goddess-descendant concubines were all grandmasters of their various fields and could yield a whole slew of items in the inner universe. Of course, the human girls were special because they had fully human bloodline and had been enhanced by Richmond as a parting gift, which had made them perfect breeding mates. Even though Draco's kids with the other concubines had a variety of mixed bloodlines, none were as pure and powerful as those with full human bloodlines. After doing so, the trio sneaked away and returned to the castle. They had initially wanted to cause some trouble, but upon seeing the scene there, they had decided to wait until next time. People believed the legendary items on display were scarce, so if they saw a sudden influx of almost 2,000 new ones, they would be reluctant to pay as much as they were doing now, so Draco had opted to add them slowly over time to maximize his gains. They returned to the inner universe and split the gains. Chiang Chi skipped off to find Shira and give her the items he procured so that she could increase the grade of her Manticore bloodline and hopefully evolve into an epic Manticore variant. As for Clarent, he flapped his wings and soared up to his dragon perch, to give Krona these precious items that would allow her to finally evolve from a drake to a dragon. He was most excited about this, as the former worm's special bloodline would only activate once she attained a true dragon form. Of course, 
Draco was not one to be left out. He happily apported to Eva's heavenly palace, where she was discussing some matters in a court-like system with her angels who she had released from her eye of miracles within the game. She wanted to gain more of an understanding of her heaven and how to manage it, as well as understand why the cycle of heaven and hell was limited to just them, instead of running automatically to encompass the entire earth, if not the whole universe. When the angels saw Draco had barged into the palace like it was his backyard, all of them except Samel displayed unhappy and antagonistic expressions which the troublemaker naturally ignored. He was already aware that no matter what he did, it would be in their nature to hate him, for he represented the opposite of what they stood for. Eva waved her hand and collected all the angels back into her seven heavens, then gazed down at Draco imperiously from her throne. Draco smiled and then bowed subserviently. Oh great, beautiful, magnanimous, lovely, attractive, sensual, and supreme goddess, this magnificent, handsome, wise, charismatic, cheerful, and divine devil greets you. Eva's lips twitched as she jumped off her throne and landed in Draco's outstretched arms which were waiting to catch her. Fine, you win again, boss Draco. Anyway, what's up? Eva admitted defeat with a charming smile. Draco lazily tossed Eva into the air, who agilely did a few flips before perfectly landing in Draco's grasp once more. Why not read my mind? He asked curiously. Eva glanced at him askance. No thank you, doing so has been rated a nuclear level hazard. Draco chuckled proudly. Ha ha! How many in the world can make a person like you recoil from reading their minds due to the sheer manner of wise and visionary thoughts going through their head? Eva wiped a red liquid that appeared from the side of her mouth and sighed. Even when she didn't read his mind, she still suffered damage. That was one of the reasons she started learning his Tao, so that she could build immunity towards it. Draco tossed Eva high into the air, and the celestial maiden flipped in all manner of angles before landing on the ground perfectly, standing right before Draco with a curious expression. Don't keep me out of the low, op, handsome devil. What do you have in mind? Draco removed some items from his inventory and placed them before Eva as she sat on the ground cross-legged. Eva did the same as she observed the items one by one before remarking in surprise. Then she smiled widely then put them down. I can finally upgrade my inner son by a tear. That thing has been with me since I got compensation from that retarded goddess, but I've never found the time to search for the resources. Draco rubbed his chin, feeling like a proud peacock. I realized when you showed me your memories, I also saw the list of items you needed to upgrade it through your eyes, so I got them for you as a surprise. Eva did not hold back her praise knowing what Draco wanted. Truly handsome, visionary, wise, supreme, capable, profound, and magnanimous. If all the men of the world could have 0.001% of your traits, we would long have achieved perfection. Waha, that's true, that's true. Draco chanted as he smiled. His eyes curved into crescents so deep you could no longer see his pupils, and his face was flushed due to excitement and joy. Draco then scratched his head. Anyway, I just wanted to give you a heads up. I'll first have to analyze the composition of these resources, among others, so that I can freely reproduce them. Naturally, the same applied to the resources meant for Shira and Krona. Clarent and Cheong Chi were simply doing the same thing as him and showing off to their wives that they thought of them, but they wouldn't use the items just yet. That would be a waste of Draco's special abilities. Eva understood this, so she simply waited. It was not like she directly needed to upgrade right away, anyway. As such, she used this chance to check up on her inner son's status. As she closed her eyes and gazed within her own self, she saw a floating ball of fire within a black void that radiated intense heat despite its small size. If taken out of her, it would only be the size of a grain of rice, yet the amount of energy it gave off was insane. Eva usually let the energy passively enhance herself because she had no real way to access it. It was currently at tier zero, which meant that apart from some passive effects, everything else was blocked to her. She called up its details and checked them. Sunseed, fusion item, divine, durability, max. Effects, passive one, energy generation. Your inner sun constantly spins and combusts to generate endless heat and light energy for you. 
No matter your mana or stamina stats, you will always be able to use techniques and skills related to these two elements. Passive 2. Power Boost The fundamental nature of the heat and light energy used in your skills and techniques has been replaced by what is produced by the inner sun, increasing the effectiveness of both elements by 10,000%. Active 1. Sunder Press The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. When it rises, it sunders the horizon with its might, and when it sets, it suppresses the horizon with its power. All enemies with a zone of your designation will either go through the effect of being sundered or being suppressed. Duration, variable. Cooldown, variable. Active 2. Rays. The heat of the sun can only be borne by special fire species like the sun crow, the phoenix, etc. Any other species subjected to its heat will turn into ash without a chance to fight back. Summon your inner sun out into the real world and allow its explosive heat to sweep through the battlefield. Duration, variable. Cooldown, variable. Note, at tier 0, only passive 1 is usable and its effectiveness is limited to 0.1% of its full output. Description. A young sun that is currently in its growth phase within a divine being with the heat and light domains. Even though it is still in its infancy, it boasts a great chance of growth and amazing compatibility with its host, allowing it to manifest abilities that are beyond what most could acquire. Eva licked her lips. She had already been moved by the abilities of the Sunseed when she had first laid her eyes upon it. However, she had only been able to sigh with lament and put it at the back of her mind when she had seen the limited power available to her and especially the types of resources it had needed to grow. Had it not been for this tower, most of that stuff would not have been easy to acquire on the deficient main plane, if it had been possible at all. Having realized that, Eva had just decided to let things sort themselves out in the future. She had intended to look for a chance to acquire those resources during the Great War with the demons or by barging into the realm of the gods. After all, for Suna to have this seed but not use it meant that the sun goddess must have an inner sun of her own. Surely, that dumbass would at least know where to acquire the resources Eva would need for an upgrade, right? But now, it was not necessary anymore. Draco had gone above and beyond to make sure she could easily upgrade it to the first tier, which should unlock more of its power. Thinking like this, Eva smiled gently and opened her eyes to see Draco, who was focused on inspecting the items put before him one by one. After fully grasping the nature of one and committing it to memory, he would use his refinement to reproduce it right on the spot. This caused intense fluctuations in energy as they were devoured to facilitate the transmutation. In truth, were it not for the eternal tree that produced an infinite amount of energy for the inner universe, what Draco was doing could have greatly damaged Vita Kingdom, perhaps crippling it for decades or centuries. Not wanting to disturb him, Eva resumed her meditation, entering her seven heavens to continue her counsel with her angels. This made for a serene scene in the heavenly palace, one that was begging to be captured in painting to be hung on the throne of a king or emperor. However, soon enough, the peace would be disturbed. One lion and one dragon head peeked in from the outside, inspecting the area carefully with vigilant eyes, their usual playfulness gone. Do you see the lady boss? Chiang Chi asked Clarent in a whisper. Clarent shook his head. Should be safe to enter. Even if she is inside, I doubt she'll kill us on account of our relationship with Draco. Despite saying that, the two still refused to enter. What they didn't know was that Riveting Knight was currently being suppressed and could not come out. It was Evaterasu who took charge, and she was mostly neutral and mature about most things. Eventually, the duo mustered up the courage to enter and walk through the Heavenly Palace slowly, not daring to release their senses outwards. However, they still knew where to locate Draco at all times due to their connection with him. When they came upon the central throne room, they saw the white-haired duo seated across each other, both focused on their own things. Chiang Chi and Clarent gazed at the focused and concentrated Draco, and their whole bodies itched to interrupt him and cause trouble. However, seeing Eva right there across from him was as if someone had poured a bucket of cold water above their heads. Draco himself, who was so fully focused on his work 
didn't even know that he escaped a calamity thanks to Eva's presence. This job he was doing required 100% of his concentration and focus, so he could not pay attention to the world around him. That was exactly why he only ever did this sort of thing in the presence of his wives and not when he was alone. Otherwise, with him being so vulnerable, who knew what evils Clarence and Chang Chi could perform on the innocent him? Eva was less focused than Draco, so she opened her eyes and gazed at the duo of cat and lizard with a neutral gaze. You can leave the items with me, and I'll give them to him. The non-human shameless duo got spooked when they heard Eva talk to them, as they were salivating at the prospect of bullying Draco while he was so weak. They immediately shook their heads and sobered up, then placed the resources that Draco gave them down on the floor. Haha, the Empress is truly wise and butte, Ifil. This Lion King will now humbly take my leave. Chiang Chi greeted as he clasped his fists and backed away quickly. Lady Boss, your aura is filled with magnanimity and supremacy. This divine dragon has finished my task and will now return home. Thanks. Clarent also greeted while backing away quickly. Before Eva could even reply, the two fellows scrammed away as fast as they could, as if spending one more second there would see them devoured to the bone. Eva was left speechless having to gaze into a mirror to wonder if there was something on her face. Soon enough, Draco was done with her set of resources, then sighed with a hint of tiredness. After all, these were all high-grade resources at the Epic and above-grade, which was enough to even tire him out, despite all the passives in his favor. Eva received the original set from the tower, while the secondary set Draco had made from testing was stored away, to be brought out when he was done with the tower. Finally, Eva began by selecting to upgrade her inner son, and the resources broke down and started to be consumed rapidly. Author's note. I have a lot to say, but adding too much would be a problem, so I'll try to summarize and be concise. Recently, there has been a lack of chapters from Guild Wars and Darius Supreme. This isn't because of writer's block or any real crisis, but something more banal. Basically, as I said in Chapter 61, the one where I explained why I was going premium, writing authorship is the equivalent of being unemployed where I come from. You tell anyone you're an author, and they look at you with hidden disdain and pity. So I set a goal for myself to reach 100,000 Gs and invest it in a treasury bill. For those who don't know what that is, it's a government bond, which is probably the equivalent of what was at the time of me setting the goal, $20,000. This can be seen as the bare minimum to start my life and lay a financial foundation. I recently reached that goal thanks to the popularity of Guild Wars especially. You guys have never given up on this novel, which puts me to shame, Tibaha. So I bought the bond and set it to renew the principal every term, which means I have a perpetual investment, as government bonds are about the safest you can get literally unless your government collapses. Now how is this a problem? Well you see I was able to persist precisely because I had that amount set as a goal. I was able to manage writing GW and DS at the same time because I knew what I wanted and I was working toward it. So the problem is, now that I've reached the goal, I'm in a bit of a slump. To make it more concise, I am in a situation that is equivalent to an applicant who had spent a year studying for a university entrance exam and had just written the exam. I was tense and focused on studying and succeeding, and now that the big day is over, I am unwinding and finding it a bit hard to study again. Why am I saying this? I don't plan to put anything on hiatus, really, or pause any of my novels. I did that once and did not enjoy it. I just want to bring you up to speed on my current status. To answer the question of, when will things get back to normal? Think of it like this. Using the above example, I've completed the exam and am awaiting enrollment. So once the school year begins, I will readjust and acquire a new goal. Chapter 5 of 76, Tier 1 Sunseed. The resources before Eva suddenly disappeared as they were absorbed into her body, merging with the small fireball within. Like oil being poured on a bonfire, the fireball exploded, expanding rapidly many times within a second. A wave of heat gushed out from Eva's position, sweeping through the entire heavenly palace and setting many things on fire. Draco quickly set up a barrier of water, 
using his subjective magic around himself and the resources around him that he had yet to copy with a solemn expression. Eva began to glow where she sat, a wreath of fire surrounding her that was tinged with a layer of white light. Within, the grain-sized fireball expanded until it became the size of a tennis ball, then a football, until it reached the relative area of a small city block. Its intensity and power greatly increased as it grew, and the amount of energy flowing through Eva right now shocked her. It felt like she was a generator that could produce endless amounts of heat and light energy, literally infinite amounts. Soon, the fire around her receded, and the heat wave calmed down, though most things within the heavenly palace had already been charred black. They were lucky the building was extremely large and well-sealed enough that the heat wave hadn't expanded outward, or it could have led to unfavorable consequences for the rest of the inner universe. Draco released his shield and waved his hands. A gush of energy swept through the entire palace, restoring everything to its former state and returning the whole place to a state of perfection. As for Eva, she checked the details of her sunseed. Sunseed, fusion item, tier 1, rank, divine, durability, max effects, passive 1, energy generation. Your inner sun constantly spins and combusts to generate endless heat and light energy for you. No matter your mana or stamina stats, you will always be able to use techniques and skills related to these two elements. Passive 2. Power Boost. The fundamental nature of the heat and light energy used in your skills and techniques has been replaced by what is produced by the inner sun, increasing the effectiveness of both elements by 10,000%. Active 1. Sunder Press. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. When it rises, it sunders the horizon with its might, and when it sets, it suppresses the horizon with its power. All enemies with a zone of your designation will either go through the effect of being sundered or being suppressed. Duration, variable. Cooldown, variable. Active 2. Rays. The heat of the sun can only be borne by special fire species like the sun crow, the phoenix, etc., any other species subjected to its heat would be turned into ash without a chance to fight back. Summon your inner sun out into the real world and allow its explosive heat to sweep through the battlefield. Duration, variable. Cooldown, variable. Note, at tier 1, only passive 1 and 2 are usable and their effectiveness is limited to 1% of their full output. Description, a young sun that is currently in its growth phase within a divine being with the heat and light domains. Even though it is still in its infancy, it boasts a great chance of growth and amazing compatibility with its host, allowing it to manifest abilities that are beyond what most could acquire. Her power had grown by a significant amount with this rise in tier. For one, it now granted her the benefit of the second passive. The first passive only allowed Eva to have limitless fire and light energy for skills and especially techniques. However, it was still limited by a fraction of its full amount which in this case was 1%. Previously, it had been 0.1%, which was barely anything. At that time, it had basically meant Eva could have a lot of heat and light energy at her disposal. Well, 0.1% of infinity was still infinity, but in this case, the AI had made it so that Eva could only use it in a trickle, instead of like a surging river that never stopped. It was as if that surging river had 99.9% .9 of its width dammed up. Now that it got Inkri, Asad to 1%, Eva truly perceived the difference. She now felt like the energy within her could never expire, yet the vast majority of the power was still sealed. Eva began to understand why Suna might have become a sun goddess, and that this sun seed was only slightly weaker than the Etzheim seedling and the seed of Yggdrasil put together. Of course, compared to the universe seedling, it was still greatly lacking. However, the sun seed was perfectly suited for her, and it wasn't a competition between the two soulmates. Now that she had access to the second passive, Eva felt like the light energy that her bloodline produced had also changed somehow. She casually created a ball of light that hovered above her palm, but Draco suddenly cried out and teleported away with the resources around him. He appeared at the other end of the room with a destruction barrier around him his eyes inflamed and bleeding, while most of his skin was charred and red like he had a serious rash. Eva hurriedly dispelled the light and rushed over. 
Draco smiled bitterly and cast a healing spell on himself before letting Eva check up on him, fussing over him until she sighed with relief. Draco, what happened? She asked with confusion. Draco scratched his head. Well, your light used to be pure energy with properties like cleansing, disintegration, and sharpness. Now, you've got the added benefit of intense ultraviolet radiation, which was what did me in. Eva was shocked by this. Even as a reincarnation of Amaterasu, she had been unable to make her light energy adopt the traits of the sun's various waves, such as ultraviolet ones, because she hadn't known how. As the sun goddess, Amaterasu would definitely have such a capability. Eva lacked this because of various reasons, most of which had to do with how her subhuman genes limited her. In truth, she would have acquired this ability in time, after she reached rank 4 and beyond, since the goal of those rank-ups class-wise and bloodline-wise would be to help Draco and Eva achieve full control of their capabilities. Now that it had come early like this, it was definitely a great boost to her power. What she and Draco did not expect was that its intensity would be so high. Draco, who had been opposite her and was not even targeted, had been significantly injured by just a ball of light. If it had been a beam fired at him, what would have happened? According to the Sunseed's details, she only got 1% of passive 2's boost, which should translate to a mere 100% increase. This would definitely make Eva stronger, but not enough that it could even hurt Draco so much. This seeming riddle made Draco adopt a strange expression as he gazed at Eva. However, the Celestial Maiden simply smiled and clarified it for him. It's a modifier for my light energy, right? Don't forget that almost all my items give me modifiers for that too. Draco's face changed to a look of understanding, slapping his forehead like he was an idiot. Eva showed him the various items that boosted her light energy effectiveness and by how much. The first two were from the Lightfire Mystic Flame. Passive 1, Purification, cleanse all darkness and evil in the world. Every light or fire-based skill, spell or technique will deal 2,000% more damage to evil beings. Passive 2, Light's Might, Light and fire-based skills, spells, or techniques deal 700% more damage. There was also the Eye of Heaven, which had been her first epic item, which was now legendary. Passive 1, Light Amplification, Light-based skills and techniques are boosted by 500%. And finally, her Celestial Prime class passive. Might of Light, Rank 3, Passive Skill Effect. All attacks are infused with the cleansing and edifying property of light, boosting damage by 2,000%. This meant that, in total, and not counting the Lightfire's first passive that only worked on evil beings, Eva received a 3-200% boost to her light energy's power, not even adding the 100% that was coming from the Sunseed's second passive. Since the fundamental nature of her light and fire energy had been swapped by the Sunseed, it meant that this specific energy was boosted by that amount. In other words, the passive would eventually grant her a 10,000% boost to her light and fire energy's power, right? Well, since Eva had an external 3200% boost, it was as if she had already unlocked one-third of that passive's power, not just one one-hundredth. She theorized that this was equivalent to the power she would have only received at Tier 4 and above normally. With the upgrade done, everything settled down. Draco made sure to check with Eva on what the next tier's resources requirements were, and he was told that she needed to reach rank 2 and provide a list of legendary resources. Seeing that the Sun Seed had a rank requirement surprised Draco, since his Universe Seedling did not. In fact, as long as Draco could keep pumping it up, it would keep getting better and better. Whatever the case, Eva had already met the rank requirement. Unfortunately, the resources required differed from the previous tier. Had it been the same ones, he could have easily created them thanks to refinement. Draco briefly looked through and noted that the tower had them all. He could redeem them right away if Eva so wished. After all, his total spendable score points had reached 328,437 after he had cleared the first 10 floors, as well as what he had been given as righteous compensation from those lackeys who had dared to harm him. Eva, though, wasn't in any rush. His better half also did not want to ruin Draco's efficient plan of harvesting what he could through trade 
so he could replicate them later on the main plane to expand Umbra and Vita Kingdom. Besides, she needed time to acclimatize to this new power first. It wouldn't do for her to use her light techniques and end up harming all her allies because she couldn't control the emittance of ultraviolet rays. She had to find a way to compress those rays within the light energy she summoned, or even weaponize it specifically. Agreeing with this, Draco quickly headed out and tweaked the shop's interface to list the new items they needed. Once done, he realized he was no longer as pressed for time and spent the next few days storing the composition of various items in mind while enjoying time with his family that was growing bigger by the day. Rosella especially enjoyed the opportunity to lie in her father's arms. Whenever Draco was around, she seemed to have a shy and respectful expression on her infantile face, which made Roma laugh. After all, her daughter usually wore a stoic and calm face due to her Ultima Sunt bloodline, which made his firstborn daughter a genius. Roma didn't mind as that was how her own mother used to be, and Rosella was supposed to be like that. Rather, it was Roma who had been the anomaly, being so kind-hearted and gentle, which clashed with her mystic arts. It was the reason why, despite being an adult when Draco found her, Roma hadn't progressed far. Her father spoiling her seemingly made her remember that she was still a little girl, and not wanting him to go away, she would act clingy. Roma was pleased with this contrast. She didn't want her daughter to be too rigid, rather being able to fluidly change her nature to fit the situation. As for Loki, that little devil, he would sniff arrogantly whenever Draco came to pay him a visit and turn away. He would then act cute and end up in the arms of one of the various mothers, rubbing his vile little head on their chests while giving his dad a provocative look. If it wasn't for Zane, pampering the boy and protecting him like a fierce lioness, Draco would have long since spanked some dignity into the boy. Eventually, he schemed a plot with the other two stooges and managed to capture the boy alone. Loki realized he had been backed into a corner and would finally pay for his crimes, so he displayed a vicious expression and floated up into the air with a blue outline surrounding his body. He then tried to use telekinesis on Draco, but his father also glowed with a blue outline and waved away his son's feeble resistance. His thirst for vengeance on the boy was replaced by curiosity. Boy, quickly explain how you managed to learn transvection and telekinesis so quickly and this father might let you go. Draco warned with a stern expression. Although not as intelligent as his older half-sister, he had inherited his mother's smarts which were further enhanced by a bits of Ultima Sunt bloodline, allowing him to understand his parent. However, rather than repent, the little fellow became furious and tried to expand his power, yet he was soon exhausted and floated to the ground, where Draco picked him up casually. Loki was worried that his weakness would see him free to be maligned by his evil pops, but Draco just flicked the lad's nose and smiled with amusement. Brat, stop looking at me like an executioner. I am your father, and you are my beloved son. How could I bear to hurt you? Loki settled down in his father's arms and looked away, his tanned face colored red. Draco simply laughed at the silliness of his oldest son and brought him back to his mother who had been fretting. When she took Loki back, she gazed at Draco with hostility and questioned him fiercely. Draco simply folded his arms and pointed to Zane. Hmph, ever since he was born, you have forgotten that you love me and only give him your love. Am I no longer your husband? Hearing this, Zane felt guilty. She was a crazy mom precisely because Loki was the first son of Draco, embodying her absolute love for her husband as well as the continuation of her line. As such, she put their son in his bedroom within her nightmare castle and brought Draco to her room. Loki rolled his eyes after what Draco had said, regretting that he couldn't speak so he could tell his mother that she was being deceived by this crook. However, how was it possible for Draco to outsmart the succubus? Still sometimes, it didn't hurt to play the fool. A while later, the small boy saw his dad come out looking incomparably refreshed. He then gazed at the boy with a provocative look and hint of disdain, which made the fellow furious, but he couldn't do anything as he had already exhausted his mental stamina earlier. Draco then strutted out like a proud peacock, his nose so high that the sky had to bend itself to make way. 
Loki only watched helplessly and sighed internally, remarking that there was a reason why his dad was his dad. Too strong. Loki then wondered why his mother wasn't coming out, but then became sleepy as he began to doze off. It was a good thing, because if he entered Zane's room right now, he would only see a wrecked area covered in vestiges of white. One could barely make a slumped-over body covered in white on the ruined bed in the center of the room. Digging Zane out of that would probably be a task akin to rescuing people from a collapsed building. After dealing with Zane and reminding the succubus who was the boss, Draco checked up on Hikari. She had placed their two eggs beside her bed, in special incubators Draco had made that should shorten the amount of time they would need to hatch, as well as grant them optimal conditions for hatching. Hikari was usually accompanied by Rila, as she was lonely, and so too was the little tot. However, Draco felt bad for the origin goddess, because once the eggs hatched, Hikari would be focused on raising her children, no longer having the time to replace the mother, Rila didn't have. After all, Draco was merely her surrogate father because he had acquired the eyes of Kalo. She was, in truth, Kalo's daughter with a goddess he knew nothing about. However, contacting Kalo was impossible since from the way he spoke, he wasn't even in their universe. In fact, the version Draco met when trying for the Paragon of Destruction class had been recreated by the AI based on the real Celo, who somehow ended up in its database. The fellow had been so powerful that from countless universes away, he was somehow able to sense this incarnation and descend into it, meeting Draco. He had even punished the AI for daring to replicate him without permission. D. Draco couldn't help but wonder what Kalo would do if he found that the AI had replicated his daughter as well, assuming the real Rila existed. Draco couldn't help but shudder and smack his lips. If he saw a copy of Rosella hugging another man like he was her dad, he would probably enter his general aspect form and destroy everything within sight. So it was best that Kalo didn't find out about this. Be that as it may, Draco now spent some time with the two eggs, which were long overdue. Using this opportunity, he made sure to check to see his future dragon descendants to see how long he would have to wait to meet them in person. Dragon's Egg, Offspring Description This egg contains the offspring of a supreme rank black dragon and a supreme rank white dragon. The offspring furthermore possesses a sparse amount of Ultima Sunt genes. Lastly, there is an almost negligible amount of human bloodline. As such, the final status of the offspring cannot be calculated. Time left till hatching, 424 days. Dragon's Egg, Offspring Description. This egg contains the offspring of a supreme rank black dragon and a supreme rank white dragon. The offspring furthermore possesses a normal amount of dragon genes, while there is an almost overwhelming amount of human bloodline. As such, the final status of the offspring cannot be calculated. Time left till hatching, 525 days. Chapter 577. There are two paths to success, one pink and one brown. It seemed like they still had over a year to go before they could come out, which was fine. They would hatch slightly before Eva gave birth, meaning that his core family would come into fruition soon. Draco had decided to stop taking more concubines or the like. The goddess descendants would be his last batch of them, and even they were taken out of habit rather than any real desire. After all, Draco was still only a single fellow. He had everything he wanted with Ava, Roma, Zane, and Hikari. No offense to any of the other concubines, but sex with any of his four beauties felt far better than anything else he had ever had. They were simply in a different league. Roma had a vagina that could automatically move and contract on its own, feeling like he placed his dick in a bed of soft feelers. She didn't have control over them, and they worked automatically to make her partner experience an intense pleasure for quick ejaculation. Not to mention that Roma had her flexibility, which allowed her to practically bend her into any position Draco wanted. Hikari was a bit more normal in this regard, but she had a certain feel that intoxicated Draco. It was mostly from his feelings of domination as a black dragon, as Hikari became incomparably submissive during sex, like she'd allow anything to happen to her as long as he was satisfied. The interesting part was that she would enjoy it too as part of her instincts as a white dragon. Draco naturally was not a S, 
so he didn't abuse her at all, which was one of the reasons why his relationship with Hikari was so good compared to other black dragons with their white dragon counterparts. Hikari also had a body that was just one smidgen of an inch below Zane in terms of sexiness, with two E-cups and an SSS plus grade booty. She also had beauty that was just a smidgen of an inch below Eva when not adding Eva's Celestial Maiden Inheritance's effects. To top of off, Hikari had a soft, gentle, and innocent personality, which riled one up with the vile intention to defile and degrade her. Then there was Zane. Who boy, where to even begin with this one? Zane was a royal devil with a succubus subrace. Like the nymphs, she was naturally in possession of charms and abilities that made her a sex goddess. Her skills and abilities were ingrained in her bloodline, not needing a conscious thought. A normal male could not dare to be with a royal devil like her, as she would suck you dry and you would die in the throes of pleasure. Yes, it was definitely possible to die from overstimulation, no matter how positive it might be. Draco still remembered his second time having sex with Zane. The first time, she had simply done things normally, making it feel good but not too extravagant because she had been worried Draco would not be able to handle it. Truthfully, the him back then definitely would have croaked happily. However, when she seduced him in the Rank 7 castle near the end of his training with Richmond, she had already observed him for a while and knew that he had the bloodline of a black dragon, supreme demon, and supreme devil. At the time, she had been greedy for his sperm so she could give birth to the strongest offspring and use the child to raise her ranks in her family. It was during intercourse with Draco, who turned into his horned demon true body, that the unruly and ambitious Zane was initially tamed. Draco still shuddered at the thought. Had he not taken on that form, Zane would have milked him to death and he would have been disgraced greatly. Luckily, he had the foresight to transform, giving him the upper hand in that battle. Zane possessed a fully mobile vagina, something she could consciously and unconsciously control. This allowed her to maneuver her innards in a way that would bring any man to ejaculation whenever she wanted, regardless of how tough the fellow thought he was or how much sexual stamina he thought he had. Of course, this had the effect of making her extra sensitive during sex, more so than any other. This was true for all succubi, royal or not. After all, sex was their way to sustain themselves, and eating should feel good. The myth that succubi had so much sex that they practically felt nothing during it was a joke. While you were shooting blanks and on the verge of death, she was in a plane of her own, experiencing orgasms that would likely short-circuit the mind of non-sex-based species. Draco, as a horned demon, conversely possessed infinite sexual stamina and a controllable orgasm. No matter how hard someone rode him, he would only spray the goods when he decided to. However, that too had downsides. Due to the horned demon's craving for pleasure and to break the minds of their female partners, he had permanently fresh sensitivity. In other words, he would never get sore from long periods of sex and every stroke felt like the first one, with no numbness or repetitivity leading to boredom during sex. Zane also could never get sore nor tired sexually, so their stalemate had been a battle of wills, and the lazy and inexperienced Zane had been beaten. Inexperienced in the sense that before Draco, she had never bothered to have sex because she didn't see the need to. She was a royal devil, so like just now in the inner universe or the time she stepped into Vita City State the first time, she could directly absorb energy from the air. Her first time had been with Draco back then, but Succubi did not have a physical hymen, but a spiritual one. That was why it was called true virginity. You could have sex with a succubus, but never take her virginity. That one was reserved for the one partner she would choose to stay with until the end. When that happened, just like with Zane, they would be unable to gain sustenance from another male. So you basically had won yourself a devoted succubus wife. The rest of your days would be filled with pleasure beyond what you could understand. And then there was the almighty Eva herself. Sex with Eva was the most normal of them, as she had no freaky vaginal biology nor racial quirks. However, it was the most fulfilling for Draco because his bloodline, body, and soul would metaphorically merge with Eva, giving him a kind of satisfaction 
that transcended just ramming his hips into any hole before him. Eva also knew all of Draco's soft spots and weaknesses. After all, they had both shared their first times in Boundless during the tenure of their relationship, though it had been impossible to do so in the real world back then due to obvious reasons. It was only after the whole debacle with Shangtian that Draco ended up in the vile clutches of Maria of the Cartel, who took his IRL virginity and absorbed his vital yang, which gave her immense power and vitality, hooking her on to the unfortunate Draco. She had then used him extensively, often milking him at least three times a day. If anything had built up his sexual stamina without his bloodline active, it had been Maria's craze for his semen. When he was finally powerful enough to escape her clutches, he abstained for a long while till Rena got abused in public and her reputation got ruined. The two had ended up finding solace in each other, something which had actually bothered Eva for the longest time. Draco was always speechless when he thought about the previous timeline. It felt like the theme of that timeline had been, whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. Every single person around him had experienced a bad end of sorts, most of their lives miserable and filled with hate. Shani had been abused and killed in the real world because of his enemies in the cartel. That had led to Boyd's personality turning ruthless and cold, filled with rage all the time. He had been more of a berserker than he was now. Because Draco had found him early, he had not yet offended the party who would kill Shani, and he had been able to gather funds to propose to her. Now, she was even pregnant with his child and was moving into the grounds of the Rank 7 castle soon. She had even already given birth in that e-game, which left Draco speechless since the semantics of having a digital baby and a real baby with a woman was lost on him. Uno had never fallen in love per se back then, as his only love had been for combat. Rather, he had been unceremoniously crippled from the neck downward, turned into a paraplegic by an enemy while he was in a fight. Draco had then gotten him a pod so Uno could continue to be the godless paladin in Boundless, but his previously colorful world had become gray and bleak once more. He had been living life through the motions, and only within Boundless had he been able to find some amount of joy. He had never logged out of the game after that, completely giving up on reality. If someone had offered him a deal to upload his mind to Boundless permanently, he would have likely done so in a heartbeat. Kieran, as far as Draco knew, had been one of his most mysterious and cryptic general back then. He hadn't known much about the fellow, aside that he had possessed the most strength of the five back then, even being a fighter whose power, power was unbeaten in reality despite not having control. As for why he had even ended up in the cartel, Draco still didn't know. It was only through Eva that he found out that the fellow was likely from the Buddha lineage. Although this technically made him their enemy, neither of them could be bothered to be wary of him. No matter how strong Kieran was, he was leagues beneath them both in boundless and reality. Besides, the fellow had little to do with his clan anymore, especially in this timeline, as far as the white-haired duo were aware. Then there was Cobra, who had eventually murdered his own sister and then his parents in cold blood. The him of that timeline had been broken mentally, becoming a sick murderous and sadistic bastard that would make anyone's hackles rise. He had reveled in torturing his enemies brutally before death and only feared Draco, who was basically the only who could keep him in check. It was only recently that this timeline's Cobra had confessed to coming from an aristocratic family of assassins in the real world, as well as the trauma he had suffered from Young by being sexually abused by his sister, which led to him developing a mental block against women. Cobra wasn't gay because he liked guys, but rather because he simply could not find any attraction towards a woman. Understanding Cobra's plight as he had faced the same thing under Maria, Draco sympathized. It was also why he had little to no interaction with Bella, despite Cobra begging him to tame his sister and take her away. Bella herself was a beauty that was above all his concubines in terms of quality and just below his four beauties. She would have been a perfect buffer for the two groups, especially since she was Eva's protege, but Draco didn't like her much. Even Riveting Knight had agreed with this train of thought back then, but Draco refused, so Eva dropped it. 
She couldn't exactly force women down her soulmate's throat, now could she? The theme of the current timeline, in contrast, was rather everything that can go right will go right. They had enjoyed absolute supremacy since being reborn. The conflict between the duo had been resolved, Draco's bloodline unlocked, their guild Umbra had become a powerhouse, gaining the four beauties, the inner universe, his affiliation with the AI, and its creator, Supernatural, and more. Draco calmly considered all this while caressing Hikari's two mounds, all while the lovely dragoness was blushing and moaning. Naturally, Rila had long been evicted into the park using some flimsy excuses so that Draco could lay waste to his new target. Sigh, just thinking about how a gentle and innocent beauty like Hikari would be soiled by this vile and despicable fellow really broke one's heart. Still though, how did this bottle of lube and box of tissues end up in my hands? Draco made sure to give Hikari a good bit of foreplay. The white dragoness had slowly confessed to being into butt stuff. So Draco stuck a finger in his mouth, lubricated it well, L, and then pierced the path of darkness. Hikari trembled and moaned loudly, shaking her thick butt left and right, squirming with a bit of discomfort and desire. Draco pushed further in slowly, savoring how warm and tight it was. He then pulled his finger back and began fingering her butthole, wiggling his index left and right, much to the enjoyment of Hikari, who was beginning to make weird sounds. As her current position put her ass up and all in Draco's face, he sent his tongue down to the path of justice before giving her a good lick. Draco smacked her butt with his free hand, then began playing with her clitoris lightly. The stimulation from tongue, clit, and butt quickly overwhelmed the inexperienced white dragoness as she climaxed in less than five minutes of intense stimulation. He saw her panting while still locked in such a sexy position and rubbed his chin. Draco then made sure to get a good taste of her juices before rising up. In truth, eating out any of his four beauties was more pleasurable for him than them due to how nice they tasted. Well, Hikari, do you want the usual, or do you want to try something new today? Draco asked with a playful smile. Hikari, who was coming down from her orgasm, trembled when she understood what Draco was talking about. However, just as stated before, a white dragoness could not say no to her black dragon mate. Hikari buried her face in the sheets and stuck her ass up further, puckering her pinkish asshole attractively. Draco raised an eyebrow as it was hard to fathom Hikari could be so naughty, but damn was it alluring. How could Draco tolerate such provocation? He naturally receded his armor and revealed his bare body. However, he didn't stop there, transforming into his horned demon true body. However, he made sure to switch off his nine hells as it drained too much bloodline energy while just being passive. With it on, he could only remain transformed for a short while, but without it, he could remain like this for more than an hour. Draco naturally had wicked thoughts in mind from transforming like this. Hikari's first time doing anal had to be memorable, and what better way than the demon form with infinite stamina? Once he transformed, his already sizable member grew swollen, with veins popping all over like worms wriggling under his skin. The size of his glands alone had almost doubled, so forget putting it in the butt, even the usual route would be a hurdle for normal girls. Unfortunately, Hikari was a white dragon, a being with the highest defense and resilience. Even when nerfed by the tower, her natural toughness could not be suppressed, much less when she was hale and hardy. As such, Draco placed the tip of his dick against her entrance, and Hikari's buried head whipped up with an expression of horror. The size of what she was feeling slowly pressing into her was too much. If that thing went any further, she could die. However, Draco did not stop. He suddenly distracted Hikari by slapping both of her butt cheeks hard, and while she was focused on the sensation, he thrust his penis all the way in. Hikari clutched the sheets and froze like that. Her entire body trembled, but Draco was forced to moan when he felt the walls of her ass clamp down on the intruder repeatedly, as if trying to squeeze him out. Instead of doing that, it rubbed on his rock-hard member and squeezed it. Hikari also cried out lowly as she felt her ass widen due to her inadvertent reaction. Because of it, the shape of Draco's penis began to familiarize itself, and her contractions weakened considerably. Hikari slumped onto the bed as a shower of white spurted from her vagina, 
the white dragoness twitching helplessly. Draco was shocked by this, as he had underestimated Hikari's sensitivity and compatibility with anal. However, understanding that she was not feeling the first-time pain, but rather pleasure, or that the pain might be pleasure for her, Draco smiled wickedly and began thrusting slowly. Hikari still maintained a slumped-over position, which had the effect of in creasing the arc of her back. This allowed Draco to see exactly how his member was pushing in and out of her tiny hole that was now widened. He could only comment internally that it looked like stuffing a baseball bat into an elastic test tube. Though a bit of an exaggeration, this was the closest thing Draco could think of. Draco was not about to let Hikari fade into the world of euphoria just yet, as her mind was clearly becoming numb. After all, she was not like Zane who could easily keep up with his form's powers. As such, Draco clamped his hands onto both of her butt cheeks as she suddenly increased his tempo to piston-like speeds, which jolted the weak Hikari back into awareness. She could only hold the sheets as the bed rocked back and forth violently, as if it would shatter the next moment. Hikari was praying to all the gods that she knew that she would survive this day. She had no idea that Zane had made a similar prayer just a few hours ago, but what had been her fate? buried under a sea of cum. Author's note. Sigh. At the end of the day, every banquet must come to an end. The past few weeks, I have generally been enjoying life, meeting friends, going out, and generally living life in order to relax. Even that crummy editor Devils is out on a honeymoon of sorts. But it isn't, and wasn't meant to last forever. Starting next month, Guild Wars and Darius Supreme will resume regular daily updates as I settle back into neat life. To prove this, I will be participating in the event I hate most, Win-Win. Chapter 578, Spread the Juice of Life for Healthy Skin. Hikari was soon drained of any form of resistance, as she could only moan weakly, losing control of her bladder as Draco pounded her roughly. The fellow was truly experiencing bliss in his horned demon form that made every thrust feel like it was the first one. With his state, he could choose when to come, so there was no way he would be blasting it out in mere minutes. This led to a situation where Hikari got brutally railed for almost a quarter of an hour, and it didn't look like Draco was satisfied with just that. In truth, he would have stopped a little earlier and unceremoniously sprayed his lovely white dragoness with his semen but he noticed that she was in a serious trance. In this state, the creation energy in her body was excited, moving through her rapidly with every thrust he made. This did not make her more powerful, nor did it grant her any tangible benefits from what he could see. But Draco noticed that his own destruction energy was beginning to circulate in response, despite him currently being in his horned demon true body. Despite not doing anything other than to accelerate his circulation, Draco kept pounding her because it reminded him of the time his and Eva's bloodline sources mixed when they first had intercourse in the real world. Lucifer and Amaterasu had left behind a means for their bloodlines to perfectly integrate and upgrade each other, so all they had to do was receive it. Yet with Hikari, there was no such automation, so the two dragons would have to manage the exchange on their own if there was to be any. However, the sensations of Hikari's anal tract made it hard for him to focus on anything other than his personal carnal pleasure. He could not just turn off this sensation with control, since it was far weaker than his bloodline in similitude. To give a comparison, it was like trying to stop a tsunami by building a powerful dam. No dam in this world could stop a tsunami. At best, it could weaken the initial force, but it would not reduce the volume of water. Draco was also moaning just like Hikari as he shook his hips back and forth. He had a slight grimness on his face as the sensations had intensified to the point where it felt like he was about to climax. It was the most intense part of sex when the climax was incoming, yet his racial feature trapped him in that loop. His human mind had been overcome and was already past the point of ejaculation, but his bloodline allowed him to keep it in. This stalemate left Draco drooling a bit as his mind was becoming clouded. The room was effused with the scent of lust and the sounds of skin slapping against each other would make any listener feel extremely aroused. Eventually, Draco couldn't hold it in anymore as he was mentally overwhelmed. 
so he grabbed both of Hikari's thick white butt cheeks and squeezed them hard. The feeling was similar to kneading soft dough, and the experience was something he would literally kill for. Just like that, Draco pushed his dick into the deepest part of her he could reach before releasing the spray. Since he had been holding back, and this was his first shot in this session, it burst out in a thick volume. Hikari shivered as she felt that tyrannical sperm flow through her insides, like a mixture of lukewarm lava and a smidgen of electrolyte as it buzzed her canal. This kind of intense stimulation so deep inside her body yielded predictable effects. She experienced her fifth climax. Draco slowly pulled out, allowing a thick volume of semen to splosh out of Hikari like a fountain, stain, staining the bed white. The poor white dragoness had her eyes rolled up into the top of her head and her tongue rolling to the side as this all happened while she was still in the midst of an orgasm. Draco panted, not from physical fatigue, but a mental one due to the intense stimulation. His dick was still rock hard, partly coated in his own juices, as well as a bit of colorless mucus that the large intestine produced to lubricate itself at all times. See, Eng as Hikari was buzzed out completely after one round, Draco simply laughed and cast a cleansing spell on each of them. He then cast a sleeping spell on Hikari, allowing the exhausted girl to fall into a restful slumber after a good sexual stimulation. The wide and lovely smile on her face displayed how satisfied she was, which pleased Draco. As for him, one round was naturally not enough, so he displayed a cruel expression and teleported into the middle of a bog. On a small island in the middle of a swampy river, a sizable cottage with a chimney was set. It was neat and pristine, which contrasted the stinky and creepy surroundings. Draco wrinkled his nose and had to marvel at the tastes of his beloved witch. He then neared the cottage, but stopped when he heard some shrill cackling. His whole body shivered with fear as the area became dark. He saw some flashing green lights in the windows of the cottage, then gulped. Draco walked up to the door and pushed it open slightly to see what was going on. Behind it, Roma was dancing around a large cauldron that was bubbling with some green liquid. The things floating in that liquid were enough to chill the hardiest of people. Roma sang in a shrill and malicious voice as she continually wove around the cauldron and threw in various ingredients from jars, most of them parts of various living beings. Finally, she ejected a soul from her witch's bracelet, which she then thrust into the cauldron, all the while as it screamed and begged for mercy. Roma seemed to relish the sounds and took a ladle, mixing the brew while she'll chanting and singing in the mystic language. The soul's screams of torment became worse and worse, sounding like the wailing of the damned. Draco watched it dissolve into the brew, its entire essence being captured within and dissolved. Whoever that fellow was, he no longer existed and will no longer exist. After doling out this cruel fate, Roma covered the lid of her cauldron and sighed with a bit of fatigue. Then, with a look of surprise, she turned around to see Draco, who was still peeking in with a strange expression. Roma blushed and hide the cauldron behind her. Erm, um, Draco, about that? I know it's a bit weird, but when I get into the mystic arts, I... Roma began explaining ashamedly, but felt her words catch in her throat as Draco walked into the cabin fully, with a tent in his pants. Draco looked down and blushed, which led Roma to understand that instead of being put off by her cruel nature, he was rather extremely turned on. The feeling of your greatest insecurity being your loved one's fetish was... Roma couldn't even describe the feeling. Draco then looked around cautiously and asked, Where is my cute daughter? Roma smiled and walked over to hug Draco gently. She's asleep right now. Do you want to see her? Draco smiled playfully. No, it's good that she's asleep. After all, the one I came to see was you. Roma blushed as she wrapped her arms around Draco's torso, pressing her soft breasts against his body. She knew exactly what he meant and found herself also interested in having some fun, so she pulled her beloved Sot into her bedroom and closed the door behind her. Once there, Roma brought Draco to her bed and let him sit down. She then got to her knees on the soft carpet, spreading his legs wide as she gazed at the outline of his dick. Draco chuckled and receded his cloth armor, once again returning to nakedness. Roma marveled at the size of his cock, as well its girthness. 
Just like how a man would never get tired of seeing his wife's lovely tits, Roma never got tired of seeing Draco's penis. It was just perfect for her. She took a deep sniff of it, sighing with pleasure at the manly musk it exuded. She then used her right hand to grip the base lightly, stroking Draco's rod using the flesh of her palm rather than squeezing it up and down. Draco nodded, as Roma showed her experience in this regard. She had started out as a sexually inept and clueless maiden requiring him to teach her, but now she had acclimated and become a gran, D-master of cock, specifically his. Roma displayed this talent further by licking Draco's glands slowly while using her hand to stroke the shaft. Roma had an intoxicated expression as she did so, as if she was tasting the world's finest candy on a stick. Roma didn't just use the tip of her tongue but the full length of it. Her idle hand grabbed his balls and began massaging them softly and slowly, adding to the sensual cacophony of Roma's endeavor. Roma continued doing this slowly while Draco caressed her hair gently. He didn't take on his horn demon state just yet, as he wanted to experience this in his normal form for obvious reasons. Eventually, Roma's coiling tongue wrapped around his glands and began to move up and down. Her lips came next, as she swallowed the full length of Draco's dick in one gulp. Roma's eyes slightly rolled into the back of her head as his cock pushed deep into her mouth and partly entered her throat. Draco also marveled at Roma's complete lack of a gag reflex. He was completely sure that at least two inches of his tip was pushing down her throat itself, but she didn't react at all. Rather, Roma came back from her mini-orgasm and began sucking his rod with even more fervor. Her head bobbed up and down as her mouth clung to the shape of his rod tightly, not willing to let even an inch go. Draco raised his head up and closed his eyes as he reveled in the pleasure. The thing about Roma was that she was unique in the way she handled foreplay towards Draco. Zane, Hikari, and Eva mostly pleasured him with the intention of satisfying him, pleasing him, and making him enjoy himself. They were selfless in that regard. Roma, though, handled foreplay with the intention of pleasuring herself. In other words, she wasn't doing it to please Draco per se, but to please herself through pleasing Draco. It was mostly selfish. To compare, Zane would suck Draco off while watching his reactions to see what got him going and focus on that so that he would come, then enjoy the sound of him moaning and that look of euphoria on his face. Roma, though, was sucking Draco off because she just loved the taste of his cock and got off on it. She wasn't particularly paying attention to Draco, rather sucking his cock with a single-minded focus like it was the most precious thing to her. She wanted Draco to come so she could feel his burning hot, tyrannical semen gushing down her throat and into her stomach so she could also climax from it. Truly, being treated not like a king, but like a cow that was to be milked was a different feeling for Draco, especially in this way. Draco had to raise his head and stifle his moans because of his own pride. But it was an intense feeling. Luckily for Roma, even without his horned demon true body, Draco's sexual stamina was still strong and he was able to allow her to enjoy her act for a few minutes before she managed to overcome his natural resistance. When Roma felt his cock pulsing and ready to come, she intentionally sucked him to the base, making sure that the entire head of his penis was pushed down her throat. As such, when Draco blasted out with his load, everything shot right down her gullet with force and entered her stomach straight away. Because of how powerful his ejaculation was, one could see Roma twitching with every shot as her throat visibly expanded in tandem with Draco's cock as it shot each thick load like a sniper. Roma's mouth also bulged in this regard. Her eyes firmly rolled back into her head from the stimulation of feeling Draco's semen gushing about her stomach, electrifying the entire organ. Draco slowly pulled his dick out, using Roma's tongue to clean it thoroughly before slapping both sides of her face with it. This seemed to wake her up a little, as Roma smiled towards Draco with a foolish expression, semen leaking down the side of her mouth. Draco laughed, and a blue glow surrounded his body, then covered Roma. The caramel-skinned beauty was lifted up into the air, floating right before her lover, with a look of surprise on her face. Then her cull, others were removed from her body systematically without a single finger being lifted. Draco then spun Roma around, allowing her torso to face him as he brought her vagina closer to his cock. 
I call this one the psycho-missionary position. Draco exclaimed heroically, as he suddenly plunged his cock deep into the floating Roma, who shrieked in pleasure from the sudden and forceful intrusion. That Draco could only tsk at the sight of how quickly his dick managed to smoothly enter her, since she was already wet as a river. Roma directly climaxed with her toes curled in the air, her vagina rapidly contracting and relaxing on his dick so heavily that it actually hurt a little. Once she came down from it, she began panting with misty eyes that begged Draco to continue, and so he did. Holding Roma firm with his mind and using his arms to hold her waist, Draco began moving his hips powerfully. He didn't bother with slow thrusts since he was here to bang his girl senseless. His every thrust into the gypsy pierced all the way to her cervix, bashing that point with fury which Roma loved, but most others would hate. Every time Draco pushed in, her legs would spread outward, and when he pulled back, they would contract and bend. Draco liked this position a little, especially since he could look at Roma's intoxicated and overwhelmed expression, as well as her round and firm breasts, bouncing up and down. He naturally grabbed them and began caressing them softly, kneading her nipples and pinching them with extreme care. Draco noticed that Roma's body was twisting like a snake, even though she was being held in midair. So he pulled back and turned her around. Seeing Roma's curvy and perky ass presented before him, Draco got even harder as he plunged himself right back into her tight and gaping vagina. Roma clenched his dick tightly as he did, her innards contacted as she climaxed from the sudden penetration once more. Draco didn't stop this time and kept thrusting even as she contracted, making her orgasm extend for a longer period. He slapped both of her thick-ass cheeks with each hand, going on until each side was red. Draco then pulled her arms back as he made her raise her legs and spread them wide. This allowed him to push deeper in this potion, almost breaching the safety barrier was her cervix. He moaned as the pleasure intensified for him. Draco felt like his dick was in heaven, as the feelers in Roma's vagina had latched on him and began caressing his members softly. The intense sensation was too much, especially since Roma was still carrying on with her extended orgasm. Draco felt the semen climb up his rod as he neared ejaculation, and because of that, the sensations further intensified with each thrust. Right then, he could only release a pathetic moan as he burst out once more, filling Roma up to the brim with semen. Draco shot out even more this time as he sent his final load for the day gushing into her, making Roma's stomach bloat a little. Roma herself was already barely semi-conscious, a foolish expression on her face as she moaned like someone who was a vegetable. Draco placed her on her bed with his mind and pulled out since there was no more space in her body to take his semen. He then sprayed the rest of it all over her body, coating Roma in a thin veil of white juice. Her vagina began sloshing as the volume of semen came out and poured all around her. Draco admired his work and took a picture using photo mode before laughing evilly. He then cast a cleansing spell on himself and regrew his armor before leaving Roma in a heap of cum, completely and utterly defeated. When he came out, he saw Rosella trotting around, trying to find ways to reach up to the cauldron so she could peek inside. Seeing his adorable daughter, Draco rushed up to grab her and began kissing her cheeks with love. Rosella laughed happily and used her little hands to hold her father's face. Draco simply admired his daughter's adorableness while feeling warm in his heart, knowing that he would break the world for this tiny thing. He then bro, uff Rosella over to the cauldron and opened it so she could peek inside. The young lass was utterly curious about it, yet Draco had only some foundational knowledge in the mystic arts thanks to his soul bond with Roma. Still, he shared what he could with his daughter. However, he soon realized that it was unnecessary as Rosella seemed to understand everything even better than him. The little girl eventually asked for her papa's help in adding some extra ingredients and began to stir the brew herself. Draco was moved to tears. His little princess was a genius. Chapter 579, Individual Tournament 8 The two energy waves collided in the center, exploding outward with a huge shockwave that forced those at the side to cover their faces. Panty King's sword wave was destroyed by Kieran's chi wave, which was like a compressed air cannon. 
It then proceeded to pierce through the torso of the mana swordsman before he could even react, ending his life in one shot. For a brief moment, the open hole in the middle of his body let one see through to the other side. And just like that, Panty King turned into pixels. Kieran then calmly retracted his outstretched fist, gazing at the spot where his enemy had died with a calm face, restraining his lineage's internal energy and noble energy. Eighth match winner, Gentle Lamb. The member of the five generals then hopped off the stage calmly and stood by the side with his arms folded behind him. He would have made for a handsome statue, were it not for Sublime Notion coming over and teasing him for taking this long. As for Panty King, he reappeared at the side as well, a wry smile on his face. At least their fight had made for a good show, and the Japanese were cheering loudly for him. Especially the ladies had enjoyed this match, as they had gotten to watch two handsome fellows duke it out. They had been so cool and suave during the battle that many had decided to become fans of one of the two on the spot. Some wild ladies even flashed the namesake of the losing panty of this fight, making the fellow's downcast demeanor lift instantly. The faces of all the members of Umbra became quite strange as Amber announced the next match. Ninth match, Rambunctious Butt Lover vs. Happy Scholar On the left, climbing up the stage, was a handsome fellow with light green hair that was cut short, ending just at the nape of his neck. He wore a light red archer hat with a white feather sticking out of it, like something Robin Hood would be caught wearing. His face was a mix of angular and oval, making him handsome in a less sharp and breathtaking way, like Draco, and more of a suave yet pretty way like Cobra. His eyes were a light brown, and his skin was cream-colored. His attire was essentially a mixture of blackish-green, open-buttoned leather armor, as well as some cloth armor at the joints. He had a belt with a flute and a harmonica within, while on his back was a lute that was strapped on. The ladies who had just come down from swooning were sent off into the realm of bliss once more, thanks to the nice eye candy, his username already subconsciously forgotten. On the right, Climbing up the stage was another well-mannered and refined gentleman who was quite attractive as well. He wore a magician's robe that was slim-fitting and a gentle blue in color. There were no designs or sigils on the robe, making it rather plain. In his hand was a blackish-red grimoire that was open at all times, radiating a thick miasma that looked ominous. His robe was one without a hood, allowing his long and silky black hair to fall down to his shoulders which had been tied into a long ponytail. His face was elfin in nature, very angular and long. His jaws were gaunt while his eyes were oval and curved downward. He looked like the pretty boys from a Bishunin, especially when he smiled in that gentle way of his. Author's note, Rambut basically looks like Matsuoka Rin from 50% off, while Happy Scholar was designed based off Sasaki Kojiro Assassin from the original FSN. When these two men, with drastically different kinds of attractiveness, appeared on stage, even some fellows had to clamp their legs shut and began to question their very existence. However, the members of Umbra had solemn expressions as they shuddered from the cruelty of the AI. It had paired two fellows who played the same trade, but in different mediums. Both of them were masters of language, relying on it to overcome their enemies, Rambut using his voice and music while Happy Scholar used runes and writing literally two sides of the same coin. If any of these two had been paired against another, they were it too. It would have a tough time dealing with their unique battle styles, but the AI had pitted them against each other. It wasn't to make things easier for the others, but simply because a battle between the two would be a grand spectacle, which would enhance the quality of the entire tournament. They had been feeling it since the very first few fights but the AI appeared to have set things up in a way to maximize the satisfaction of the viewers, even at the expense of contestants. It drove home how little the AI cared for them, treating every single player in the game as a chess piece for it to use as it wanted. It only gave preferential treatment to Draco and Eva, period. Everyone else was expandable, whether part of Umbra or not, and that was on full display for the core members of Umbra to see here. After allowing the audience some time to take some pictures, Amber called for the match to begin, and the two contestants went all out from the beginning. 
Rambunctious Buttlover began by activating all of his classes passive at once, which overlaid over each other and synergized to produce crazy effects that had brought him great success during the Abyss event, specifically, where he had managed to talk a void monster into committing suicide. Deceptive Words Passive Skill Effect Speak a string of lies and half-truths at all times, making all listeners subjectively feel like your words are pure truth. Sweet Talker Passive Skill Effect All enemies who listen to the speech of the user are slightly charmed, and their hostility reduces as they fall into a short daze. He strummed his lute and began singing a tune, which sent a gust of wind from his feet that swirled upward, while an arrow sign pointing upwards appeared above his head. Rare Tier Bard Skill Lyrical Lines Guild Local Area Announcement Player Rambunctious Buttlover has boosted his party's morale through music. The enemy is cowed by his lyrical might. All players, attack 50%, defense 70% speed plus 20%. All enemies, attack nice 50%, defense my 70% speed dice 20 cent. At the same time, Rambutt buffed himself and attempted to debuff Happy Scholar, yet this tournament had never been turn-based. While the Umber Core member had been busy, Lorebinder's guildmaster hadn't been idling around. Word of power, reflection. The word had been written in the air in a golden font and rushed out to strike Rambunctious's debuff, which was traversing over to Happy Scholar. This had the effect of negating the debuff that should have landed on Happy Scholar while also perfectly cancelling out the Battle Bard's previous buff, as the negative effects had been reflected back to him. Rambutt suffered no backlash, but this display of skills made the crowd shout in awe from the play. However, the core member was not bothered by this, instead he flashed a smile. He knew that every word or rune of Happy Scholar was only as effective as how much mana he had spent, and to reflect his skill couldn't have been cheap. Happy Scholar also knew this, which was why he wasn't thrilled about having gained the crowd's favor and rather frowned deeply. The use of consumables was prohibited, preventing him from drinking potions to refill his man. This first salvo had ended in his loss. However, he had no other choices as the lyrical line skill was too strong and he couldn't allow it to go through since it would tilt the battle too much in his opponent's favor. Rambunctious, though, was a cruel fellow and would not stop here. He began strumming his flute once more as he prepared to use the uncommon skill lyrical words, which wasn't even half as strong as its rare tier counterpart, but it was enough to cause Happy Scholar trouble. Rambutt gazed at Happy Scholar with a provocative look, daring him to reflect this one too, wasting ever more of his mana. Happy Scholar was rendered speechless by the fellow's shamelessness, but displayed a cruel expression the next moment. He then wrote a word in the grimoire and swiped it upwards to change up reality. Written word, silence. Immediately, there was a vague vacuum of sound in the area. Rambutt's face changed as he could no longer hear his own voice and clutched his throat. However, he could tell that his voice had not been affected, but rather that the area had been emptied of sound. This was the main difference between Happy Scholar's two main active skills. Word of Power was a targeted skill, meaning that it was meant to strike something or be directed at something. On the other hand, written word was more of an AOE skill meant to affect the surroundings over a person or specific thing. Rambunctious face became ugly once he realized that his class skills had been rendered useless. Even worse, Happy Scholar's own power was unaffected since he used writing as a medium. The one true weakness of a bard-related class had been laid bare in its full glory. From the favorite to win, Rambutt suddenly found himself on the ropes, and it looked like he would soon be defeated. In a real battle, the battle bard could just flee faced with such odds. Unfortunately for him, this was a tournament. Once he left the arena, it would count as him having forfeited the fight. The written words area encompassed the entire arena too. It could be seen that Happy Scholar was truly meticulously and ruthless. While the supporters of England were excitedly cheering and roaring at Happy Scholar to use this chance to finish off Rambutt, the new favorite had increased the distance and looked wary about the other's next move. This shocked onlookers, but when they gazed at the core members at the side who were watching on calmly as if they had expected his reaction, they knew there had to be more to it. That was indeed the case.
To silence such a large area and even affect a powerhouse like Rambut, Happy Scholar had invested every drop of his mana into that rune. Even if his active skills came off cooldown, he certainly could not use them again. Of course, like any class in Boundless, Happy Scholar was not limited to active skills. Otherwise, if all of them were on cooldown, was he supposed to stand there and watch as he was beaten to death? He too had a form of auto-attack, which consisted of using select runes to attack, defend, or support. Simple words like attack, block, shield, heal, and the like. However, as was the norm with auto-attacks, the damage and utility was next to nothing. Since Happy Scholar could use them without mana, they were necessary even if they were weak. Using an attack rune on Rambut would barely leave a cut on his skin, but he had nothing else on hand while he waited for his MP to regenerate. Seeing him resort to this, it became clear why Happy Scholar had given his opponent a wide berth instead of rushing in. The other reason was, of course, because Rambut was not just an average bard, but a legendary variant. His means of attack was not just limited to just his voice. This manifested itself in the sword he unsheathed from the handle of his loot, a thin, rapier-like blade with a pointy tip. He then flourished it playfully for a bit before walking over noiselessly towards Happy Scholar. He mouthed a phrase which Happy Scholar easily read to be, May the gods of booty favor you, friend, because I won't, which made the already silenced guildmaster even more speechless. However, he had little time to retort when Rambut suddenly burst forward with quick steps, trying to cover the distance between them. Happy scholars would never allow that and used his auto-attack runes to keep the fellow at bay. However, Rambut dodged each and every rune as they crashed at him, destroying parts of the arena that they collided with. Even though the auto-attack was weak, Happy Scholar was at rank 3. It would be weak if it hit Rambut, who was also rank 3, but against the environment or anyone below that rank, it was power that was befitting of a rank 3 powerhouse. Rambut kept closing the distance while running with his upper body bent forward and his sword held behind him. Happy Scholar skied and jumped back, beginning to move while throwing out auto-attack runes in an ihal effort to kite Rambut until his mana recovered enough to use a proper skill. The battle bard did not entertain the fellow, rather than dodging the runes, he blazed through them by cutting those that he came in contact with and shrugging off their further weakened effects. Happy Scholar paled when he saw Rambut appear before him like a loosened arrow, his held back rapier striking forward like a snake about to bite into the throat of its prey. He could only fumble to dodge and cast a shield rune at the same time. Rambut naturally shattered the shield in one hit and with ease, but it had bought enough time for Happy Scholar to make a piss-poor dodge roll that was completely ungraceful. He tried to extend the gap between them, but as someone who had invested all his stats in int, his speed would beat out the core member. Rambut had split his between dexterity for his melee combat and charisma for his bard skills, which was obviously why he was so fast and agile to dodge all those runes in the first place. Immediately, Rambut grabbed the fellow by his collar because Happy Scholar had inadvertently appeared near the edge of the arena and was about to fall off. He pulled him back, as falling off would be too much of an embarrassing end. After all, the Lorebinders Guild was still an affiliate of Umbra. As such, he tossed the fellow back onto the stage. Happy Scholar rolled on the ground back to his feet and opened his grimoire once more, getting ready to use what little mana he had to cast a skill and give himself some breathing room. However, he had to stop when he saw the tip of Rambut's rapier pressing against his Adam's apple. With a sigh, Happy Scholar closed his grimoire and bowed respectfully to Rambut, who reciprocated in kind. Amber took the cue to declare Rambut as the winner, and the silence that had been placed over the arena was dispelled as both contestants were sent off the stage. The crowd inevitably cheered for the battle, as regardless of who they were rooting for, both sides had given it their best. The girls who were in love with the elegant Happy Scholar were sad, but clapped with appreciation, while the ones who preferred the ruffian and vagabond-ish type hooted for Rambut, loving his shameless and unscrupulous nature. The core members on the side also clapped. Sublime even told Happy Scholar 
that he could select two free epic items that could assist with boosting his mana capacity and regeneration from the guild's coffers after the tournament. When Joker complained about favoritism, she rolled her eyes and gave him a promise that he could also do same. Despite having put her fangs in the pretty boy whose arm she was grabbing onto, she was just a girl as well, and had been put in a good mood after watching two beautiful men fight it out. Ninth Match Winner, Rambunctious Butt Lover The next match was another interesting one, because it was a slight mismatch. It featured a battle between two parties that were complete opposites in fighting style, nature, and class. Tenth match, Noble Soul vs. Slight Breeze. From the left came Noble Soul, who was a tall and buff fellow that looked like an MMA fighter. His face was perpetually locked into an expression of determination, as if the world was after his life and he would fight back as a one-man army without conceding. He wore a set of medium armor that was now custom-designed instead of the previous plain one as he had upgraded into an epic set. The armor set was a blood-red color, gleaming with a slight that made all onlookers shudder for an inexplicable reason. A huge greatsword was strapped across his back, almost half the size of the average human. He looked like one of those ridiculous anime protagonists wielding large swords, only that noble soul's demeanor added a layer of solemnity to it. His skin was reddish-yellow, and he had a thin mustache as well as a stubble on his chin. His light brown eyes burned with might, while his auburn hair, which was cut into a fade, was neatly combed into a straight stand. He flourished his great sword, oared when he came on stage and plunged its tip into the arena, shaking the entire place and cracking the area where he stood as he glared at his opponent with battle intent. On the other side, Slight Breeze actually turned out to be a tall woman with elfin features. Her face was soft and creamy, with a rosy hint to it. He had thick eyelashes covering his light green eyes, as well as a small nose and pinkish rosebud lips. Her light brown hair was tied into a normal bun, and apart from her soft smile that showed her gentle nature, there was nothing else remarkable about her. She wore a set of greenish-blue robes and wielding no staff that one could see. If we were talking about entrances, though, hers was no weaker than Noble Soul's. Not because it was eye-catching due to its loudness or fierceness, but its uniqueness and charm. Slight breeze was floating. She was like a graceful fairy that hovered onto the stage and posed elegantly while hovering in mid-air, a windy draft hovering below her feet that kept her airborne. It was different from how Eva levitated wherever she went. Eva did so in an imperious manner, like a goddess who was above the mortal world, who would not deign to touch the earth of the lower world. One could even go so far as to say that the ground didn't dare raise itself to touch Eva's feet. For slight breeze, though, she was like a kite flowing with the wind, not fighting back against the world, but rather merging with it and following its direction. Author's note, Noble Soul is like a buff version of Asuma from Naruto, and slight breeze is similar to Lifa from SAO. Chapter 580, Individual Tournament Noble Soul had the backing of the English behind him, who made their cheers and praise known. Many loved his valiant and driven demeanor, and his aesthetic made him seem like a knight of the round table. A nickname had already begun circulating for him, which was the Red Knight. Many felt this was quite fitting given his color disposition. The only thing the fellow was lacking was a noble steed to carry him about. As for Slight Breeze, just like Cold Summer, she was also one of the original eight expert members of Umbra, merely one level below the core members. The epic variant of her previous Aeromancer class was called Sifid. She was, surprisingly, Indian, and her people loudly cheered for. After all, she was the only other powerhouse from their country aside from Kiran, so they had to put in their all to represent their country. The two fighters squared off in the arena as Amber declared that the battle should begin. Immediately, Slight Breeze spread her arms apart as the atmosphere surrounding the arena became turbulent, sharp winds tearing about all over the place while she smiled softly. Sylphid, Epic Class Rank 3. Skills, Semi-Perfect Manipulation, Passive, Wind Spirit Passive, Hurricane, Active, Wind Blade Storm, Active, Aero Sprite Summon, Active. Starting Stats, Stir 10, Dex 10, N10, Int 30, Spar 25, Cha 10, L Ka 10, XP Gain Rate 
Rank up difficulty, 65%. Class weapons, none. Class skills, any wind. Semi-perfect manipulation, passive skill effect. The user is able to freely manipulate all forms of ambient wind and gases with their mind. All offensive and defensive moves created through this skill are buffed by 15%. Wind Spirit, Passive Skill Effect As a spirit born of nature to control the wind, you possess a 50% immunity to all attacks using the same element. All your wind-related attacks are increased in potency by 25%. Hurricane, Active Skill Effect Summon a huge typhoon that spirals at a high pressure, damaging everything within an area of 20 miles and preventing targets with a heavy weight from moving while light targets would be pulled into the swirl. Duration, 1 minute. Cooldown, 55 minutes. Windblade Storm Active Skill Effect Summon a consistent and numerous amount of large wind blades that strike an area repeated for a period of time, lancing any foes within into pieces. Duration, 1 minute. Cooldown, 5 minutes. Arrow Sprites Summon. Active Skill Effect. Summon a group of Wind Sprites to aid you in battle. They have no offensive properties, but can defend and support you at all times during their existence. Duration, 10 minutes. Cooldown, 1 hour. Slight Breeze had naturally activated her Hurricane skill to lock down the entire arena. Immediately, the Cutting Winds forced Noble Soul to lock his legs to the ground in order not to fly off his right hand gripping the hilt of his great sword that was still plunged into the arena. Luckily, he had done so upon entry, otherwise, he would really be in a tough spot. He closed his eyes slightly to prevent the wind from blinding him, but his gaze never left Slight Breeze, who was floating through the air without any qualms whatsoever. This made her face harden a little, as she really began to worry whether she could actually beat this fellow. She waved her hands, refusing to waste any more skills and rather use this one-minute time frame to harass her opponent as much as she could. As such, she used her wind manipulation to form smaller wind blades from the depths of the hurricane to hurtle towards the defenseless noble soul who could not react at all since he was doing everything he could to avoid getting carried away and ragdolled in midair. Just as they were about to strike him, noble soul seed audibly and a glint flashed through his eyes as he murmured. Truly, it is not easy to deceive a member of Umbra. Immediately, he let go of his sword, and in the time frame before he was about to be dragged away and pulled apart into shreds, he roared so loudly that the entire stadium could hear him. I am the strongest in the universe. Immediately, a sort of shockwave manifested from his roar that blasted the cyclone and the incoming wind blades apart also cancelling Slight Breeze's ability to fly and sent her hurtling towards the arena floor, where she crashed unceremoniously and screamed as she broke both her legs. The crowd went silent from shock, not comprehending how things changed up in an instant. The team members of England, though, looked like they had expected this and sighed in pity for the lovely lady locked in mortal agony on the arena. As for Noble Soul, he pulled his greatsword from the arena floor and swung it over his shoulder casually, not showing any particular pity. An opponent was an opponent, whether man, beast, or cat. Hero, legendary class, rank three skills, undefeatable, unbreakable, passive, heroic valor, active, heroic might, active, aura of the people, active, ultimate, active, stance, passive, vessel, passive. Starting stats, star 50, dex 20, n 40, int 10, spar 10, lck 10, xp gain rate 100%. Rank up difficulty, 65%. Class weapons, any large. Class skills, any aura, large weapon. Undefeatable, passive skill, effect. Your body is forged by your tribulations and stands in the way of utter destruction and those you want to protect. You draw up energy from your desire to succeed for those you cherish, giving you plus 100% HP, 200% MP, and 500% stamina, focus, and concentration. Unbreakable, passive skill effect. Your will is iron and will never bend nor break for anyone, especially when your beliefs are on the line. The will to protect, the will to love, and the will to fight course through you, giving you immunity to all mental spells and skills, as well as full resistance to all status effects. Heroic Valor, Active Skill Effect, shout out a line that boosts the morale of all allies and invigorates them to fight harder and longer in order to save their friends and family waiting for them at home. This skill resets all skill cooldowns for allies in a party, 
but the caster is unable to use any skill for the next six hours. Cooldown, seven days. Heroic Might, active skill effect. Shout out a line that invigorates the user and highlights their true power as well as supremacy, which cows the enemy and leaves them full of fear and regret for attacking the innocent. This skill cancels all active and passive skills of all enemies that are currently in battle with the user and their allies, regardless of range. Cooldown, one day. Aura of the people, active skill, effect. You are the hope of the universe, the answer to all living things that cry out for peace. You are the protector of the innocent. You are the light in the darkness. The people of the world grant you their power, increasing all your stats by 50%. Duration, three minutes. Cooldown, three days. Ultimate active skill, effect. Gather the energy of the living and the dead, the corporeal and the ethereal, and unleash it all in one strike. This skill's activation and animation are dependent on the specific situation of the user, their enemy, and the overarching circumstances. It deals 1,000% damage. Cooldown, one day. Stance, passive skill. Effect, as a noble hero chosen by the world to save it, you have trained under an old hermit sage who is living in a cottage atop a mountain. As such, your skill with the weapon in your hand becomes powerful enough to defeat your final foe, granting you plus 300% damage to all weapon-based attacks. Vessel, passive skill effect. As a valiant hero chosen by the people to carry their will, you have been repeatedly blessed by their love and faith for a long while. As such, your body has developed a unique container within that allows you to store this faith energy within your body that strengthens you at all times as long as you carry the people's will. You gained 300% to defense. Noble Soul had used his heroic might skill, which was a trump card he had kept hidden in case he had to deal with troublesome elemental class F. Oase like Silent Walker, Slight Breeze, Cold Summer, and the like. This skill would cripple them at the opportune moment since they had troublesome active skills that could encompass the whole area, as well as passives that made them able to control their element at will using their mind and mana. Noble Soul had been baiting the last to use her active skills in one go, so he could cancel them all as they would be sent into cooldown. Since the match had a three-minute time limit, it would be as good as crippling them, even if they regained their passives right after. However, it had an even better effect on Slight Breeze than he thought. Her elegant nature made her flit about like some fairy had come back to bite her as she had been high in the air. It had cancelled her ability to control the wind for a split second, which had been enough to disrupt her control. Shocked and confused, she had failed to gather herself before she struck the ground, which led to the current horrible outcome. Noble Soul walked over and planned to behead the last to end her pain. Opponents they might be, impartial he personally might be, she was still his colleague as a member of Umbra, and he couldn't perpetuate her suffering for no reason. He raised his greatsword up and brought it down, only to be shocked that he cut into the arena. Noble Soul frowned and looked up to see a wheezing slight breeze who was drenched in sweat and blood, floating shakily in the air, as her legs dangled about uselessly. Since her crushed bones ground upon each other as she levitated like that, her face was locked into a terrifying grimace as she clenched her teeth to the point where blood leaked from her gums, that that pain was even soothing compared to what she was feeling from below. Immediately, the crowd were left in horror at this sight, overwhelmed by the tenacity of the lovely young lady who looked so delicate that she might be some young princess of some wealthy family. The core members, too, displayed shocked expressions, as well as heavy amounts of solemn respect. There was a huge gulf between core members and everyone else in Umbra in terms of standing, but the expert members were truly something else. They were, in truth, almost at the same level of skill as the various core members. What separated them was the fact that core members had been required to have acquired a hidden class, which, aside from special exception, was only possible through specific stat point allocation that no one could control. The core members were not essentially better than expert members, but they had been more favored since Umbra started recruiting, so the quality of their existence had made what was previously a thin gap more tangible. If Cold Summer had a legendary class, 
would he have lost to Silent Walker? If Panty King had a legendary class, would he have lost to... Okay, yeah, he would never beat Kiran. Noble Soul himself gazed with slack jaws at the hovering woman before him, who was still stabilizing herself, forgetting to use this chance to attack before she acclimatized to the pain. Rather, for the first time in his life, Noble Soul felt his heart that only made space for battle thump in a strange way, as the image of the strangely gentle yet fierce woman imprinted itself there. Slight Breeze used what little mind she had to cast her Windblade Barrage skill, as well as her Arrow Sprite Summon skill. The arena became turbulent with winds once more. This time, instead of spinning in a spiral, a barrage of large and thick wind blades hurtled towards Noble Soul from all angles, aiming to slight him apart. The fellow snapped out of his trance and swung his greatsword about, shattering every wind blade that collided with his obviously epic greatsword with ease. Noble Soul did not feel tired doing this, as his passive boosted his stamina by three times. Three greenish fairies made of wind energy appeared beside Slight Breeze, who was slowly becoming delirious from the pain. Upon their summoning, two of those fairies shone with a whitish light that connected with Slight Breeze. His body, lifelink, immediately, one-third D of the fairies' HP was sent over to Slight Breeze, while they themselves lost that much. This acted as a sort of pseudo-healing, which restored Slight Breeze HP that was obviously in the red. With it, her legs magically snapped back into place and looked as good as new, but the trauma on her face told that this would be an experience she would never forget. Case in point, she didn't dare to fly above five meters from the ground. She stuck firmly to that range and would rather die than take to the skies again, even if what happened before couldn't happen again for an entire day. Noble Soul, who was still being held down, frowned and ignored the next few wind blades, allowing them to strike his body as he was confident in his defenses. Naturally, while they did respectable damage, they were not even able to leave a mark on his skin, and the fellow used that chance to bolt over towards Slight Breeze. Slight Breeze saw this and gritted her teeth, floating higher so she would get out of his range. Trauma or not, she rose to her feet, or well, floated to it, when she had previously fallen precisely because she had refused to lose this early into the tournament. What had started to form a mental block in her mind was forcibly suppressed, but it was obviously not enough, given that Noble Soul already had the initiative in his hands. The fellow jumped up and activated his skill, Ultimate. Immediately, Noble Soul soared up into the air where Amber was, making the woman gasp with surprise as he moved away. Then raising both of his hands up into the air, Noble Soul roared, Everyone, please, share your energy with me. Right then, small motes of light were forcibly removed from everyone in the stands, accumulating into a reddish gold ball above Noble Soul's hands which was growing larger and larger every second. Seeing this, Slight Breeze paled and knew it was over. She didn't bother to let herself experience even more unnecessary suffering, and admitted defeat with a face full of despair. Noble Soul cancelled the skill and returned to the ground with a heavy thump, cratering the whole area while suffering no damage. He then casually slung his greatsword over his shoulder as he gazed at the downcast slight breeze with respect. Amber declared Noble Soul the winner, and both parties were beamed to the side of the arena at the same time. When that happened, all of the other female core members walked up to Slight Breeze to check up on her, but parted slowly when they saw Noble Soul walking over. When Slight Breeze saw him, her heart leapt to her throat as she remembered the pain she suffered under his hands. She felt that he might be her to comfort her, but it wouldn't make her pain go away. However, not bad. Make sure to fight me again after this tournament is over, was all he said while looking away, a slight blush on his cheeks. Slight Breeze was left speechless while the other ladies smiled and giggled knowingly. As for the fellows, they all rubbed their imaginary beards as if they had understood something profound. Tenth match winner, Noble Soul. Eleventh match, Deployed Soldier vs. Wee Cunt. The core members had strange looks when this match was called. This was no longer a matchup based on classes, but one based on demeanor and disposition. There was the disciplined and mature deployed soldier on one side, and the unscrupulous and hooligan weak hunt on the other. To buttress this, 
deployed soldier climbed up stately on the left side, looking suave as usual. He was a relatively tall fellow at 6'1", with a medium tan, his brown eyes shining with sharpness. He had a light stubble on his otherwise clean-shaven face, as well as closely cropped black hair. He stood in a very formal and disciplined pose, with his back straight. On the other side, there was a stocky fellow who was at the height of 5'7", making him quite short. He had a rough face that could not be called handsome, but was not ugly either. He was neither plain-faced with his sharp his jaws were, and how slanted his eyes we re as well. He simply had hard features like a block nose, a distinctive jawline, slightly thick lips, and small yellowish eyes. He also had a messy stubble that didn't help with his appearance. His was a face you would always remember, and when you heard the word hooligan at any time of the day, his face would pop up instantaneously with the word. He wore a complete set of reddish-brown leather armor covering his body, with many weird devices strapped to his waist, legs, and torso. Author's note, Deployed Soldier looks like Reinhardt from Fire Emblem, while Wee Cunt looks like a non-bald and less burly version of Letho from The Witcher 2. Deployed Soldier calmly gazed at Wee Cunt, who was grinning widely opposite him. The Scotsman then taunted the great commander daringly. Well, well, if it isn't the commander hisself, ye get any orders for me, commander? How about ye day a favor for your beloved soldier and forfeit, eh? Wee Cunt requested while laughing uproariously.